Eva. Symbols of Love Series Book 3 Written by Leah Connolly and published by Starfall Publications Available on Amazon and free with Kindle Unlimited. Enjoy. Chapter 1 Lady Eva Stanton was by all accounts an extraordinarily beautiful woman. She was aware of her beauty at a young age, receiving more than her share of compliments from the time she was a girl in braids and pinafores. If she had been any other girl, this would have easily gone to her head and poisoned her heart simultaneously. As it was, however, all this did was heighten her awareness that men coveted her as they did any other work of art, and not for her conversation, wit, or intellect. This had also enabled her to move through society with a kind of confidence that was neither boastful nor snobbish. She simply took it for granted that hers was a company that others would enjoy. She was never unkind to the other young ladies, however, never lauded her place as the diamond of the ball over them. Her heart was surprisingly tender, though her face remained an impassive, unreadable mask. It was a strange, almost alien feeling then, for her to be feeling the stirrings of trepidation as she approached the fashionable townhouse near Regent's Park. It was one of many all in a row, their fronts still looking crisp and new, not worn with decades, centuries even, of wear as some of the other homes did. In fact, as she mounted the short set of stairs that led to the front door, her steps paused and she nearly turned right around. Summoning her courage, Ava tossed her head a little, took a deep breath and marched right up to the green-painted door. With her left hand, she reached out, preparing to lift the brass knocker, when she hesitated again. She bit her lower lip, a habit her mother absolutely hated, and shifted from foot to foot, undecided. If anyone had been passing by, her inner conflict would have been patently obvious to them. With a firm set of her shoulders, she reached up and took the knocker, letting it fall solidly against the door. Lady Eva believed in boldness, especially in the face of doubt, and she was determined to complete her errand. It was, after all, the right thing to do, and Eva was also a recent convert to doing the right thing, even when it was uncomfortable. Perhaps they are not at home, Lady Eva thought as she was left to linger on the front step. Her inner monologue had a whiff of hopefulness about her, and she immediately chastised herself for thinking in such a way. She was almost ready to leave when the door was opened at last, revealing the drawn face of a butler in a collar, so stuffed that Eva doubted he could look down if he wanted to. Can I help, madam? he inquired stiffly. Lady Eva Stanton, to see Lady Patience, she said, unable to stop her impulse to lift her own chin a fraction of an inch higher than the butler's. The butler silently took Ava's measure, lingering on her midnight blue day dress and matching hat, complete with a spray of curled feathers. I was not aware that Lady Patience was expecting callers, he said in the driest of tones. I shall inquire if she is at home. Lady Eva accepted this. There was no reason, really, to expect a warm welcome from Lady Patience. It was not as if they had ever been the greatest of friends. In truth, their past had been somewhat, well, tangled, to put it mildly. So Lady Eva waited on the front steps once again while the butler made his inquiry. This was common practice among the ladies of the ton. Lady Patience may very well have been physically within the residence, but she could very well claim that she was not at home, which meant that she was not receiving visitors, or at least this visitor. Ava was at the point of losing hope when at last the green door was opened again. This time the butler stepped back and invited her inward with a little bow and a gesture of his arm. Ava sniffed a little and entered as grandly as she could, never mind that she had been left standing on a front porch for longer than she would care to consider. She passed her gloves and hat to him, her head tilting up to take in the high ceiling of the foyer that went all the way to the top of the townhouse. Lady Patience appeared at this moment standing cautiously in a doorway that led to a hallway within. Though she was all coolness and grandeur on the outside, Ava could see that she was working to conceal some nerves. Ava could not help but feel a tiny pang of guilt. She couldn't blame Patience for looking apprehensive at her sudden appearance. A silence stretched between them for a moment as they considered one another. At last, 
Lady Patience spoke, stepping forward a little. Her expression was still carefully guarded, but her tone and words were friendly enough. Lady Ava, she said, her eyebrows quirking a little. I was not expecting to see you. To what do I owe this pleasure? I have just returned to London, Ava explained. I have been abroad, in Italy, she added hastily. I would have come sooner, but I expect you were busy with your wedding tour and setting up your new home. A small secret smile flitted across Patience's face. That is true. We've only been back a fortnight. Well then, Ava said, nodding slightly. Well then, Patience agreed. Ava hesitated, shifting a little from foot to foot as another strained silence took up residence in the foyer. There was much that she would like to say to Patience, but it was not the sort of thing that one should say in a foyer of all places. The conversation she wished to have demanded proper attention. She glanced about again, her eyes drawn upward to the massive crystal and gilt lantern that hung far overhead. Your home is most lovely, Ava said, mentally slapping her forehead with her palm. Of all the inane, inconsequential things to say, she chided herself. That same little smile appeared on Patience's face. I'm rather fond of it. It is well situated, which was a concern for both of us, Tom and I. And how is Tom? Eva asked, sensing an opening. Ah, Patience replied with a knowing nod. I had assumed that was why you had come. At Eva's blank surprise, Patience continued. I figured you would have something more to discuss than the quality of my new furnishings. At least I hope you do. A glint of mischief appeared in Patience's eye, and Ava relaxed a little. You've caught me out, Ava said, hanging her head as if she were a naughty schoolgirl. I have come here with an agenda. Tom had warned Ava that Patience was a most intuitive, observant person, and he had not been kidding. An agenda. Patience considered for a moment, then turned slightly and gestured with her head in a way that indicated that Ava should follow her. An agenda certainly requires some kind of refreshment. Tea, if you please, Carlton, she said over Eva's shoulder to the hovering butler. Following behind Patience, Ava was led to a sitting room with walls covered in a muted red. The floor was laid with thick rugs, so that one's foot barely touched the polished wooden floor that shone as it peaked from between them. The room was furnished with rich mahogany tables and chairs, upholstered in coordinating shades of dull reds and pinks. Though the furnishings were fashionable, they also gave off an air of supreme comfort. The whole room was a study in tasteful comfort, really. It was situated near the northern rear of the house, on a corner far enough from the street that the sounds of London were muffled. The sunlight that entered was warm and golden, but not direct. It was insular, quiet and Eva was immediately put at ease. With a gesture, Patience indicated a small round tea table covered with a linen and lace tablecloth. Eva settled herself on a chair, and they both smiled wanly at each other as they awaited the tea service. When it arrived, Patience poured carefully, deliberately, as if she were considering every action and weighing the correct way in which to do it. Again, Eva could not help but feel guilty for she was sure that Patience was going to such pangs on her account. She had not meant to set the new bride ill at ease. When at last they both had their teacups before them, as well as a fragrant assortment of little cakes and other tasty bits, Patience fixed her large violet eyes onto Eva. She did not say anything, merely looked at Eva expectantly, as if Eva were already speaking. It was most disconcerting, and Eva found that it was impossible not to say something. I wanted to apologise, she blurted. Patience raised her eyebrows again, which only highlighted the largeness of her eyes. Ava had heard Patience described by some as not a particularly great beauty, but her eyes were the envy of the tarn. Having seen Patience a few times now, Eva was inclined to agree. They gave her an air of innocence that Eva suspected was nothing more than a clever facade. Do you? Pray tell what for. I... I think I made rather a spectacle of myself at your wedding, Eva said, feeling an unfamiliar blush of shame feathering along her cheeks. Please believe me, that was not my intention. 
Patience sat back and regarded Ava with an inscrutable look. It was a bit odd you entered, and then turned on your heel and ran back out of the church again. Eva nodded glumly. I know it. I just couldn't take it, all of those people turning to stare at me. I know what they were saying about me after all of that, that tawdry business last year. And they were right. Eva's lip curled in disdain, her pretty face creasing. I'm used to unkind gossip. That is simply the nature of the ton. I can simply wave it off as untrue or an exaggeration. But this... Ugh! Patience watched all of this without a change in her expression. Eva envied her this talent to not betray what she was thinking. Her own face said her thoughts and feelings aloud, which had gotten her into more than one fix. When at last Patience spoke, it was deliberately, as if she had carefully weighed each word. Well, if there's anyone that can understand feeling overwhelmed by the ton, it's me. It's not as if I can cast stones in that regard after all. Ava's head snapped up at that. There was a delicate smile on Patience's face again. Are you sure? I mean, you have every right to be furious with me, for more than one reason. They both knew exactly of what Eva spoke. It wasn't so long ago that Eva had been at the centre of a romantic plot to trap Tom, Patience's husband. It had been months of machinations, and only Eva's timely intervention that had at last put things to rights. To even think of it set Eva to blushing and scowling again. To her great relief, Patience laughed softly, a sound as light as a bell. Honestly, your little performance at the church was something of a relief. It was? Oh yes, Patience continued, nodding and helping herself to a small cake that glistened with icing and candied fruit. Everyone was so preoccupied with your hasty exit that I could have fallen flat on my face and no one would have paid any mind. I had been dreading all of those people staring at me. Patience's nose wrinkled at the memory. I do not care to be the centre of the attention and would have been perfectly content to elope to Gretna Green. I'm glad that I didn't completely spoil your day, Eva said with a sigh. That really would have been too much for me to bear. You've been nothing but fair and understanding to me. We all make mistakes, and the important thing is that you set things right. Patience paused, her teacup halfway to her mouth. My mother says that my father used to tell her that it was imprudent to judge someone on their first actions or thoughts. Those are simply someone's first impulse. What matters most is what they do next, after they've had time to consider. That is a truer accounting of their character. Ava nodded. That is just it. I have taken a hard examination of my life of late and found that I am not proud of what I have done and said. I have allowed myself to go along with Mama's scheming for too long, just carried by the current. I shan't be her pawn any longer. I am turning over a new leaf, as they say. Are you indeed? I applaud your efforts then and your self-knowledge. Patience punctuated this sentence with a nod and a decisive bite of cake. There followed a companionable silence, broken only by the occasional clink of teacups and the passing of comestibles. Eva was inclined to study the room a little more closely. Though the room was clearly intended for Patience's use, there were little hints of Tom scattered about. A pack of cards on a side table, a copy of a gentleman's magazine left open to an article about cravat knots. This made her smile, for she was very glad that though Tom had been reformed by married life, he was still himself. I imagine that this new attitude toward life has not made things easy between you and Laddie Stanton, Patchins commented. Eva winced a little. It has not, she confirmed. She still has grand hopes for me marrying a rich man and solving all of our problems. Frankly, I think she would be delighted if I were to become the prince's mistress. If there's anyone that can understand difficult mothers, it would be me, Patience said, nodding. But even the scariest old dragon of a dowager can change her stripes, if for the benefit of her child. I'm not so sure, Eva muttered darkly. I think Mama is convinced that I shall be a pariah forever, and if she cannot trade on my good looks, then we shall surely end up in the gutter. 
Patience's soft face hardened a little and her lips pursed in disdain. I understand what you mean. Of course, you know your friends would never allow that to happen. Ava was touched by Patience's kind words. You are a darling to offer, and I love you for it. But this is exactly the problem. I... I think I do not wish to be beholden to anyone. I think I would rather live on my wits, she finished in a rush, her words coming faster as the idea formed in her head. I'd be tempted to call anyone else that said that a fool, but I believe you are brazen and clever enough to get away with it, Patience said with a grin. I'll tell Mama the next time she brings some ancient wreck to me as a suitor that I shall run away to Paris to be an artist's model, Eva replied with a cheeky grin of her own. Oh, Eva, she would just die. Patience laughed. I'm not sure which would shock and disappoint her more, the fact that I'd be living among artists or that they're French, Eva said around a giggle. Patience threw her head back and laughed again without restraint. This solidified the feelings of friendship that Ava had for her. Tom chose well, she thought to herself, satisfied that her childhood companion and playmate had married someone that she approved of. Well, since you are busy being shunned, perhaps you might like to accompany Tom and I to the theatre tomorrow, Patience suggested. The theatre? Do you mean it? Eva asked. Her heart leapt, for she truly loved the theatre, all theatre. Why not? We've taken a box for the season, and appearing together in public as friends will go a long way to putting wagging tongues to rest. Ava regarded Patience with renewed appreciation. Though she had the face of a schoolgirl, it hid a clever mind that was clearly becoming an expert on navigating the ton with all of its vagaries. Whatever else happened this season, Eva harboured hopes that she may call Patience a friend by the end. Chapter 2 It was a very fortunate thing indeed that Josiah Galpin had spent much of his life around the stage for his practice at theatricals allowed him to suppress an audible groan as yet another knock at his dressing-room door interrupted his thoughts. It had been like this all morning. The new theatrical season was beginning, and there had been an endless parade of footmen, maids and messengers coming to deliver cards, flowers and more embroidered handkerchiefs than he knew what to do with. Josiah knew that he must tolerate it, however, for his success was largely due to the goodwill of the ton. He hated to admit it, but the years of trodding the boards were beginning to take their toll in the form of aching ankles and knees that protested the cold and damp. Still, he would not have traded his art for anything. His first, greatest, and only love was dance. He was in the midst of preparing a new pair of soft-soled leather shoes, slapping the soles roughly on the back of a chair to break them in the right spot, roughing the toes for better grip replacing the laces so they provided better support, when the knocking came. He allowed himself a small sigh, then sat down in the straight-back chair before the dressing table, pulling his silk banyan closer about himself as he did so. Come, he said when he was properly settled. A young man entered, clearly a footman. They all had a particular way of carrying themselves, all stiff shoulders and backs. Josiah merely lifted a brow at him, waiting expectantly for the footman to begin the patter. Lady Patience Chester sends her regards and asks for the privilege of paying her respects this evening after the performance, the footman said, his nose aloft. With a flourish, he brandished and Josiah took it from the footman, feeling the weight of it. He had become adept at reading the subtler things communicated by calling cards, the thickness of the card the clarity of the printing, the decor and flourishes all told a story about the identity of the sender. This one was quality, printed on a lovely cream background with a subtle motif of violets in the corner. Of course, he already knew the name. She was dipping her toes into the tarn as a newlywed, the proverbial blushing bride. Josiah was tentatively hopeful that he would be able to secure her as a patron for his school of dance. Still, it would not do for him to appear over-eager. He turned the card over and over in his long fingers a few times, as if he were contemplating the notion. At last he said, Please tell Lady Chester that I would be happy to see her. Tell her that an usher will direct her after the performance. The footman nodded, then withdrew, 
closing the door so softly that it was barely audible. Josiah waited for another minute or two in case the footman decided to linger, listening at the door, which they were frequently tipped to do. It was only after several beats of silence that Josiah allowed himself the heavy sigh he had been suppressing. Setting Lady Chester's card aside, he caught a glimpse of himself in the mirror at the dressing table. He looked as if he were in a framed painting by some romantic artist obsessed with botanicals. His dressing room was nearly full to bursting with bouquets and posies of every shape and size. The smell was beginning to give him a headache, and he rubbed one of his temples. His new dancing shoes remained to one side, waiting for him to finish breaking them in. Abruptly, he stood, and in his stocking feet, he easily went up onto his toes, liking the way that it pulled in his calves. The dressing room was small, and with the crowded flowers, he could only manage a few stationary steps, but the familiar movements grounded him. He moved with ease and grace, even in this cramped space. It rankled him to no end, this need to pander and smile to the ton in order to do what he loved, to survive. He had built quite a reputation for himself, both as a performer and as a dancing master. It was not only down to his talent, though, that was not inconsiderable. He had learned to smile and curry favour so that the mothers of the ton would send their daughters to him for lessons and the dowagers would give him patronage. His dearest wish beyond all else was to gain financial independence, to manage his dance troupe without all of the periphery nonsense. If this run went well, it was not inconceivable. It would be close. But if he was lucky, if he was clever. There was another knock at his door, heavier than the others had been that morning. It was the stage manager, a man with fists like hams and more hair on his forearms than his head, which he concealed with a badly frizzed wig. He poked his head in and eyed the gifts and flowers with disdain. Like a debutante's bedchamber in here, he grumbled. Josiah was inclined to agree, but he didn't give the manager the satisfaction. What is it, Knotts? he asked, watching in the mirror as he adjusted the position of his arms. Thought you mightn't want to come to the aid of that wee nipper. Herself has him in her teeth again, Knott said with a gruff familiarity. That brought Josiah's heels firmly back down to the ground. I, he's just a lad, Knott's protested. Despite the man's rough appearance, Josiah had long suspected that he was a soft touch. He appeared to have taken the newest and youngest member of their troop under his protection. He must start learning, Josiah said, turning back to the mirror. We were all just lads when we started out. Though I suspect you were pulling curtains for Moses, he added silently to Knotts. It did indeed seem as if he had always been at the theatre, keeping order and pulling scenery ropes. His promotion to stage manager was new, and he had attempted to polish himself up a bit consequently. Knotts gave Josiah a baleful look, as if he had heard his silent remark, and grunted. Josiah sighed again, which was becoming a running theme of the morning. Knotts clearly wasn't going to let this go. Beatrice has always had issues with the young ones, Josiah said. She's as sharp as a hellcat, Knotts grumbled. I'll speak to her, Josiah acquiesced at last. Satisfied, Knotts jerked his head in a sharp nod which almost displaced his badly kempt wig. It was always something these days. Sometimes Josiah yearned for his younger days, before he was such a hit with the ton. Things were simpler then, without so many things to weigh on him. It was a lot to manage on his own, but there was no one that he could share this life with. The ladies of the ton liked him in an ornamental way. They liked to flirt with him. They liked it when he flattered them. They liked to giggle behind their fans at his calves and his graceful bows. But that was it. No more, no less. They would not let him marry into their set, no matter his success. As if I have the time for that, he scoffed aloud. No, the closest that he could hope for a wife and family was the dancers under his care. With that in mind, he stepped into some plain leather shoes and went to sort out his troop before they ate each other alive. Chapter 3 Though Eva had been quite looking forward to her evening at the theatre, 
Her happy anticipation had been dashed most definitely against the rocks. Her mother, the redoubtable bulwark that was Lady Stanton, had decided without preamble to come along with her. Eva knew this would happen the moment that she let it slip, and groaned inwardly the very instant the words were out of her mouth. Lady Patience? That little slip of a girl that snatched Tom away from you? Lady Stanton said with a frown that deepened the lines at the side of her mouth. She was reclined along a sofa, as if she were awaiting suitors to come and pay court to her. She didn't snatch Tom away from me, Eva said evenly. He was never mine to begin with. That was a fantasy of your own making. Lady Stanton sniffed. Well, I'm sure you had far more claim on him. When I was a girl, if a gentleman kissed you in a dark corner, you could be certain of a marriage proposal. Eva wisely chose to not respond to that particular remark. Any reminder of her mother's scheming to secure an attachment to Tom made Eva wince with shame. She hated that she had been party to such a tawdry episode, and she would like nothing more than for it to be forgotten. Still, I suppose it is a handsome thing to be invited to a first night, Lady Stanton continued, flipping idly through the pages of a magazine with a French title. We've not been out for some time, what with things being so dear. Eva had been in the process of leaving the faded parlour and heading to her room, but she halted when she heard her mother. We? she asked weakly. You must wear your blue evening silk, it suits you the best. Lady Stanton continued as if she hadn't heard Eva, which in all likelihood she probably hadn't. I'm not sure the invitation included more than myself, Eva said carefully. Lady Patience is picking me up in her carriage, and I'd hate for you to crush your gown if there's a press. Nonsense, Lady Stanton scoffed. Everyone knows that an invitation to a young lady naturally includes her mother. It is her duty to chaperone her daughter properly. Eva's hands went cold, her cheeks no doubt going colourless at the same time. She knew exactly what her mother meant by that. She'd been living with it since she was a girl of sixteen. Her mother would push and connive and scheme to get Eva into the notice of every gentleman that had even a whiff of money or title about him. It was humiliating, as if her mother were an ostler with a horse she needed to unload to pay off a butcher's bill. She absorbed this with only a brief closing of her eyes. Resigned, she continued her march up the bare, creaking stairs. For years, season after season, she had accepted her mother's pushing and prodding as simply what must be done. Eva hadn't felt any sort of real attachment to any of the men flung at her, and had been able to escape the worst of them with a smile and a gentle laugh that left said, gentlemen feeling tenderly toward her and not at all slighted. Now. Now Eva wanted freedom. She wanted to make her own choices. She wanted more than to be a perfect doll for her mother to dress and move about. This was the direction of her thoughts as she reached her room. It was cold, much colder than the parlour, the fire having gone out. Eva automatically retreated into her shawl. With a sigh, she took up the poker and stirred the embers about, trying to bring them back to life. A few years ago would simply have rung for a maid or footman to tend to it. That would be pointless now, as the staff was considerably reduced, as was the household budget. Briefly, Eva was tempted to return to the parlour, but ultimately decided that her independence was worth a few chilled fingers. Adjusting her shawl again, she sat heavily on the stool before her dressing table. For a long while, she simply sat with her hand cradling her chin, her elbow propped on the small table. Gazing at herself in the mirror, she attempted to see who she was beneath all of the expectations and pressures put on her, not just by her mother, but by her position. She was the daughter of a nobleman, a minor noble but aristocratic nonetheless. Beyond that, Eva was honestly not sure about anything anymore. It was no use. The mirror was no scrying glass that could reveal her fortune. All she saw was a woman rapidly approaching spinsterhood. Her finely boned face and alluring eyes would be for naught before long. She felt as if she were a bird with beautiful plumage, caught in a cage. She did not know how much time passed as she stared at her reflection, wishing the woman in the mirror had answers for her. She was jolted back to awareness 
by the sudden entrance of the one lady's maid that she shared with her mother, who immediately called for the fire to be mended so that the curling tongs could be heated. Ava sighed, but sat still as the maid began pulling and combing her hair this way and that. She knew that freedom was out there, somewhere, and she was very nearly resolved to find it. Why else had she resisted so many marriage proposals? True enough that they had not all been brilliant, but there were more than a few that would have seen her living comfortably. No. She was meant for something else, something besides the dream of domesticity that had been laid out for her. She just didn't know what. Though Lady Patience was still not the most experienced of ladies when it came to matters of the ton, she had been raised by a dowager duchess that wielded gossip and socialising like a scythe. Patience had learned at a very young age that one frequently learns more by asking nothing and simply observing. This was helped by the fact that she was naturally a reserved person. When her carriage had pulled up before the Stanton's townhouse, it was impossible to miss that Eva was not awaiting their arrival alone. In fact, Patience suspected that a blind person would have trouble overlooking Lady Stanton. She managed not to stare, but it took no small effort. In her copious diamonds and feathers, Lady Stanton looked more like an actress herself than a woman of the ton. Patience also could not miss the look of barely concealed misery that clung to Eva's face. The moment the carriage door opened, however, the door expression had vanished from Eva's face. Patience was quietly impressed with her determination. She met Eva's eye, and both gave a slight but determined nod. They would enjoy their evening, no matter the inconvenience. Her husband Tom, however, was clearly less than pleased at arrangements. She could feel him tense up on the carriage seat next to her, his dark eyes glittering dangerously. Lady Stanton, what an... Unexpected pleasure, Patience said, hoping to preempt any unpleasantness. To be sure, she said, settling into the opposite seat. I was not expecting an invitation to the theatre, especially not to a first night. If you feel it's unsuitable, then by all means feel free to depart. One wouldn't want you to compromise your infamous scruples, Tom said dryly, a smile as pointed as a handful of needles on his face. Lady Stanton continued to be oblivious to all of this, paying no mind to the implied insult. While Tom's eyes remained riveted on Lady Stanton, Patience could only look to Eva. Though her face was perfectly composed, there was a hardness about the pretty jaw, a pinched quality around her mouth and nose. It was clear that she was embarrassed and angered by her mother shoehorning herself into the evening. For her part, Patience was not angry. No, not even when Lady Stanton began to complain about the closeness of the carriage. Patience, too, had been much under the thumb of a domineering mother for the better part of her life. If anything, it was pity that she felt for Eva, and an overwhelming urge to help her in whatever manner she might. She had spoken truthfully earlier in the day to Eva. She had forgiven her, for everything. After all, she had nearly found herself in the same situation. She knew what it was to be cajoled and chivied along, dragged unwillingly into nearly marrying a man simply for the good of her family. While she did not know the particulars of the Stanton situation, Tom had led her to believe that the good lady of the house was becoming rather desperate. Therefore, when the carriage pulled away from the curb with a lurch, Patience used the opportunity to dart a hand forward and briefly squeeze Ava's hand. Startled, Ava looked down her careful mask slipping for just a moment. She bestowed a small but genuine smile of such feeling onto Patience that the latter could not help but feel her heart swell in response. Though she did not have the slightest clue how, Patience was more resolved than ever to help her new friend. She had found more happiness than she knew what to do with after all. Why should she not help others do the same? Chapter 4 the moment that the carriage stopped in front of Haymarket Theatre, affectionately known as the Little Theatre, Eva was determined to put the unpleasantness of the evening thus far behind her. She had been somewhat sequestered from society lately and was missing its diversions. 
Of course, the moment that she stepped foot out of the carriage, there were a great many sidelong glances and whispers behind fans. Let them gossip, Ava thought, lifting her head regally and following behind Tom and Patience to their box after their cloaks and hats had been dispensed with. No one could deny that Ava made a good showing that evening. She had indeed worn her dark blue silk gown, the dupioni shimmering becomingly in the candlelight. Her copious dark hair had been piled elegantly atop her head, ringlets falling artfully down the back of her neck and at her temples. Thank you for watching. Before we continue into the story, do us a favor. Hit the subscribe button this way we will be able to create more audiobooks for free for you. Thank you again. Now, back to our story. She wore a simple gold bracelet over the white evening glove on her left arm and a matching blue ribbon with a small gold sun pendant about her neck. As the party wended their way up the stairs, it became harder and harder to ignore the whispers and the pointed way that conversation stopped when the group approached. Ava had hoped that their plan of appearing all together in public would put the tons' tongues to rest, but it seemed to be having the opposite effect. It would not be difficult to imagine what sort of story they may be spinning behind their backs. Eva also could not help but feel a stab of concern for Patience. She knew that the new bride was a novice at this sort of thing, eschewing the ton and only recently entering society properly. Eva tried to catch a glimpse of her face as she walked ahead, her arm tucked into the crook of Tom's elbow. Patience turned her head slightly to gaze adoringly up at her husband once, and Ava was relieved and impressed by the serenity she saw there. The relief Eva felt at the sight was somewhat hampered, however, by the endless stream of chatter that Lady Stanton kept up through the entire procession. Isn't it nice to be back among our friends? Oh, look, there is Lady Featherstone, still looking down in the mouth over her young beau, no doubt. The Haymarket seems to have gone down in some estimation since I was a girl. I hear Nash has his eye on it for rebuilding. Eva, dear, look at Mr. Bywood. You must greet him. Well, I say, Mrs. Fairfield has just trod upon my hem without so much as a by your leave. The nerve of these nouveau riches, completely lacking in an understanding of the peerage. Is this our box? It's rather small for the son of an earl, isn't it? Still, I suppose it is well situated. By the time they had attained their box, Eva could tell that everyone's nerves were on edge. Before Lady Stanton could contrive to have Tom sit next to Eva for some unknown scheme, the young ladies had been shuffled up to the front of the box. Tom sat just behind Patience, scooting his chair up closer to her so that he could speak into her ear. Lady Stanton huffed briefly about being relegated to the back of the box, but Eva ignored her. It was quickly becoming one of her best talents. Eva instead gave her attention to scanning the crowd, as that was at least half of the reason that one came to the theatre. Those in the boxes used looking glasses and lorgnettes to view the box occupants opposite, while those in the pit openly craned their necks around. Some, much to the consternation of their neighbours, stood openly and surveyed those seated around them. Have you heard? The Lyceum is being fitted for gaslighting, Patience said, leaning slightly in Eva's direction. They say that they will be able to raise and lower the lights at will without needing to snuff them. Pa. Lady Stanton said, clearly overhearing. I cannot imagine that would be safe or flattering for anyone. It seems quite improper to light these dancers and actresses so garishly. Ava merely clenched her jaw, resisting the urge to gnash her teeth openly. It seemed that the rest of the party felt the same way, determined to ignore Lady Stanton. That lady, however, did not seem to notice that no one responded to her whenever she spoke. At last the lights dimmed as did the conversation in the theatre. The first act was a young girl who walked balanced precariously on a rope suspended a little above the stage. It was not a particularly daring act, but she was pretty enough, and her ankles flashed with every step, so the audience was inclined to applaud liberally. Next, there was a fresh-faced young man who read out some poetry before a pastoral scene in the costume of an idyllic shepherd. As his shirt was quite loose at the neck and open to his chest, this caused a flurry of fluttering fans all through the theatre. It was impossible to say if he read with any competency, but he spoke with great enthusiasm, 
and was thus rewarded by the audience. Ava turned at one point to see Patience's reaction to all of this, as she had not been to the theatre much before. Patience was watching it all with rapt attention, her eyes full of wonder. Her innocent enjoyment made Eva smile. Her eyes flicked back to Tom, who was leaned forward in his seat. His own gaze was trained on Patience, and he looked upon her enjoyment with contented happiness. Feeling Eva's eyes upon him, he glanced to her, and they shared a small smile of old friends. There was a moment of interlude before the next act, which was to be the main event of the evening. Ava had not paid any attention to the programme, but there was an excited, murmuring energy washing over the audience. The musicians straightened and prepared to play. Silence, heavy with expectation and anticipation, filled the theatre. When they at last began to play, it was with a raucous, rapturous enthusiasm. The curtain lifted onto a scene of Grecian ruins, with broken columns and statues painted onto a scene of a night sky with a shining moon and glittering stars. Painted clouds seemed to float across the sky languidly. Eva turned to Tom again, prepared to make a flippant remark. This was their habit when they went to the theatre together, refusing to take anything seriously, when there was a flash of silver from the stage. A figure stepped forward, pale and shining in the stage light. What they had all assumed was simply another piece of the scenery, a marble statue, was in fact a living man. He was dressed as a Greek of old, in pure silver and white. His hair, so light that it too shone nearly silver, was long and flowed to his shoulders. It was as if a bit of quicksilver had come to life, for he flowed across the stage with a grace that defied explanation. Ava had the strangest feeling that time was playing games with her. All around her, everything had halted. There was nothing but the stage and the dancer on it. He leapt with ease, falling back to the stage so softly that Eva was not sure he had landed at all. Eva had seen dancing, of course, and had even received instruction when she was young. This, however, this, it was something entirely new and different. A great flash of light made the audience gasp, and suddenly there was another dancer, a woman, dressed all in metallic gold and bronze. She wore a shining diadem, and her own draped tunic was made to resemble wings when she lifted her arms. She beckoned to the other dancer, and their meeting was one of such profound feeling that many in the audience sighed. Ah, Adonis and Aphrodite, Patience murmured, but her voice sounded far away to Ava. They cavorted on stage, leaping, hands touching, pressing their cheeks together, all with surpassing lightness and grace. At last, the vital Adonis was slain by a boar, his spear missing its mark. This was no ordinary stage death. What had once been a body full of tension and life was suddenly a crumpled heap. It was as if all of the strings holding him had simply been cut. The musicians too halted their playing mid-note. The effect was so shocking that there was a chorus of gasps and cries. Aphrodite, her crown slipping a little, cradled the lifeless body of the man she loved. One arm lifted, as if to demand how Cellini, the moon, could allow such a tragedy. The entire theatre was silent, as if everyone present was holding their collective breath. The silence persisted, as there was no answer to Aphrodite's mute demand to know how such a beautiful thing could be killed so carelessly. The curtain, startlingly red and final, was lowered slowly. Ava continued merely to stare, her vision oddly blurred. The theatre was silent as if under a kind of spell. Slowly the audience began to applaud. Time released Eva from whatever hold it had over her, and things began to transpire in their correct manner again. The audience showed their appreciation with thunderous applause, those in the pit even stamping their feet. Dumbly, Eva could feel her hands lift as if lifted by someone else, and she too applauded automatically. It seemed wrong somehow, as if it were insufficient thanks for what she had just seen. To the consternation of the audience, the dancers did not reappear, nor did they take any bows. It was nearly unheard of, and the audience, thinking it an act of supreme snobbery, approved wholeheartedly. They were all left wanting more, 
which was the greatest victory that any performer could wish for. Lady Stanton was speaking again, but Eva paid her absolutely no mind. It was easy to ignore her. Eva was still riveted by what she had just witnessed. She did not know what had touched her so, but something within Eva had shifted, changed. It was as if she had just been introduced to the concept of possibility. She had assumed that her life would follow the same roads that it always had, but this beautiful modern performance had shaken her. Whatever the rest of her life held, Eva knew that she would always be grateful for this moment of perfect, transcendental beauty. Chapter 5 There was always a curious, heady mix of emotions when Josiah completed a performance. It was an idiosyncratic blend of triumph, pride and disappointment. He knew when a performance was good, when it was excellent. It wasn't an instant smattering of applause. It was a profound silence. This is what kept his troupe employed and at the pinnacle of their profession. He expected excellence because he understood it. This night was no different. The rest of the troupe had performed after he and Beatrice, and he'd reappeared for the customary bows. Beatrice seemed to bloom under the adoration, shining like a beacon in the dark theatre. Josiah, however, could not wait to retire to his dressing room. This was not to say that he did not enjoy the adoration of the crowd. He did. He simply had grown more than a little cynical about the whole thing. They enjoyed the aesthetic of the performance, but they did not understand the art. He wanted to elevate dance. The ton simply wanted something pretty to look at. This was a constant source of bickering between Beatrice and himself. She felt that they should simply give the audience what they desired and to rest on their accolades. She had a hunger for attention and praise that Josiah did not. It did not help that she had a point. The ladies and mothers of the great and wealthy did not care about artistic merit. They simply wanted their sons and daughters to learn how to catch a desirable partner at a ball. Josiah ran a school for dancing during the off-season, even deigning to give private lessons on occasion. Whether he liked it or not, Josiah had bills to pay, and he relied on the whims of the ton to do so. Thus, his thoughts were already inclined toward a gloomy pessimism when he reached his dressing room. He had already dispensed with his costume with the assistance of his dresser, and was back into respectable breeches and shirt. He sat before the mirror, wrapped in his silk banyan again, his feet in a bucket of ice water. He lifted a cloth and was preparing to wipe away the stage makeup, but paused, blinking at his reflection. There were fine lines beginning to show at the corners of his eyes, which only deepened when he was tired or vexed, and he was currently both. He was powdered and rouged, which gave the appearance of youth on stage and made him shimmer in the low light of the theatre. Back here, however, up close, he merely felt ridiculous. Sighing, he swiped at his face roughly. Backstage was quickly devolving into chaos, as it always did. The swells and swains of the ton would descend on the dressing quarters, hoping for glances of legs and arms. They always bore gifts, bestowing them in exchange for smiles and winks, and for the lucky few promises of company later. In the narrow hallway beyond his dressing room, already there were shrieks and giggles, occasionally the sound of running feet. Josiah wondered if he might slip out unnoticed, perhaps if he ducked his head and... There was a knock at his door, loud enough to be heard over the revelry beyond. Josiah sighed and considered not responding at all. Yes, he called finally. Sorry to disturb, sir, but there's a couple of ladies and a gentleman here that would like to pay their respects, not said in a strange tone. His voice sounded odd as he bent his mouth to form the accents of the respectable instead of his own usual rough brogue. Josiah, unable to rise due to the bucket of freezing water his feet were in, instead bade them enter. In deference to the ladies, he made some effort at wrapping his banyan tighter about himself. Ladies of the ton tended to be high-coloured about bare necks and men only in their shirt sleeves. The door opened, and Knots peered in first, this way and that, as if checking to see that Josiah was alone and decently attired. The motion nearly upset his poor abused wig 
which almost made Josiah smile. Satisfied that things were up to snuff, Knotts opened the door wider and threw his arm out wide, ushering the callers within. The motion put considerable strain on his suit, which was already struggling to stay closed across his barrel of a torso. May I present Lord and Lady Chester, Knotts said with a little half-bow. Josiah Galpin, the maestro of the dance. Josiah arched one pale brow at Lord Chester. Good to see you again, Lord Tom, he said coolly. I had not expected to see you backstage again. Tom did not seem particularly bothered by the reference to his earlier exploits and reputation as a rake. Mr. Galpin, my wife, Lady Patience, expressed an interest in meeting you. Well, this is new, Josiah thought wryly. It is not often that husbands bring their wives to fawn over a performer. Lady Patience, however, did not seem inclined to fawning. In fact, she merely regarded him with large, calm, violet-blue eyes. She also did not immediately begin blushing or stammering, but seemed content to merely study him for a moment. It was unexpected and a little unnerving. How may I be of service, my lady? Josiah said at last, unwilling to tolerate more of her silent scrutiny. Why did you choose Adonis and Aphrodite as the story to tell? She asked evenly. Did you feel that their story was well suited to dance from the start, or did that notion come about naturally? Josiah was taken entirely aback. He had not expected such a thoughtful inquiry and was entirely unprepared. He was not, however, displeased. In fact, he could feel one side of his mouth pulling up in response. He glanced to Lord Tom, who gave him a little head tilt and a knowing look as if to say, Well, I find myself always searching for the dramatic when looking for inspiration, I suppose. Josiah began slowly. Patience focused in on him, her mien thoughtful. It was also the juxtaposition of the story. Aphrodite had fought for Adonis, and he appeared to return her affections. He had the favour of not one, but two goddesses, and yet it was one of the lowliest creatures to fell him. Every day, boars are skewered out in the forest, brought home and roasted, and it was this mundane thing that was his doom. Ah, Lady Patience replied, lifting her chin a little and smiling a little. You like the juxtaposition of these things, yes? How curious, our friend was just saying the same thing. She paused, looking about herself as if she had misplaced her reticule or fan. There you are, she said to the doorway, which was just out of Josiah's view. She gestured someone further in. When this new lady entered, it felt as if all of the air were sucked out of Josiah. Simultaneously, an invisible spotlight seemed to shine on her, illuminating her. She was, without a doubt, the most beautiful woman that he had ever seen. In her dark blue dress, she looked like the sky just after the sun has set, shimmering and sublime. Master Josiah says that your assessment was correct, Lady Patience said, gently drawing the other young lady forward. I thought perhaps you might want to speak to him about it. Strangely, Josiah felt like he was having a hard time finding his voice, so he settled for simply looking at her expectantly. She did not smile or simper at him as other ladies tended to do. Instead, she looked straight back into his eyes. There was a kind of wonder to her expression, as if she was seeing something that she had never even considered to exist before. Josiah fancied that it was a similar expression that an intrepid explorer wore when he found an unfamiliar shoreline. So, he said at last, you enjoyed our little performance. I did, she said. Her voice was smooth and rich, a velvet caress on the ears. But I must disagree that the boar is a profane character. Oh, do you frequently hold the poor sign in high regard? Josiah retorted archly. Only at breakfast, she quipped back without a moment of hesitation. But surely it is a beast worthy of some regard. After all, it is the sport of kings. Besides, she continued, stepping a little closer, gaining in confidence. Surely he has earned himself a little slice of immortality. He brought a goddess low. Josiah, the other lady, and the lord all stared at the woman in blue. Unbidden, he could feel a smile curling his lips again. 
Josiah had not expected to be so charmed, but he was in very great danger of liking this new woman. She had a strange talent for standing completely still and poised, as if on the verge of a step that she never took. When she spoke, her wrists and hands moved elegantly, which also pleased his dancer's eye. He was at the point of requesting the pleasure of an introduction when another woman, also darkly featured but with prominent grey streaks in her hair, burst into the room. She began blustering immediately, and in a manner that caused Josiah to wince reflexively. He instantly knew the type, convinced that they were the most important person in the room. There you all are. It is like a maze back here, and the things one might see. Shocking, I tell you, most shocking. I've seen quite a number of wayward husbands ogling ankles. I can tell you that much. What has you all turned to pillars of salt? Oh, the matron said, catching sight of Josiah. Why, I must congratulate you, sir, I truly must. Such a spectacle, such grace and elegance. I hear that you are in the habit of taking on students. Without waiting for him to reply, she barreled onward. I simply must have you teach my daughter. She needs an edge this season. I can't have her growing stale on the shelf. Mother, the beautiful woman in blue said sharply. Now, don't you fuss at me. You know it to be true, the matron continued. Josiah opened his mouth, ready to flatly refuse on instinct. He had no desire to consort with this woman ever again, though the daughter was such a picture of beauty. Before he could, however, Lady Patience spoke up hurriedly. I was just inviting Mr. Galpin to take tea with me at his convenience, she said with a significant look. I wish to discuss the matter of patronage with him. Perhaps we might discuss it then. Naturally, you must come as well, darling Ava. She quirked an eyebrow at him, wishing to ascertain if she had picked up on the significance of her words. He had. I would be delighted, he said feeling fairly certain that this decision would be far more important than what called for dainty cakes and sandwiches. Ah, but where are my manners? Lady Patience said. This is Lady Gertrude Stanton and her daughter Eva. They both curtsied, and Josiah, still stuck with his feet in the bucket, merely dipped his head. He looked up in time, however, to note that this Eva Stanton dipped and rose with an inert grace. Lord Tom, at a nudge from Lady Patience, produced a calling card from a silver case. Josiah took it with another dip of his head. Thank you all for your kind words, he said. Now, if you would be so kind as to excuse me, I find that I have other engagements to attend to. Lady Stanton looked as if she might protest, but Knotts, clearly having loitered outside the door, reappeared and ushered her onward. Lady Patience looped her arm through Tom's and departed as well. Eva was the last to leave, which she did wordlessly. When she was at the doorway, however, she turned back, her hand resting lightly on the doorframe. She looked as if she were at the point of speaking, but couldn't bring herself to. She merely looked back at Josiah with that same unguarded curiosity and wonder. It was a look that struck him right down to his core lingering with him for the rest of the night. Chapter 6 The next couple of days passed in an agony of waiting for Eva. She did not even know what it was that she was waiting for exactly, but the anxiety of it was making her peevish and restless. She took solace in walks, frequenting the lending library, simply because it was a destination. Anything was better than remaining in her mother's home which was steadily becoming less and less. Candlesticks, paintings, family heirlooms were slowly going missing without a comment from her mother. Eva was not sure if she was pawning them or paying the few remaining servants in the only way left to her. The other trouble with staying indoors was that her mother took every opportunity to impress upon her the importance of this coming season. Ava was honestly not sure how many more lectures she could tolerate on the importance of duty to family, how there was no one left to provide for them. She did not know how dire things were, but she suspected that they were very close to being ruined. Part of Ava's irritation was born of guilt. If she were a more dutiful daughter, 
she would have married the first wealthy bachelor that her mother had unearthed at sixteen. Things had been better then. Though her father had died when she was only fourteen, their standard of living had not changed much. She simply took it for granted that she would be able to run about the town as she wished, visiting galleries and theatres and the modiste. Her mother had encouraged her, forgoing her own pin money so that Eva would be fashionably attired. And then the money began to dry up. Eva couldn't pinpoint the exact moment that she knew it was occurring. It had simply creeped up on them, like a frog that does not know it is being boiled until it's too late. Lady Stanton refused to alter their situation, however. The official policy, as laid out by herself, was that they would maintain appearances to the bitter end. This was the only way in which Eva would net herself a good husband. But Eva had refused, preferring the illusion of her independence to the boring security of marrying a country squire. Now here she was, four and twenty years old, and the ton no longer was willing to forgive her caprice because of her lovely face. Her mother had warned her from the time she turned twenty that her good looks would not last forever. The blush would be quite gone from the bloom before she was down the aisle if she didn't act quickly. Ava knew this was a constant fear of her mother's, who had been the great beauty of her own generation. Even now, Lady Stanton slept with her face bound up tightly in rags to keep it from sagging any further, and slathered herself in every unguent and tincture known to womankind in an attempt to keep her skin smooth and supple. So while Eva was excited, eager even for whatever may lay ahead, it was tampered by a sizable portion of guilt. The days passed slowly, with Eva pacing about the small rooms. Lady Stanton remained stubbornly convinced that if Eva could receive lessons from such an accomplished master, then she would have the advantage over other young ladies, never mind that those other young ladies came with considerable dowries or parcels of land. Eva was not about to disabuse her mother of this latest notion, however, because she was quite eager to try something new. When at last the note from Patience arrived, explaining that the time had been fixed, Ava was nearly beside herself. The timing was fortuitous. Lady Stanton had been obliged to pay a call out of the house, and Ava half suspected that the footman had been instructed to wait for just such an opportune moment. Ava had immediately sent the footman back with her eager acceptance of the invitation. The real trouble was how to attend said tea without having to drag her mother along. For this, Eva decided to enlist the help of one Kitty Johnson, her dearest and nearest friend, and the closest thing that Eva had to a sister. Eva had discovered a long time ago that a young lady was frequently in need of a true companion, preferably one who was loyal and amusing, and most importantly, could keep a secret. Luckily for Eva, Kitty was all of these things and also possessed the invaluable quality of not minding being roped into schemes and plots. Ava summoned Kitty with a note, who arrived in good time that very same day. Fortunately for all involved, Lady Stanton was still out. Once the two young ladies had greeted each other with airy kisses in the French manner, Eva wasted no time in dragging Kitty up to her room. They arranged themselves in their customary manner, Eva sitting, and Kitty arranging and rearranging her hair while she stood behind. After Eva had explained her predicament, Kitty stared at her, blinking in incomprehension. I'm not sure I understand you, she said at last. You wish to go to Lady Patience for tea tomorrow, which is a perfectly normal and respectable thing to do. That is correct, Eva confirmed. And while there, you will be speaking with a dancing master who has an untarnished reputation about undertaking some lessons. Also correct, Ava agreed again. And your mother is not only in agreement with taking said dancing lessons, but also the one who insisted upon them in the first place. When Ava nodded, Kitty continued. And for some reason, you do not wish your mother to be at this tea, where you will be discussing the dance lessons that she wishes you to have, and that you yourself are quite eager to have. Well, when you say it like that, of course it sounds ridiculous, Eva protested weakly. Very well, Kitty said mildly. You say it so that it makes sense. The problem is not the dancing lessons themselves, Eva explained, searching for the words as she was speaking. It's that if Mother is there, she will... 
You know how she is. She will take over everything. Kitty gave a knowing nod that Eva saw in the mirror's reflection. Ah, that is true. Lady Stanton can be a touch overbearing. Precisely. I want this to be something for me, on my own. I want to be able to speak to the dancing master without Mother simply stampeding the conversation like a runaway carriage. She will demand that he teach me the same old dances, and I want to try something new, something I've never done before. Eva paused, feeling Kitty grow thoughtful in the way that her fingers slowed in braiding a lock of Eva's hair. But why? Kitty asked simply. It was clear that she was not questioning Eva, merely asking for an explanation so that she might better understand. I am resigned to my fate. I know that I must marry, and soon preferably to a wealthy gentleman who will take me simply for my handsome face. Before that, however, I just want to do something for myself. I want to know that I am capable of more than just following along the plan laid out for me. Without quite knowing why, Eva found herself suddenly at the mercy of sentimentality. Tears threatened, which she blinked away furiously. Kitty, knowing Eva for nearly her whole life, could immediately sense that something was the matter. She dropped the hair that she had been weaving into a complex chignon and threw her arms about Eva's neck, nearly bowling them both over. Oh, Eva, you really do belong in a pond, she sighed, squeezing Eva tightly. Eva laughed a watery laugh. This was Kitty's customary way of telling Eva that she was being nonsensical. And why is that? Because you truly are a silly goose. Eva reached up and grasped Kitty's arms affectionately. Does this mean that you'll help me then? Kitty sighed and released Eva, resuming her brushing and styling. Of course I will, don't I always? I may not understand you, but you are my dearest friend. You know that I am always going to assist you. Ava smiled, not just because she got her way and would be able to have the meeting that she wanted without her mother's interference. She also smiled because Kitty really was the dearest creature and never failed to gladden her heart. While Eva had been blessed with a countenance that was deemed a work of art by all who saw it, Kitty had been graced with a face that was so adorable, so innocently cute, that no one could ever suspect her of duplicity. Thus, when she had taken Lady Stanton's hands and tearfully told her that she needed her assistance, that worthy lady had no reason to doubt her. It was in the most tremulous of tones that Kitty told her that she needed to be escorted to the modiste, preferably as soon as possible. When Lady Stanton questioned Kitty as to why her own mother could not simply take her, Kitty had very gravely said, Oh, but Lady Stanton, my mother doesn't understand. You have such an eye for fashion, and you know what will catch a man's eye better than anyone I know. Why, it's all that you talk to Eva about, so I know that you're an expert. Lady Stanton, naturally, had been flattered, and flattery always worked wonders on her. She may have also been swayed by the knowledge that Kitty still had a credit with the modiste, and she may reasonably expect a new pair of gloves at the very least for her troubles. When the hour for their trip arrived, however, Eva found herself unable to accompany them. A sudden and terrible headache had come on, and she was confined to her bed with the curtains drawn. Of course, if anyone had cared to look closely, they would see that beneath the blankets, Eva was fully dressed. No sooner had they departed than Eva sprang up, quickly donning her winter spencer and bonnet. She paused long enough to look over herself briefly in the looking glass, hoping that her hair wasn't too frightfully mussed by having to lay in bed. As quietly as she could, hoping not to alert the few remaining servants, she tiptoed down the stairs. She paused at the foot of the stairway, listening. When she was satisfied that she was alone, she slipped through the front door, latching it quietly behind her. It wasn't until she was out on the street, the cold wind biting at her cheeks, that Ava realised exactly what she was doing. She was out, walking the streets of London, without a chaperone or maid. It was daringly independent, strutting about like this without a companion of any sort. Despite the trepidation this realisation brought on, 
it also filled Ava with a kind of pride and independence. Both were new sensations, but she found that she quite liked them. Chapter 7 Are you completely mad? Josiah paused, sighing at his reflection. He had been occupied in knotting his cravat in such a way that was elegant enough to call on a lady of the ton, but not so fancy as to be absurd. Beatrice Hart, the perennial female lead of his troupe and dancing partner, had caught wind of his latest invitation and had called on him in his dressing room after an early morning rehearsal. She was lounging on a settee shoved up against a wall, idly inspecting the flowers and what not left for him. Her blonde hair was cropped short in the Parisian fashion, which highlighted her cat-like features and her elegant neck. She was wrapped carelessly in a dressing gown, her legs stretched along the settee as she sprawled elegantly against one arm. Her entire aspect was feline in nature, relaxed but coiled, as if she could pounce at any moment. And pounce she did, at least verbally. Josiah had rather casually mentioned that he might simply cry off the whole appointment. He wasn't particularly of a mind to placate ladies of the ton, no matter how charming or clever they might be. And really, what would his art be helped by teaching yet more another debutante how to quadrille or sally? Which is exactly what he said, mostly thinking aloud. Beatrice, however, did not hear idle musing. She was of a decidedly more mercenary bent, something that Josiah both relied on and detested. Beatrice loved dance, but she understood what it was to be hungry and have naught but the clothes on her back, in a way that Josiah never could. He was from a wealthy family, his mother having fled France when the unpleasantness began, as she had referred to it. Josiah had taken his first dance steps in the French court. Beatrice had taken hers at a quayside to earn a few hay pennies. She was naturally offended at the very idea that Josiah would turn down such an opportunity. When she heard his words, Josiah could hear her sitting bolt upright, her casual posture abandoned. Are you completely mad? she demanded, her green eyes flashing in the reflection of the mirror that Josiah was using to tie his cravat. Do you have any notion of the opportunity you would be simply tossing away? Somewhat, yes. But I imagine that you are preparing to tell me all about it, Josiah drawled, not bothering to turn around. Lady Patience Chester is not just the wife of Lord Chester, heir to the earldom. She is also the daughter of the Dowager Duchess of Carnegie and sister to the Duchess of Brandon. Beatrice explained slowly, as if that was the answer to everything. B. You can't swing a cat in a London ballroom without hitting six girls who are as well connected, Josiah sighed. In title, maybe, but the Dowager Duchess is the very last word in taste among the more established ton. She was absent from society for years after her husband died, and even from nowhere she still had enough clout to sway London. Beatrice stood and began to pace restlessly, one finger tapping her mouth. If her daughter takes an interest in our troupe, then the rest of the town will follow suit. We wouldn't have to scramble for patrons. They would come to us. That is all well and good, Josiah agreed grudgingly, but I am not sure how the other lady fits into the equation. You're not much on the town, but Lady Eva Stanton is one of the diamonds of London, Beatrice said, halting her pacing to make a show of holding one hand out, inspecting her nails. She and Lord Tom Chester ran a very fashionable set of some of the most notable bon vivants. She is supposed to be very beautiful, is she? Yes, Josiah answered without hesitation. She was quite striking. Something hard flitted across Beatrice's face but was quickly tamped down. Then teach the girl to dance, and she will do your advertising for you. That would mean contracting with her mother, a high price indeed, Josiah muttered. Beatrice shrugged and sank back onto the settee with a flippant wave of her hand. But is it worth it? Josiah knew good and well that she was speaking of the trouble being worth the boon to the troop but there was something else in her tone, a kind of hidden meaning. He mentally shrugged and chalked it up to Beatrice's innate need to be the best, most beautiful woman in the room. Whatever the situation was, Josiah steeled himself as he set out from the theatre. 
when he placed his hat atop his head, it felt as if he were putting on armour. Ava was not typically one for nervous complaints, but she found herself thoroughly in the throes of one while awaiting the arrival of the dancing master. She sat at the little tea table in Lady Patience's parlour and attempted a mask of serenity. If one only looked at her upper half, it would be easy to believe that she was perfectly calm, a pool of still water. However, if one were to catch a glimpse beneath the tea table, it would become quite clear what a ruse this was. Ava's foot tapped nervously, her leg unable to hold still. Her hands, too, twisted into tense knots in her lap. When Ava's leg jostling became a tad too pronounced and caused the carefully laid tea service to rattle, Lady Patience favoured her with a chiding look. Sheepishly, Eva ducked her head a little, and Patience sighed and smiled a little, as if she knew the punchline to a joke as yet unspoken. Ava was at the point of despairing of the entire scheme when at last a footman entered, announcing the arrival of Mr Galpin. For some reason that Eva couldn't fathom, her face flushed with warmth, her heart leaping into her throat. Stop being ridiculous, she chastised herself. You are not a debutante in the blush of her first season. Tossing her head a little, Eva resumed the familiar posture that she typically affected in social gatherings. It was an artful expression of carefully calculated disinterest and haughty grandeur. It had worked her thus far, and she didn't see any reason why it shouldn't now. Her mother was not a particularly wise woman by any measure, but she had firmly impressed upon Eva that if she believed herself to be a grand lady, then everyone around her would begin to believe it as well. Lady Patience rose to greet Mr Galpin, and Eva had to bite back the last of her nerves. She glanced up to him once, prepared to greet him casually, but her head was quickly snapping back around to look at him more fully. He was dressed in buff breeches tucked into glossy brown boots in deference to the winter sludge of London and a dove grey coat. His waistcoat, which peaked from the top of the jacket, was cream brocade worked in silver thread. His cravat was a dark wine red, standing out starkly from the starched whites and grey tones of the rest of his ensemble. His collar was cut high along his jaw, which served to emphasise his sharp, angular features. In contrast to popular fashion, Mr Galpin wore his platinum hair long, pulled back into a low queue and tied with a silver ribbon. His blue eyes were so light they were almost grey and seemed to be perpetually hooded. Combined with the well-formed mouth, it gave him a sensuous look, as if he were constantly only just rolled out of bed. Ava stared up at him, dimly aware on some level that she was, in fact, staring blatantly. It was not that he was the most handsome man she had ever seen. London was full of them, and he was a handsome man, but more the entire picture that he presented. He was an experience. Vaguely, Eva could hear Patience speaking, inviting Mr Galpin to sit. Thankfully, she seemed content to do her duties as hostess, carrying the conversation easily, while Eva sat there, a little dumbstruck. When at last Ava began to attend what they were saying, it was in the midst of a sentence. Prefer mystère or monsieur? I understand that can be something of a sensitive subject these days, Patience was saying, with all due concern and sympathy. Mister is quite suitable, my lady. My father was English after all and I can scarcely remember France, Mr Galpin replied, giving her a banal smile. I understand that you learned to dance under the master of the French court. I did. Mr Galpin delicately set the teacup he had been holding down. My first memory is tottering along behind him following his instructions. And now here you are, the master yourself, Patience said, her eyes smiling gently. Would he be terribly proud of you, do you think? That caused Mr Galpin to pause. Perhaps. I'd like to think so, at least. He lifted his teacup, then hesitated a smile curling his lips a little. More likely, he'd chastise me for still not turning my toes out far enough, but of course that was how you knew he was satisfied. Oh? If he found nothing else to complain about, he would harp on one's toes. He looked vaguely wistful, 
as if longing for the days when he was the one being instructed rather than the one doing the correcting. A quiet kind of nostalgia descended on the table then, a comfortable silence as everyone was a little lost in their own memories of younger days. Ava caught Patience's eye, raising an eyebrow and her teacup in a silent salute. She had found a way to set everyone at ease and to put Mr Galpin in a tractable state of mind without any forced flattery or simpering. It was impressively subtle. At length, however, Mr Galpin seemed to shake off the reverie and arranged his features into a pleasant expression. It was a little startling to see this contrast between what had been genuine instinctual pleasure and the carefully constructed mask he wore now. Eva could not help but wonder if she too looked as sharp and wooden with her practised expressions. Now, as charming as I find your company, how might I be of service? he asked, all congeniality. Patience regarded him coolly for a moment, giving nothing away. Again, Eva had to admire her. She had been on the receiving end of this inspection before, and she knew that Patience was meticulously sizing Mr. Galpin up. Mr. Galpin, I do not believe in false flattery, she said at last. He looked as if he might protest, but Patience merely raised a hand. You may therefore take it quite literally when I tell you that you and your performers are the most distinguished and talented I have ever seen. A wry smile as she paused. Of course, there are some who would say that I may not have seen very many, which is true, but I am quite firm in my tastes. When I decide that I like something, that is it. Here, she made direct eye contact with Mr. Galpin again, and her soft eyes sharpened. In short, I would like to become your patron. You will find me a generous and affable patroness. Mr. Galpin absorbed all of this, saying nothing for several beats. Ava watched, a little fascinated. She could almost see the inner workings of his mind, calculating and weighing the proposal. She was intrigued that he did not accept out of hand, though that could simply be born from a desire to not appear desperate. Ava did not believe that to be the case, however. He did not have the hollow-cheeked hunger that seemed to haunt a lot of performers. Are there any terms you would care to stipulate? he asked finally. There is not, Patience said, then checked herself. Well, perhaps one. Yes, Mr Galpin asked, looking as if he were bracing for the worst. That you create and perform as you see fit. I will not have you beholden to some absurd standards of the ton. Here Patience actually snorted a little, lifting her chin. She looked far more like her mother, the dowager, than anyone would have dared to comment. As if the ton are experts in the arts. No, I leave it entirely in your hands. Mr Galpin did not seem to know how to respond to this. He stared at Patience, who ignored him for her tea. Ava could feel herself grinning, for he clearly was put on the back foot. His ice-blue eyes flicked to her, and she nearly froze. And what about, he asked, jerking his head in Eva's direction. Her amusement soured a bit at being referred to like a piece of luggage left unattended in the corner. This manifested in her tossing her head proudly again, a barely contained sneer on her face. Lady Eva is her own woman. And your business with her is entirely independent of mine, Patience said calmly. Though I would naturally encourage you to take her on, she was quite taken by your performance. Eva shot a glance at Patience, who studiously ignored her. Now it was her turn to be inspected by Mr Galpin, and to her credit, she did not shrink away from his probing gaze. I imagine that I shall need to come to terms with your mother, he said, unable to stop his mouth from quirking as he spoke. That is correct. This certainly seemed a negative in his deliberations, and Ava could not exactly blame him. Why do you wish for my instruction? he asked, pinning Ava to her chair with a direct gaze. Ava stared directly back at him, and she had the distinct impression that they were engaged in a kind of test, a silent battle of wills. Ava, never one to shrink away, righted her shoulders, refusing to give in. It's because of what I saw on the stage that night, she said at last, feeling as if it would be pointless to lie. What did you see? 
he asked, his voice coaxing. Eva reached to pour more tea, and Mr. Galpin's eyes snapped to the movement, like a predator that sees something rustling in the grass. He watched the movement closely, analysing and curious. Slowly, Eva withdrew her hand, his eyes following her the whole time. I saw possibility, Eva answered finally. Wordlessly, Mr. Galpin's eyes slid back to her face. Slowly, deliberately, a smile began to spread across his face. Eva, despite her careful control of her expression, found that she couldn't help but smile in return. Chapter 8 The tea could not be called anything other than a rousing success, until the moment that Lady Stanton burst into the parlour. She was in quite a state, fit to be tied even, when she found her missing daughter sitting calmly at tea. Eva tried not to wince, knowing that this would likely grow into quite a scene. Fortunately for all involved, just as Lady Stanton was winding up to deliver a no-doubt scathing sermon, she caught sight of Mr. Galpin, sitting serenely and looking dapper. Instantly, her furious expression melted away, and instead became simpering. Oh, why, Master Galpin, how good it is to see you again, she said, all smiles and good manners. Lady Stanton, he replied evenly, giving nothing away. Well then, if you are here, does this mean that you will be taking my darling Eva on as a student? Of course you will. She would be a boon to any master, Lady Stanton continued without waiting for an answer. She may not be in the first flush of spring any more, but I am certain that she will do you credit. Oh, mother, Eva cried, her cheeks growing hot. Don't take umbrage with me, my girl. We are among friends, and Mr. Galpin knows the way of the world. Lady Stanton, searching about for a chair, found one and dragged it closer to the table without preamble, attempting to wedge herself between Mr. Galpin and Patience. Eva, quickly becoming mortified, put her forehead into her palm for a moment. She began to desperately try to come up with a way to get her mother out as quickly and painlessly as possible. In the meantime, it seemed that there was no way of stopping her mother's diatribe. Indeed, she leaned in closer to Mr. Galpin, speaking conspiratorially. Now, we cannot pretend that things are as they aren't, she tutted. Ava needs all the help that she can get this season. She is in danger of being put on the shelf, and we cannot have that. I cannot countenance it myself. She had so many attractive offers when she debuted, and now... Lady Stanton affected a great sigh. Well, I am sure with your instruction she will shine on the dance floor all the more. I am sure that she will not need my help to shine anywhere, Mr. Galpin said mildly. Ava shot him a look which he acknowledged with a twitch of his lips. Oh dear, it looks like it may be starting to rain, Lady Stanton, Patience said, her face perfectly creased with just the right amount of concern. Shall I ring for the carriage? I wouldn't wish you to catch a chill on the way home. That would be most kind, Lady Stanton preened. Our own carriage is being reupholstered, you know. Patience did not know this, and neither did Eva, as they could not afford to keep one. They were forced to hire one out, much to Lady Stanton's consternation. Everyone let that pass without comment, but Patience did shake her head and tusk sympathetically. Oh, but look at the time, Patience said, rising from the table. I had forgotten that Tom will require the carriage to pick him up from his club. Oh dear, I do hate to hurry you along, but I wouldn't wish you to be rained on. Lady Stanton was too busy feeling self-congratulatory to notice that she was being shuffled out in quick order. Again, Eva had to bow to Patience's superior social skills. She had handled the temperamental Lady Stanton with aplomb. Even now she had looped her arm through Lady Stanton's and was nodding sympathetically as Lady Stanton poured all manner of rain-related complaints into her ears. Eva was left to trail behind, walking more or less alongside Mr. Galpin. She studiously ignored him, not wishing to see him either mocking or pitying her. With precise motions, she slid her hands into her gloves, her arms into her spencer. 
The entire time she could feel Mr Galpin's eyes on her, dissecting her movements as if he were memorising them. When she craned her neck to tie the ribbon of her bonnet under her chin, he tilted his head too, mimicking and studying. Thank you, Mr Galpin. I look forward to our lessons commencing, she said, not meeting his eye, bobbing a hurried curtsy. Patience had managed to steer Lady Stanton out of the house and to the curb where the carriage was just pulling up. She glanced back once over her shoulder to Eva, her violet eyes glancing between Eva and Mr Galpin. I am sure that we shall both benefit, he replied, a slight lilt to his voice. I like to fancy that I have an eye for talent, so I have no fears that you shall be great. He paused and from the corner of her eye Eva could see that he was again on the verge of smiling. And I do like the dramatic, after all. Eva had nothing to say to that, so she pulled her shoulders straight again and marched out to meet her mother. Her head was a swirl that refused to sit still. Automatically she climbed into the carriage. Lady Stanton was all a twitter over the quality of the squabs in the carriage, running her hand over them covetously. Ava paid her only half-mind, watching London roll by slowly. So absorbed was she that she started a little when a fat raindrop splatted against the carriage window. Blinking, she looked about, focusing on her mother, who was busy extolling the virtues of Lady Patience. As she had shown such consideration, and was so well connected, Lady Stanton seemed inclined to forgive her for stealing Tom away, as she saw it. Mother, Eva interrupted, must you really announce to everyone that I must find a husband this season? It's embarrassing. Embarrassing? Embarrassing, Lady Stanton demanded. Will it be any less embarrassing when we are turned out of our home and forced into debtor's prison? We're not going to debtor's prison, Eva sighed. Our friends wouldn't allow it. Pah! As if we have a great many of them any more. When your father, rest his soul, died and left us with a pittance, you saw how quickly our friends abandoned us when we could no longer pay their way. The lines around Lady Stanton's mouth deepened, her hazel eyes going flinty. No, we shall have to rely on ourselves as we have always done. Better that we sell violets and sell upon the street than to depend on them. Eva sighed again, which only drew Lady Stanton's eye again which we wouldn't have to do if you would simply get married. I know, Mother, Ava replied quietly without real feeling behind it. I simply wish you would not be so transparent about it. No one can be in doubt about your intentions this season, Lady Stanton countered. Mother, Ava said, meeting her mother's eye, her jaw tight, you have implied that I am on the verge of becoming an old maid to half of London at this point. Well, that's not... It seems to me, Eva continued, changing tactics, that if you really wished me to find a desirable husband, you wouldn't be announcing that I am perilously close to spinsterhood. I should think it would be more in your favour to tell them how desirable I still am. You wouldn't want to get bad terms in the marriage contract, after all. That struck a nerve with Lady Stanton. Ava knew that she was relying on her potential son-in-law to be generous, hopefully providing a small allowance in the settlement. She was clearly also angling to live with them, but Eva was not sure that she could survive that. Regardless, it was satisfying to see the way in which Lady Stanton's mouth snapped shut. Unfortunately, this new reticence did not last long. It was only a matter of moments before Lady Stanton was once again on a tirade about Eva needing new gowns for the season. Eva only sighed, trying to reconcile herself to it. It seemed a foolish thing to be worried about when Eva wasn't sure how they would ever persuade a modiste to give them credit. Absently, Eva began tracing the rivulets of rain that were coursing down the carriage window now. If she allowed her eyes to relax and go blurry, it was easy enough to imagine that they were graceful dancers. This one hesitated before leaping across the stage. That one swirled and swooped until colliding with a new partner, becoming something new altogether. Once, when Josiah had been young and there had been a kind of temporary peace with France, he had gone on a tour to seek out the training of French and Italian dancing masters. 
A spring storm had collided with his ship full of wealthy tourists and young men on their grand tour on the Channel. What should have taken only a matter of hours dragged into nearly an entire day as they were battered about. When they finally made landfall, all of the passengers had looked at each other with a kind of grim happiness, dazed and temporarily bonded by the trying experience they had just endured. Standing outside of Lady Patience's fashionable townhouse, watching the carriage depart, Josiah was reminded of that expression when he caught sight of Lady Patience's face. They did not say anything for several moments, merely sharing a look that said plenty. At length, Patience gave a one-shouldered shrug that was incongruously casual for one of her standing. It's your circus now, the shrug seemed to say. Josiah bit back a bark of laughter. Josiah tipped his hat to her and made his farewells, then set off back in the direction of the theatre. He had lingered longer than he had anticipated and would need to get straight back in order to prepare for the evening. He had his own preparations and he wished to see about changing the order of the performance and then there were the younger dancers to supervise and... The rain, which had been a little reluctant, began to come down in earnest. Cold water was finding its way down the back of his collar. Grumbling a little, Josiah ducked into a doorway. He tried the handle to the shop but it was locked firmly, and when he looked closer it was clear that the windows were dark. Sighing, he pulled his greatcoat higher about his neck, settling in to see if the rain would abate. Josiah did not frequently question the direction of his life. He simply wasn't that sort of man, as it seemed a fool's errand to do so when he was largely his own master. Still, huddled here in the freezing rain, it was hard not to take a hard accounting of things. His knee ached, as it always did during inclement weather, and he would have to take care that his ankles did not stiffen. He could be living a life of far greater luxury if he wished. He was not a pauper, far from it in fact, but he had been selective about his performances, his patrons, his entire career. If he had less scruples about his art, he might be riding in a fine carriage, with servants of his own to look after him instead of one valet-cum-butler-cum-secretary that kept his small townhouse in order. Maybe Beatrice is right, he groused inwardly, folding his arms about himself. For a fleeting moment he allowed himself to imagine the life he might have, comfortable, warm, secure, restrained, cosetted, restricted. He shook his head to himself. A gust of wind came whipping down the street, making the sign hanging above the doorway in which Josiah hid creak and dropped some fat drops of rain onto him. Annoyed, he instinctively looked up to give a sour look to the sign, as if it had dripped on him intentionally, but his eye was caught by a flash of colour on it. Craning his neck, he attempted to see it better from his limited vantage. Though faded, it was clearly a golden butterfly on a green background. He couldn't begin to understand what would be advertised by such a sign, but he was intrigued. The gold reminded him of the little sun charm that Lady Ava had worn about her neck at the theatre. Josiah had remembered it because it was such an unusual detail, something he had never seen any other young lady wear. It had struck a kind of nostalgia in him. The palace at Versailles had been full of golden sun emblems, stamped in nearly every free space. He couldn't remember much, but he remembered them clearly, and he remembered the stories about the Sun King, Louis XIV, the great dancer. This naturally made him reflect on Lady Eva. His decision to accept her as a student had been an impulsive one, born out of nothing more than liking her bearing. She had a curious way of standing perfectly still, and he liked the way that her neck moved when she looked about. It was quite an unconscious grace, and he had caught sight of it when she had poured tea. The fact that her rich, dark eyes had looked at him with such naked hope and intrigue had been an unexpected bonus. Another gust of wind came barreling down the little street, bringing with it stray leaves and the remains of pamphlets. Josiah was inclined to burrow deep in his coat when the windswept leavings caught his eye. They were trapped in a kind of whirlwind, dancing playfully around each other. He was captivated by this dance of ordinary things, the ease with which they moved about each other in spite of the poor circumstances they found themselves in. Josiah could not help but reflect on this. Was it not also his duty, 
a calling on his artful expertise to take ordinary things and make them into something extraordinary? If he could show the ton that they could be more, that they could be beyond what they asked of him, then he might just be able to have the pure art that he craved and the security that he needed. And Lady Eva Stanton would be the perfect specimen to demonstrate his newfound ideology. Chapter 9 The weather absolutely refused to let up. London in January was a dreary prospect at the best of times, but being beset by freezing wind-driven rain for days on end was testing the limits of everyone's fortitude. Mr Galpin had chosen to instruct Eva at his dancing school, as it was the only large enough space to do so at their disposal. Eva had been a mite disappointed that it would not be at the theatre, but the very notion of that would have set her mother into hysterics. The instructing room was large and airy, with low fires at both ends to attempt to keep the space warm. The rain pelted the windows relentlessly, however, making it difficult to hear sometimes. It had also made for an absolutely miserable trip over for Eva, even in their rented carriage. When she had arrived, Mr Galpin had looked up at her with a bit of surprise, as if he had thoroughly expected her to cancel in deference to the weather. Surprise had quickly melted to satisfaction at her arriving, which would have made Eva blush if her cheeks weren't already wind-reddened. "'I am pleased that you braved the weather to attend,' Mr Galpin said, bowing slightly at the waist. Eva smiled and huffed a little, but Lady Stanton immediately seized on this. "'Oh, Mr Galpin, you would scarce believe the troubles we had this morning. I thought our carriage would surely tip no less than three times. Luckily, we've made it through, and surely all as a testament to you. My Eva would not let us reschedule. She flat out insisted we came, and I had half a mind to box the silly thing's ears for making us come out in this gale. Ah, but you must be frozen, Mr Galpin said, clearly seeing that another diatribe was quickly brewing. He swooped in gallantly, taking Lady Stanton by the arm and guiding her to the fireplace nearest the door. Please come take a chair by the fire and warm yourself. Might I offer you a little something to help ward off the chill? Spirits at this time of day, Lady Stanton scoffed. That is most improper. I suppose a small sherry might be acceptable. For my health, she added perfunctorily. Ava was at the point of slapping her forehead with her palm again, but Mr Galpin seemed to be taking all of this in some kind of stride. He summoned a maid, who he directed to help remove the wet shawls and pelisses of the ladies, and sent off to locate some sherry. Thus, having mollified Lady Stanton, he turned his attention to Eva. It was a little unnerving having a man look at her so directly and openly. It wasn't that men didn't look at her, they absolutely did, and Ava was relatively acclimated to that but one had never done so in such a personal setting. She refused to quell under his scrutiny, however, squaring her shoulders and lifting her chin a little. He circled about her, hands behind his back, as if he were a predator and she were a deer caught in the open. I understand why your mother wished for you to have instruction, Mr Galpin said, his voice low and calm, barely audible over the rain. Eva had to strain to hear him which she supposed was the point. She believes that I can mould you into an object of desire in the grandest of ballrooms. And you believe you can do that, can you? Eva asked, following him with her eyes, but refusing to turn her head. Mr Galpin stepped lightly back into view, standing on the ball of his foot and settling slowly onto the heel. I can, though I do not see much point in it, he said with a flick of his hand. You surely get enough attention as it is. Eva stared at him for a moment, unsure if he was teasing her. His face was perfectly serene, betraying nothing, and Eva let that pass without comment. Then why did you accept me as a student? Because of what you are doing right now, he answered immediately, stopping to stand directly in front of her. What am I doing? she asked, her pretty brow furrowing a little. You are still? like a statue, but light and graceful, you do not have a heaviness of step. Here, he said, turning and fetching a long, thin polished stick that went up to his elbow. He slid a small loop of leather over his wrist and approached Eva. 
Her eyes grew wide and she was sorely tempted to take a step backward. Mr. Galpin caught her worried eyes following him, and he smiled just a bit, the corners of his eyes crinkling slightly. Don't worry. The only ones who need to fear the sting of the cane are when the boys get out of hand with the maid. Now, he continued, coming behind Eva, you stand naturally perfectly aligned. She felt a small pressure against her spine. Clearly he had pressed the cane to her back, demonstrating. Slide your right foot just a little to the side. That's it, a bit more. Let your right foot take your weight, but not too much. With a nudge from the tip of the cane, Mr. Galpin encouraged Eva to lift her right heel from the floor, turning her foot slightly. She nearly yelped at the strange sensation, as no one but the cobbler and her maid had ever touched her about the foot and ankle before. Tamping down on that impulse, she allowed herself to be posed, a nudge here, a slight adjustment there. Before she knew it, she had an arm lifted, the elbow and wrist crooked just so, and her right leg extended, peeking out from beneath her skirt and petticoat. There, Mr. Galpin announced, triumphant. That is it precisely. Don't move, he admonished her, turning away again and fetching something large on little wheels, covered over with a sheet. Eva obeyed, not moving, scarcely daring to breathe. The large object was positioned directly in front of Eva, and with a dramatic pause, Mr. Galpin pulled the sheet off. Beneath was a large mirror, the largest that Eva had ever seen. She blinked in surprise, first at what it was, and then at what she saw in the reflection. She had been guided into a position she had seen dramatic actresses and dancers take on the stage, as if preparing to flee or turn away. She was balanced lightly on one foot, caught as if in the middle of a step. This would have been a remarkable thing all on its own but the tableau had more depth than merely an attractive pose. Ava had been put directly in front of the other fireplace, which caused her to be backlit by a warm orange glow. The whole effect was like a goddess of the rising sun. Oh, she breathed, pleased at what she saw. Now, Mr. Galpin said, circling about her again so that he could see her reflection still. Show me the next step you would take. No, do not think of it. Just do. Automatically, Eva obeyed. Of her own accord, she lifted her left hand slowly, placing the back of it against her forehead for a moment, as if in great agony or grief. Likewise, her left arm stiffened, as if warding something away. Just as suddenly, she folded in on herself, shrinking and shying away. Simply working from instinct, she then slowly unfurled her arms like a great bird slowly spreading its wings. She paused, not liking the angle, then adjusted her shoulders and neck. Her reflection stared back at her, regal, imperious, the promise of fire behind her back. Ah, Mr. Galpin said, a sighing sound of wonder and satisfaction. Eva said nothing, for she was transfixed by her reflection. She had never seen herself with a posture of such uncowed confidence. Her eyes were not demurely downcast, but staring back at her, down her straight nose. Her shoulders, too, were thrown back, defiant. It was a moment of epiphany for her, an understanding of why it was that society both feared and desired the women of the stage. It wasn't because of flashing ankles and painted cheeks, but because they understood their own power. What is that? Laddie Stanton's voice rang out, breaking the moment. Is this some new continental dance? Or something equatorial? I shan't have her gallivanting about the ballroom like a heathen, Mr. Galpin. Perish the thought, Lady Stanton, Josiah replied easily. Though I don't doubt that she could do so with grace and ease. I merely wished to see what her instincts were, how she stood. Humph, Lady Stanton harumphed. In my day, we did not fool about with all of this. We were simply told the steps and repeated them until they were right, and got a smack on the wrist when they weren't. This is... Extraordinary, Mr. Galpin breathed, from quite near Eva's shoulder. He had spoken so quietly that she was not even sure that she had heard him. It was only the warmth of his breath that confirmed that he had, in fact, spoken.
making Ava shiver a little. He was standing behind her almost near enough to feel. He maintained a proper distance, which had always seemed sufficient before, but something in the reflected gaze of his eyes in the mirror made Eva feel as if he were very near and very warm. Eva could not help but stare right back at him, even as he placed one hand gently on her waist. She automatically placed her hand over top his. They were perfectly opposite and complementary all at once. Dark and light, novice and master, sun and moon. Mr. Galpin placed his arm beneath hers, encouraging her to rest her right hand atop his. Her breath came quicker from between her parted lips, and she had the irrational thought that he might press his lips to the side of her neck. Dance is more than simply plodding along with a partner following steps. It can be the purest expression of self when words do not suffice. Now follow me, he murmured, and Ava found that she was quite happy to do so. Deftly, he led her in the steps of a waltz. Eva had always felt as if she had to maintain her vigilance when being led about the ballroom dance floor. She had difficulty in allowing herself to be led, refusing to yield that bit of control. This was something else entirely. Mr. Galpin did not seek to autocratically march her about, gently encouraging her instead. It was a dance of partners, giving and taking, working in synchronization. Ava had never particularly understood the joy of dancing before this very moment. When at last they stopped, Eva was facing Mr. Galpin. She stared up at him, his smoky eyes boring into hers. Gently he released her, stepping backward. Reality came back to Eva slowly, and she blinked rapidly in confusion for a moment. What was that, Mr. Galpin? Lady Stanton demanded. A waltz, my lady, he replied breezily. They are becoming quite de mode in the better ballrooms of Europe. Lady Stanton made a disgruntled sound. I cannot imagine that it is wholly proper. Dancing together as a couple. In such close quarters, the whole time. Eva watched as Mr. Galpin seemed to stifle a sigh, putting on a condescending smile. Not to worry, Lady Stanton, he said, his words sounding a little forced. You are merely seeing it with only us, he said with a nod toward Eva. It is difficult to see how it will fully work without the other pairs. Well, when I was a girl, Lady Stanton began, but was quickly cut off by Mr. Galpin. The real point of this, he said, turning his attention back to Eva, is that Lady Eva managed to follow along the whole set. She is quite a natural talent. Eva did not look down and blush, as was surely expected of her. Instead, she looked right back into Mr. Galpin's eyes and smiled. This seemed to take him aback, but then the corner of his mouth was twitching, as if he were on the verge of smiling himself. Might we do that again? Ava asked, and was immediately aware of how that might sound, asking to be whirled around by a man. I wish to do it perfectly, you see, and I doubt that I shall always have such an experienced partner to guide me. Mr. Galpin gave Ava a strange look, as if trying to ascertain if she were being humorous. You need little help with the form, he said, taking up his cane again. This time follow along behind, so that you might begin memorising the steps. Eva obliged, standing a pace or two behind him. He went slowly, showing her the steps, his own natural quickness checked so that she could follow. A couple of times, he halted her, asking her to stand still so that he might correct her posture. She naturally carried herself upright, which made things easier. Many of the Ton's dances require quick and nimble feet, he explained, tapping out a rhythm on the floor with the cane. This is an oft-neglected part of dance. Many are more concerned with making graceful arms or turns of the neck, as they are more visible. It is the feet, however, that are the mark of a good dancer. Ava was not a woman who spent her days lounging on a sofa especially as it became more and more difficult for them to rent a carriage and she was forced to walk to and fro. Even before that, she had been accustomed to riding and was fond of a social walk in the park. She had long assumed that she was a fit and active specimen of woman, but she could feel her stamina flagging. 
Her ankles were tiring, and she had the beginnings of a cramp forming in one of her calves. Mr. Galpin was not insensitive to this, however, as he gave her gentle encouragement. Still, he pushed her to continue for a few minutes longer, keen that she develop her endurance. At last, he let her place her hand atop his, as if they were actually in a grand ballroom, and led her back to her mother. You've done very well, he said softly, speaking only to her. You may wish to put your feet up for the rest of the day if you can. Try to walk about on your toes as much as you can for the next few days to help develop your strength. When shall I see you again? Eva asked a little impulsively. For my next lesson, she added hastily. In three days' time, should that suit your mother? Mr. Galpin glanced to Lady Stanton, who assented reluctantly, citing concerns about the weather again. Practice, he encouraged Eva with sudden enthusiasm. You shall be as good as much as you practice. Eva did not say anything, but inclined her head. Mr. Galpin gave her another one of his near smiles, ignoring her mother. He seemed as if he were attempting to tell Eva something, but she could not fathom what it might be. He had been a kind, helpful instructor, not at all like the dancing master Eva had endured previously. The maid reappeared, and Eva began donning her pelisse and gloves again, feeling reluctant and a little disappointed that her hour was up already. Mr. Galpin had followed Lady Stanton's wishes to teach Eva the new dances that would keep her a fashionable young lady. But there had been just a moment at the beginning when Eva thought, it didn't matter in the end, she supposed. Whatever he had seen in her, whatever he had envisioned when staring so intently at her in the mirror, was for naught. Eva was not free to do as she wished, and Mr. Galpin would not dare to make Eva into a modern performer. She could not explain it fully, but as she turned to leave the studio, it was incredibly difficult for Eva to not turn around and cast a last glance at Mr. Galpin. The ladies of the ton were all besotted with him, and Eva had no plans to join their ranks. Still, as the maid hurried to open the door and ensure their carriage was waiting outside, Eva couldn't help but glance backward once. Mr. Galpin was watching her leave, his expression thoughtful. Eva whipped her head back around. She could not begin to understand why he looked at her in such a manner, as if he were a sculptor attempting to find a statue within a lump of marble to carve out. She was simply another young lady with an overbearing mother who wanted to learn to take a turn about the ballroom without embarrassing herself. Nothing more. Chapter 10 The silence that followed after the departure of Lady Stanton and Eva was nearly deafening. Josiah stood for some moments, simply staring at the entryway through which they had left. Idly, he passed his tall instructor's cane from hand to hand. Despite his affluent origins, it would be incorrect to assume that Josiah still enjoyed the spoils of the ton. Though forced to move among them, he found most of them to be a silly and vain lot, with very few exceptions. It was an unexpected pleasure to realise that Eva was not one of these shallow creatures. She had spoken little, only asking pertinent questions. She had followed his instructions with an alacrity that was immensely gratifying. More importantly, she had a real instinct of movement. Josiah had felt like he'd been struck by lightning when, for those few moments that it was simply Eva and her reflection, she had shown more creativity and movement than the rest of the fashionable girls he tutored combined. She had been magnificent, not because she was such an expert, but because of the manner in which she could convey feeling. He could not help but compare her to Beatrice, who was, in terms of technicality, far superior to Eva but lacked the impulsion for emotion. Though he was used to seeing extraordinary things on the stage, even he had to stop and simply admire Eva. Her poise, her carriage, the movement. It doesn't hurt that she's prettier than a sunrise either, Josiah thought unbidden. He attempted to maintain a distance between himself and his students, especially the young ladies. There had been some pretty ones through the years, but he had always held them at arm's length as if there were an invisible sheet of glass between them. This distance suited everyone, especially as the ladies liked having someone harmless to flutter their eyelashes at. Eva. 
she was different. She had an arresting beauty that drew him in like a moth to a flame. Slowly Josiah strode about across the polished wooden floor. Idly he went up on his toes, then back down again, mostly attempting to stay limber and warm before his next lesson. Pirouetting lightly on one foot, he found himself facing the now empty chair next to the fireplace. His face pulled downward into a frown. Lady Stanton was a problem. Ava had been on the verge of something great, struggling against the weight of society's expectations and her mother's demands, and her mother's cross words had pulled her from the precipice. There were a number of rumours making their way about London about Eva and her mother. Josiah had a healthy amount of doubt for most of them, but there was enough gossip for him to piece together the bare bones of their situation. Bare bones did indeed seem the most apt way to describe it. They were clearly in reduced circumstances, and it was no secret that Lady Stanton was on the make on her daughter's behalf. Josiah was a little surprised that she had been unsuccessful thus far. The ton was full of men willing to pay a fortune for a pretty face, much like a painting to hang in their grand halls. Still, there was a reluctance about Eva, as if she were not completely in agreement with her mother's insistence. Ava's father had died some years ago, leaving Lady Stanton in a real fix. The details were scant, but it seemed that the late Lord Stanton had invested heavily in some credit scheme, which had promptly burst just before his death. It did not seem a stretch to assume that the stress of it did him in. Lady Stanton seemed intent on simply pretending that all was as it had been before. Josiah's knee twinged, a reminder of the grey weather that still battered London. He could not help but sigh and be a little grateful that he was not performing this night. He was due to instruct a group of ladies and young men who were set to make their debuts into society later in the year, but were not of the highest echelons of the ton by any figure. Their middle-class mothers had pooled their resources and paid for group lessons, which was becoming more and more common. As their money was more dear to them, they were less inclined to skip lessons, which Josiah admired. Their dedication, while admirable, did not help with Josiah's aches and pains. He sat on the floor, stretching his legs out before him and attempting to rub some warmth into his knee. His mind wandered back to Eva, who seemed to radiate her own kind of warmth. He could understand her reluctance to dissent openly against her mother. Moreover, he could sympathise with her. His own family had been quite averse to his choice of career, or even that he should have one in the first place. His father had been a wealthy landowner turned factory owner in one of the new mills that had sprung up at the end of the last century. While his family had been old, it had lacked the wealth and standing that the elder Mr Galpin had been grasping for. With the advent of his mill, he had the wealth, but had lost all hope of respectability. There was no chance for him to form a decent attachment, not in the north of England, so he had gone further afield. As the story went, he had been set on finding an Italian bride, but had made it no farther than France. He had found Josiah's mother while on a somewhat clandestine trip to Versailles. She was the natural daughter of a high-ranking nobleman at court and had been raised in all of the splendour that Paris had to offer. She had a voice like a canary and had instilled in Josiah a sense of music from an early age. They had left France for patently clear reasons. Josiah could not remember much of the details, only the chaos and shouting, and that everyone seemed to be running, always running, but never sure of where they were going. From that moment on, his childhood was as good as over. His mother did not sing any more, and their home had taken on a grey pallor. It was a despondent time. Dance had saved Josiah. It was the one spark of joy left to him, though he always carried a sense of guilt that he had found a form of happiness. Being accepted to a prestigious academe during peace with France had been like sunlight breaking through a heavy blanket of grey clouds. His father had scowled when he had learned the news. His mother had merely looked pained and then panicked. She did not trust peacetime in France, not any more, not when most of her family's heads had gone rolling across a public square. Josiah was disinherited but free. To a young man it was an easy price to pay. His father had refused to see him again, 
even when Josiah had begun to make a name for himself. It had taken years, years of bleeding feet and currying favour with the correct people, but he had done it. He had seen his mother once or twice, but she always looked at him with liquid eyes, full of tears and regret. Because he had managed to break free, Josiah had little patience for those who had remained trapped. Some warranted sympathy, like Lady Eva. She was clearly stuck in an impossible situation, one without a solution that wouldn't crush her spirit any more than it already was. He could see her testing the boundaries, pushing against them, but always drawing back. With a little encouragement, with the right motivation, perhaps she could. Josiah shook himself all over suddenly, like a dog that has lately come in from the rain. Frowning, he looked about himself, realising that he was still on the floor of the studio. He wasn't sure how long he had been sitting there, lost in thoughts and memories that all swirled together. He also didn't know why it was that Lady Eva had dredged up all of these feelings. He hadn't thought about his parents in years. It would not do for him to be caught lolling about on the floor when his students arrived. With a sigh that verged on a groan, Josiah swept both of his legs underneath him in one graceful motion. Pushing off the floor with his hands, he rose easily, with only a perfunctory grunt at his knee. He quickly arranged his face into a mask of pleasantness, hoping that it concealed the heaviness within. He was just in time, too, for from the entryway came the sounds of girls chattering and boys stamping their feet from the cold. Assuming the mien of the maestro, Josiah clicked his heels together, threw back his shoulders, and lifted his chin. He held the cane before him in both hands, and attempted to quiet himself with a deep breath. But it did not work. He was not centred. He was not steady. He felt agitated, full of a sharp, biting energy. The students began filing in, having exchanged their heavy walking boots for the light shoes required for dancing. At Josiah's instruction, he had them collect their boots and put them before either of the fires. When this was done, Josiah firmly wrapped the floor twice with the cane. In an instant, all chatter died away, and two lines were formed of boys and girls facing one another. Shy glances were exchanged between them, cheeks already pink from the cold going redder still. The mothers who had shepherded them were in chairs near the fires, but sat on the very edges, as if they expected to be told to vacate their seats at any moment. Josiah took his place at the head of the lines, and all of the students turned to look at him expectantly. They were still young, the oldest not yet thirteen. Josiah merely looked down at them for a moment, something fighting within him. He glanced over to their mothers, their plain dresses and hopeful faces. He never really knew how much he had experienced the great turmoil in France, though it was something that he was asked about regularly. He knew that people wanted the gritty details, the stories about blood and sharp knives and fires that no one could put out, but he refused to indulge them. He would only give a shrug and an affable smile and say that he was very young then. He could only remember once, adults in his mother's salon, arguing loudly among themselves. They seemed upset about a book and who was reading it. He could remember distinctly his mother, pretty and fair, sitting on a chair listening and simply asking, Why not? Why shouldn't they be allowed? Now looking down at these eager, waiting faces, Josiah wondered if he had taken on more than he had known. Perhaps his mind had been watered with revolutionary fervour. He knew what these children had been told. This is how you will gain entry into their world. They must think you are one of them. Do you know what we have sacrificed to pay for this? Something hardened into a cutting edge within Josiah. If they wish to infiltrate the ballrooms of the Tun, then I will ensure that they do it with the greatest possible style, he thought fighting to keep his mouth from smiling at the prospect. Why should they not have their chance? Why shouldn't anyone? Chapter 11 Many of the rooms in the Stanton home had been closed off to save on the cost of heating. Bit by bit, inch by inch, Ava had watched her home shrink along with her prospects. It was a fitting metaphor. She had wondered more than once why her mother stubbornly hung on to the townhouse in the fashionable part of London. 
It was a massive cost, even with the reduced servants and rooms firmly shut up. It could have been sold, the outstanding debts cleared, and still have enough left to buy a comfortable home outside of London. Lady Stanton refused to let it go, though, as if that were the last acknowledgement of giving up. At least there aren't any creditors sleeping three deep on our stoop, Eva thought with grudging admiration. She had cornered Tom, who had reluctantly helped her go over the sums. The only income they had was the interest from a settlement that had been made on Lady Stanton during better times, which she had put into government bonds and stubbornly refused to move onto credit. It turned out to be their saving grace, as all over London, banks had failed and credit had dried up. Mark me, I've heard about it all before, Lady Stanton had said, shaking her head and her finger. My own mother saw her father lose it all in the South Sea bubble of 1720. It was the one time that Eva could remember her mother refusing to follow the whims and fads of the ton. But now, because she wished for her daughter to remain at the forefront of fashion, Lady Stanton had unlocked the doors of their modest ballroom and had a fire lit. A handful of good tapers were brought in as well, in deference to the January gloom. Eva felt twin stabs of guilt and pleasure, for she knew that it was an expense that they should not take on, but she could not deny that she wanted to practice. Lady Stanton had parked herself in a chair near the fire and was seemingly occupied with looking at fashion plates and not paying much mind to Eva. Meanwhile, Eva began slowly moving about in small, precise steps. To her great surprise, her body remembered the pattern of its own volition, which pleased her greatly. She lifted her arms, turning about an invisible partner. Mind your face, Eva, her mother tutted, surprising her. The finest steps in the world shan't save you if you keep swanning about with that vacant look. Don't daydream. Ava did not even bother to contradict her. The fact was she was not daydreaming at all. She had entered a state of such calm and peace that it felt as if her body were light enough to simply float away. All of the worries about the present and future had melted away like snow in the sun. Alone, without music, Ava allowed herself to be carried away again, the only sounds the whisper of her feet across the floor and the rustle of her dress. She did not know how much time had passed, for she was quite content to be lost in dancing. It was a bit startling then, when a footman, their only footman, appeared in the doorway. He hesitated, hovering at the threshold, unsure if he were permitted to come inside. Yes, what is it? Lady Stanton barked, rankled. Eva and the footman shared a look. The more troubled Lady Stanton was, the more likely she was to snap at everyone's heels. A parcel has just arrived, my lady, he said, stepping forward. He did indeed have a flattish parcel in his hands, wrapped in brown paper and tied with string. Well, don't dawdle, man, bring it here. Begging your pardon, my lady, the footman said, all regret and apologies, but it is for the young lady. He looked as if he were about to pull his forelock, but stopped himself just in time. Ava couldn't help but feel a little bad for him. They could not afford to hire the best and most experienced footman, so had settled on a boy fresh from the country. It was a learning experience for all involved. For me, Ava breathed, her heart leaping a little. She had not received a gift in some time, not since, well, not since her standing had taken a bit of a tumble. She used to receive gifts from would-be suitors regularly, but now... Tripping lightly across the floor, she took the parcel eagerly in her hands. It was not heavy, but fairly solid. Eagerly, she pulled the card tucked beneath the string free and turned it over. The words had been a little smudged by the rain, but they were written in a chaotic flowing script. Lady Eva, a dancer is nothing without inspiration. I found mine in these when I was just beginning, and I hope that you shall as well. Do not be afraid to shine. Yours, etc. Josiah Galpin. Eva's eyes ran over the words twice, lingering on his signature. Her heart was beating a little faster, and she did not realise that she had been holding her breath. She couldn't begin to fathom what he meant by that last phrase, 
but she took it as encouragement. Well, Lady Stanton demanded, what is it? It's from Mr. Galpin, Eva said softly, pulling the string off and loosing the paper. Oh, she breathed when she saw the contents, as if it were a necklace of fine diamonds. Packed within was a stack of sheets, meticulous illustrations rendered with loving care to detail and artistic merit. They were a little worn around the corners, some a little torn, others a little discoloured, but it did not diminish their beauty. Thoughtlessly, Ava discarded the damp brown paper and began thumbing through the sheaf of paper. All across the pages, figures leapt and bounded, turning, holding positions and poses that Eva had never seen before. They wore all manner of costumes, from the theatrical to court dress of the last century. One figure was featured more prominently than the others, an illustration of an elegant man dressed as the sun made human. On his breast he wore a sun emblem. His costume had been illustrated with gold, which shone out brightly. Though the illustrations were beginning to fade, this figure stood out, its beauty undimmed. What could Mr Galpin have cause to send you? Lady Stanton demanded. Eva tilted the sheets so that Lady Stanton might see them. They're dancing illustrations, from France it seems like. Lady Stanton craned her neck, and to Eva's surprise, her face seemed to soften a little. These are from the French court, she said quietly. My grandmother used to tell me stories about the Sun King Louis. It was due to him that dance was elevated to an art on par with painting or poetry. The Sun King, Ava repeated to herself, running a thumb over the gold leafing. A sly look crossed her face. So, even a king believed that dance was good enough for him to express himself. Lady Stanton looked up sharply at that. You are not a king, Eva. You are a girl of good family and limited fortune. You haven't the time for gadding about the ballroom any more. You need every advantage to secure a husband this season, and not a moment later. The footman, who had been doing his best to appear invisible, was rounded upon. You are dismissed, Lady Stanton snapped. The footman bowed and hastily scrambled away. Ava sighed and turned away from her mother. Regardless of the veracity of her mother's words, Eva could not take her eyes from the illustrations. She set the stack down reverently on a sheet-covered table and attempted to set her feet into the position shown, one heel firmly against the middle of the other foot. Eva was a little unbalanced until she found that holding her arms a bit by her sides compensated. She glanced over her shoulder, contemplating how much she could dare. Lady Stanton was staring into the fire her forehead creased and paying Eva no mind. It was clear that she was lost in her own thoughts again. Eva turned back around and began quickly rifling through the pages. Finding one showing dancers leaping, she set it atop the others at a bit of an angle. Tilting her head, she contemplated them for several moments. Not taking her eyes from the pages, she backed up several steps. Experimentally, she lifted her skirt a little hopping lightly from one foot to the other, attempting to land on the ball of her foot. A kind of joy began to bubble up within her, a carefree amusement she had not felt since she was a child. Impulsively she turned and stared down the length of the ballroom, and shifting her weight to her left foot, leapt forward. It was somehow both exhilarating and familiar to Eva. Her heart leaped right along with her, thrilling at the sensation. She could not recall having moved in such a manner since she was a child. It was a similar sort of joy, a pure expression of glee, but something else too. It was a manifestation of her own strength. Ladies were supposed to be soft and genteel, with bodies not too muscular or thin, but Ava had always been an active girl. It can be the purest expression of self when words do not suffice. Josiah's voice echoed in her ear. Ava almost turned around, thinking that he was in the room with her, whispering. The world seemed to fall away, along with her cares as she meditated on these words. There was nothing but her, her own body, and the growing realisation of everything she could make it do. Chapter 12 Josiah was all eagerness and anxious energy 
he paced to and fro, unable to sit still for any length of time. It had been like this all day, even when supervising a rehearsal at the theatre, until Beatrice had lost her patience with him and sent him on his way. It was not often that he had this kind of eager anticipation for a dancing lesson. Ava was due to arrive at any moment, the last lesson of the day. He had scheduled it thusly on purpose, so that neither of them would feel hurried by the arrival of other students. You are getting too invested in this one, a pragmatic part of his brain warned him. Josiah was inclined to scoff at the very idea, but there was a truth in it that he couldn't deny. It had been pure impulse and sentimentality that had him sending his treasured illustrations to Lady Eva. She could very well have simply discarded them, or they could have been ruined in transit. Still, something told Josiah that he was right to trust her. There was something about her that made him believe that she would see the importance. There was a slight whoosh of air through the studio as the door was opened. Immediately, Josiah paused, his entire body tensed and listening. There were the expected sounds of Lady Stanton, who seemed intent on talking the ears off the poor maid. Below that, the unmistakable sound of Lady Eva, placating and patient, as if she were the parent. Her voice was low and smooth, velvet for the ears. Josiah forced himself to remain where he was, awaiting her arrival, ignoring his impulse to rush forward and hurry her along. It would not do for him to gawp at her, however, while she was engaged in the delicate business of changing out her shoes. At last, when she appeared, Josiah could not keep a smile from spreading across his face. Lady Eva seemed inclined to respond in kind, and she did not duck her face to hide it demurely, as another young lady might. This only served to endear her further to him. She strode forward in confidence, offering her hand, which Josiah automatically accepted. Lady Stanton, Lady Eva, he greeted them both, his eyes flicking only briefly to Lady Stanton. Shall we begin? I believe I heard that you walked here. Very good. We shan't need a strenuous warm-up, then. With one hand behind his back, he shifted his other hand so that Lady Eva's rested atop it. Without preamble, he escorted her to the centre of the dance floor. Should we see what you remember? Very well, Mr Galpin, Ava murmured in assent. She straightened her shoulders and did not flinch when Josiah put his hand on her waist. He was fully prepared to have to fully guide her through the steps again. To his astonishment, he found her perfectly able to keep up with him. She moved lightly, not looking down at her feet even once. You've been practising, he said approvingly. He caught a smile on her face as she turned about in front of him. You should know when I set out to do something, I mean to do it right, she replied. They were silent for a few moments, passing around one another, hands lightly touching here and there. Did you receive the parcel then? Josiah asked neutrally, though he was quite eager to know her thoughts. I did, Eva confirmed, another smile making her eyes twinkle a little. I'm glad to hear it. A pause. And what, may I ask, did you make of them? Lady Ava's step slowed for the first time during their lesson. Josiah did not chide her for this, however, because it was clear from her expression that she was deep in thought. They were beautiful, of course, she said slowly. But, she trailed off, clearly struggling to say what was on her mind. But, Josiah prompted, they made my heart feel strange, she admitted. Josiah inclined his head at her, and she hurried on to explain herself. I did not know that there were so many forms of dancing. I mean, I knew in an abstract sort of way that people dance differently in different places, but I did not expect them to all be beautiful. Josiah laughed softly. Just imagine, if the knowledge ever got out, that the people of France and Italy were every bit as accomplished at dancing as the British. Lady Eva gave him a dour look, the effect somewhat spoiled by her own smile that fought through. That isn't what I meant, and you know it. It seemed that they all understood the art of what they were doing, that they themselves could be as glorious as a painted ceiling. It simply had never occurred to me that anyone could do that, 
that dance could be more than a social exchange on a ballroom. She paused, then looked up at Josiah fully in the face. I could see this reflected in your own performance too. Josiah felt a great swelling of pride within him, as well as a kind of relief that she had seen what he was trying to show her. He didn't reply but let them dance in peace for a few beats. Eva pulled to a halt suddenly, nearly throwing Josiah off balance. He was prepared to ask her what was wrong when he saw that she was staring intently out the window. What is she looking at, he wondered, following her gaze. It's too dark outside to see much of anything, and the lamplighters haven't been out yet. Oh. Realisation dawned on him, followed by a slight twinge of disappointment. Twilight had indeed fallen outside, though the hour was not yet late. Pewter-coloured clouds had hung heavily over London all day, threatening more rain. Night fell early enough in January, but with the addition of clouds it was more than punctual. The studio was not particularly brightly lit, but compared to London outside of its walls, it was brilliant enough. There were large windows that faced south to catch as much sun as possible so that the dancers might have the benefit of natural light. The combination of this interlude between light and dark was that the windows had effectively been transformed into dim mirrors. Lady Ava was staring at her reflection, tilting her chin this way and that. Josiah felt his heart sink. She was only concerned about how she looked while she danced, if she was shown to good advantage. He wasn't sure why he expected a woman as beautiful as she was to be immune from vanity. If anything, she... My arm isn't right, Eva said abruptly. Startled, Josiah looked down at her. Right between her brows, a little line had formed as she stared at her reflection. It's something with the elbow, I think, she continued then turned her head a little again, as if trying to catch a different angle. Blinking, Josiah looked at their reflections again. He could see it now, exactly what she was referring to. He was a little embarrassed at not having spotted it himself, but also a little pleased that she had. He stepped back, critically analysing her stance. If you raise your hand a bit higher, my lady, he said, encouraging her to do so. Yes, that's it. See now, how your arm falls more naturally. Ah, she said, raising and lowering her arm again, watching as she did so. Suddenly she turned to him, her face alight with amusement. I shudder to think what you would have made of my silly little hops, if you can find such a small flaw. Little hops? Josiah repeated. Lady Eva laughed, throaty and full, and waved him off with one hand, Oh, it's nothing, really. I was attempting to copy one of the plates you sent over, nothing more. A bit of girlish fun. Josiah stared at her for a moment. Show me, he said. What? Here, now? Lady Eva asked, her eyes darting down to where her mother was sitting. Yes, Josiah said firmly. He stepped back, allowing her some space. With a sweep of one arm, he invited her to make use of the dance floor. Her white teeth flashed as she bit her lip for a moment, hesitating. She glanced again at her mother, who seemed preoccupied with a novel of some stripe. Her dark eyes flicked to Josiah then, narrowing slightly as if trying to determine if he were in jest. He nodded his head toward the open space, silently encouraging her. Setting her shoulders, Lady Eva walked out a few steps, looked to Josiah once more, and then prepared herself. She shifted her weight effortlessly to her left foot, and holding her skirt slightly to the side, she leapt easily and landed on her right foot. Her left arm had stretched out naturally to help balance her, but folded back in when she landed like a swan's wing. She kept her back to Josiah for a moment, but when she turned around, her face was full of nervous conflict, seeking his approval. Her expression gradually faded to one of apprehension and she began to attempt to explain. I know that it was not as precise as you are used to seeing, and it's difficult to get the full range of motion with my skirt, and... How did you do that? Josiah demanded. Tell me your process. Ava stared at him. I'm... not sure that I had one. I simply looked at the plate and just... did it? 
Josiah continued to stare, but he could feel his mouth beginning to form a smile about the edges. That was a very nearly perfect jeté, he said around a grin. Perhaps not as high as a more practiced dancer would have accomplished, but certainly as graceful. Indeed, truly, Lady Eva asked, stepping closer to Josiah again. Her face was suffused with pride and glee. Yes, it was very well done. But I would urge you to be cautious about doing such things until your ankles are strong enough, Josiah continued. You wouldn't want to twist one on a bad landing. She looked a little disappointed at that. What may I do to strengthen them in the meantime? Josiah considered. Well, continue practicing the regular dances that you have been learning and walking about with your heels off the floor, as we have discussed previously. Of course, walking is also quite good. He paused for a moment, thinking. Perhaps you're ready for something a bit more rigorous. At Lady Eva's nod, Josiah encouraged her to follow him to where a bar ran the length of one wall. You may do this at home, at your leisure, but be sure to hold to the back of a chair. Resting his hand lightly on the polished length of wood, he placed his feet about a shoulder width apart, toes turned outward. Effortlessly he raised onto his toes, his calves all tension, his left arm automatically going up in a graceful arch over his head. Slowly he lowered himself back down. Lady Eva frowned in concentration and took up a similar position opposite him so that they were facing one another. Like so? she asked, going up onto her toes easily. Her feet came down flat soon after, and she looked to Josiah for approval. Nearly, he said, stepping a little closer. Anyone can go up onto their toes. It takes skill and strength to be able to come back down slowly. Controlled. Lady Ava nodded, trying again. The little line between her brows appeared again as she focused. Oh, I say, that is a bit more difficult than one would expect. Josiah nodded. Do this a few times every day to begin with, but do not strain yourself. You will quickly find that you can do more and more each day. Is the rest of me correct? Lady Eva asked, looking up at her raised hand. I know I am meant to be focusing on strengthening my legs, but I don't wish to begin a bad habit that will need to be corrected later. Very true, Josiah agreed. He swept his eyes along her arm and unthinkingly stepped close, very close, to help adjust it. Lightly, as he was expected to touch all of his female students, he ran his fingers over her bicep, gently encouraging her to the correct angle. His hand skimmed up to hers, touching her fingers and attempting to ease the tension in them. Is this right? Lady Eva asked, her voice a little strained. Josiah, who had largely been focused on correcting her form, looked down into her large brown eyes. He had been quite unaware of exactly how close they were standing, particularly as this had never been a concern with a student before. Every fibre of him was keenly aware of it now, however. They were close enough that he could nearly feel her breathing, nearly count her lashes when they brushed against her cheek. He was aware that he was staring, but he was transfixed, held tight by her gaze. Swallowing hard, his eyes swept over her again, boldly. She did not shy away from this, but she did pull in air rather suddenly. Almost, my lady, he murmured. Gently he released her arm and slowly, deliberately, he placed his hand in the small of her back. She made a small noise and tensed for a moment, but relaxed into the contact. If you were to lengthen here just a little and... Yes, that's right, he said. Beneath his fingers he could feel her adjusting her posture, even through the layers of clothing and her jumps. Her breath was coming quicker now, and Josiah was aware that his was as well. He was also aware that he was lingering, his hand splayed against her back. Reluctantly he withdrew, his hand feeling suddenly cold at the loss of contact. He stepped back, attempting to put some semblance of professional distance between them. Clearing his throat, he nodded to Lady Eva. Try again, my lady. Obediently, she went up onto her toes again, her back and arm exactly as he had placed them. Despite the tension of the moment previously, 
he couldn't help but be pleased at her progress and ability to take instruction. As he had advised, she worked to keep herself from simply plonking back down onto her heels, remaining balanced and elevated for as long as possible. Her triumphant smile said all that needed to be between them, especially when Josiah gave her an answering smile. The tension of a moment before was temporarily forgotten. Josiah nodded, indicating that she might proceed with the exercise. If you found the illustrations diverting, Josiah said, watching her face take on a determined cast as she attempted to perfect herself, then perhaps you might care to observe a rehearsal of my troupe. Lady Eva's head jerked toward Josiah, her eyes questioning. A rehearsal? For a performance, you mean? she asked. Josiah nodded. Yes, we are beginning a new routine for the theatre. There shan't be any costumes yet, but it will be the best of my dancers. Lady Eva continued her exercise at the bar, but slowed as she thought. Do you think it will be useful to me? Perhaps, Josiah answered with a shrug. I should hope that you will find it inspiring at the least. This rehearsal would be at the theatre? When Josiah nodded again, Lady Eva bit her lip, her eyes shifting down the room. I'm not sure Mother would... What are you two conspiring about? Lady Stanton called right on cue. Josiah could see that Lady Eva's first impulse was to jump away from him, but that would surely have signified guilt. As it was, she tamped down that instinct and instead lifted her head aristocratically and continued on as if her mother had not spoken. Just think on it, Josiah whispered to her, then turned about to face Lady Stanton, a smile plastered on his face. Not to worry, Lady Stanton. The worst corruption I have to offer young ladies is teaching them a waltz or two. Lady Stanton's eyes narrowed at him, unsure if she was being jested at. They slid from his face to Eva, who was imperiously ignoring everything about her. What on earth have you got my daughter doing then? Mr Galpin is helping me to strengthen my ankles, mother, Lady Eva said, her eyes half-lidded and her nose still in the air. It wouldn't do for me to injure myself in my first turn about the ballroom. Too many young ladies find themselves excluded from the festivities because of it, Josiah agreed, nodding gravely. And it would be a very great shame indeed if London were to be deprived of Lady Eva's charms because of a twisted ankle. Lady Stanton looked betwixt them again, then threw back her own shoulders. Thank you for your concern, Mr Galpin. Your diligence has been noted. I believe that is enough for today. Come along, Eva, she announced. Reluctantly, Eva released the bar and, without looking at Josiah, followed along after her mother. He could not help but feel a little disappointed. She was right. There was no way that her mother would ever allow her to go, and he sincerely doubted that she had the fortitude to stand up to her. With surprising agility, however, Lady Eva turned back around while still walking, catching his eye. She clearly wished to ensure that he was looking, which he undoubtedly was. She whipped back around, and before he knew what she was doing, she was giving another little hop, a miniature jeté. Josiah had to cover his poorly stifled laugh with an impromptu cough. It was such a tiny, joyful act of rebellion that he could not help but be completely and utterly charmed. Chapter 13 Mr Galpin's invitation rattled around in Eva's brain. It would have been easy to simply brush off her curiosity and eagerness to go as merely a means of being defiant if it weren't for the fact that Eva was captivated by the idea, with or without her mother's permission. The trouble was, even if she did work up the nerve to go, she was not sure how to make it happen in practical terms. As was the wont of young ladies since the beginning of time, Ava decided that the only real way to get what she wanted was to enlist the help of her very dear friend. So it was that Ava summoned Kitty Johnson again, who was always ready to pay a call on her. She arrived in short order, and Ava was cheered considerably by the sight of Kitty's adorable face. Miss Johnson, what a pleasure to see you again, Lady Stanton said as Eva was rushing down the stairs to greet Kitty. I did not know that we were expecting you to... So sorry, mother, Eva interrupted, hopping down the last couple stairs and earning a frown from her mother. 
It must have completely slipped my mind. Kitty has offered to help me practice my French. You know what a clever thing she is with languages. Without missing a beat, Kitty nodded, smiling indulgently at Ava as she helped her out of her capelet and bonnet. Oh, you really are too kind. It's nice to know my natty old governess did some good. How are your pa? Lady Stanton asked, but Eva cut her off again. Not a moment to lose, mother, she cried, seizing Kitty by the wrist and tugging her up the stairs. They reached her room in short order, with Eva nearly flinging Kitty through the doorway. She hurriedly closed the door, turning around and pressing her back against it. Kitty was standing in the middle of Eva's room, her eyes wide and her face expectant. Well, now I'm certain that you've some delicious news, Kitty said, folding her arms over her chest. You've no idea, Eva said. It might be too much for even your ears. Eva clearly said this only to tantalise Kitty further, for there was nothing that Kitty Johnson loved more than a delectable bit of intrigue or gossip. She said nothing, merely continued to stare expectantly at Eva. I have been taking lessons with Mr Galpin, as you know, Eva began, and already Kitty was hooked. Oh yes, Kitty said, unfolding her arms. Is he as handsome as everyone says? Unable to help herself, Ava grinned and flattened herself against the door. Handsomer, she said, making a great show of fanning herself with one hand. Kitty let out a quiet little squeal and plonked herself onto her customary perch at the foot of Eva's bed. Tell me everything at once, she demanded. Eva obliged, coming to sit next to her on the bed, one foot barely skimming the floor. I've only had two lessons, but I think he believes me to be quite talented. Here, look at these plates he sent me, Eva said, leaning over to retrieve the stack from her dressing table. They're from his own collection, and he sent them right over for me to study. Oh, oh, these are... Kitty accepted the stack of papers and began leafing through them. Oh my, look at the legs on this one. Have you ever seen such shapely calves? Kitty demanded, shoving one of the sheets under Eva's nose. No, well, yes, but... No, don't tell me, Kitty gasped, pressing the plates to her bosom. The celebrated Mr Galpin? Eva gave a noncommittal shrug, but could not hide a grin. Kitty gave something between a giggle and a snort which only made Eva laugh too. But in complete seriousness, Eva said, trying to pull her face back into a thoughtful expression. The point of them isn't that they're just pretty. Really? Because some of these are... Yes, really, Kitty, Eva said, rolling her eyes a little. There is more to life than handsome men. Kitty curled her lip up in such a manner that indicated she clearly thought Eva was very, very mistaken. She sighed, then passed the stack of papers back over to Ava. Well, what is it then? They're not just dancing, Ava began, unsure of how to explain it all to Kitty. Well, I mean they are, but it's more than that. They're an art all their own. The dancers, I mean. Kitty said nothing, merely tilting her head and drawing her brows together. Dancing can be more than a social activity one does to pass the time at a ball. Ava Kitty stared at Ava for a moment. I do not understand it particularly well myself, but you clearly feel strongly about this. A sly look came over her face then. Is this all down to Mr Galpin and his fine calves? In a manner of speaking, I suppose it is, Ava acknowledged. But you'll see what I mean on Wednesday, Ava said. I will. Why Wednesday? Kitty asked. Well, Eva said drawing the word out, hedging a little. She put on her coyest face, drawing her left shoulder up to her cheek as she leaned on that arm. I may have been invited to observe a rehearsal of Mr Galpin's troupe. And, Kitty said, twirling her wrist in an encouraging motion, and it may be taking place at the theatre. Oh, oh, Kitty said, sitting up abruptly as realisation dawned. She leaned forward conspiratorially, lowering her voice. At the theatre? Oh, I mean, really, Eva, it is one thing to attend a performance with a chaperone, but to go there during the day? With all of those... those actors and other theatre folk just milling about? Exactly, Eva agreed. 
but Mr. Galpin made it a point to invite me, specifically. I am sure that he would be pleased to see me there, and I would like to see real dancers up close. Kitty absorbed all of this, tapping her mouth with one finger. That is quite the conundrum. I am sure that there will be female dancers there too, which would really help me to see what I could do, Eva continued throwing herself backward on her bed, her arms over her head. You aren't planning on running off and becoming a dancer, are you? Kitty asked, only half in jest. I don't think I could bear London if you left me here all alone. You'll be the first to know if I do, Eva reassured her. Lady dancers indeed, Kitty muttered. I think that might be the most horrifying aspect to your mother. Undoubtedly. Ava agreed, pushing herself up on her elbows. They will no doubt corrupt me irredeemably. Kitty snorted, but her face grew thoughtful. I imagine that I am to help you in this scheme, no? That is why you invited me over, isn't it? Couldn't it be simply because I want a friend to commiserate with? Eva asked, attempting a version of Kitty's infamously innocent expression. Doubtful, Kitty said. You only summon me these days when there's something afoot. Two things can be true at once, Ava protested. I can miss you and need your help. Kitty sighed, then likewise flopped backward on the bed, her head quite near Eva's. Well, I suppose it's jolly good for you that I've a keen interest in seeing this Mr. Galpin for myself, she said, exhaling loudly through her mouth. Her head lolled over in Eva's direction. And I'm positively bored to tears. A grin that had every flavour of mischief in it began to spread on Eva's face, though she fought against it as hard as she might. An answering grin as wide and full of playfulness was also at work on Kitty's face. Laying together on Eva's bed, they concocted a plan. At one point, Eva was overwhelmed with gratitude for her friend. As long as she could remember, Eva was getting them into some sort of scrape, and Kitty was right by her side, adorably insisting on their innocence. Fooling your mother is one thing, Kitty said as evening began to close in, darkening Eva's room. But good heavens, Eva, what are you going to wear? This is the real dilemma. Kitty spoke with such gravity and seriousness that one would have thought that she was reading a death notice aloud. Eva immediately burst into another round of giggles. She hadn't had much to laugh about lately, and as ever, Kitty was a tonic. That's it. The entire plot must be called off. More laughter, and then the unmistakable sounds of drawers and cabinets being gone through floated through the house for the rest of the evening. Chapter 14 Wednesday dawned with a bone-biting chill, but sunny. Eva swung out of bed bright and early, throwing open the curtains. She had to peer through the frost that had accumulated on her window, but it was unmistakably a blue sky that greeted her. This in itself made the day feel like a holiday after weeks of rain and clouds. She rang for a maid at once, hoping to be dressed and already at breakfast before her mother roused herself. It had been more difficult than she had imagined to settle on what to wear. She was torn between her desire to be, well, desirable and make a good first impression, and not wanting to alert her mother to her true destination. Eva suspected that her mother wouldn't protest her going to the theatre so much as she would protest that there weren't any eligible men there. Eva tried to tell herself that this was an exaggeration, but she wasn't sure if it actually was. She had settled on a deceptively simple walking dress in a greyish lavender, with a subtle pattern in dark blue. She did not wish to give the impression that she was overdressed, so she kept her toilette relatively simple, opting to simply pull her thick hair up at the back of her head. She wore a simple ribbon about her waist in dark purple, and a chemisette in soft, feathery grey in deference to the weather. After hurriedly pulling on her leather walking boots, Ava tripped down the stairs as lightly as she could. She was content with a breakfast of cold pie and ham, eating as fast as she dared to, one eye on the clock the entire time. She believed that she was making good time. Her whole goal was to have one foot out of the door by the time her mother was dressed and coming down the stairs. These well-laid plans were quickly squashed, however, by the unmistakable sound of Lady Stanton tromping down the stairs. Eva looked up sharply, her eye meeting the footman's, 
who gave a helpless little shrug. Ava sighed, but did her best to slow her eating, not wishing to look like she was actually in a hurry. Good morning, mother, she said casually when Lady Stanton entered the dining room. This is a little early for you. It is, Lady Stanton agreed, taking her place at the head of the table. She cleared her throat pointedly, and the footman scrambled to pull out her chair. I have some calls that I must pay early today. She sat down, unfolding a napkin and placing it in her own lap, eyeing Eva the entire time. You look nice this morning. Do I? Eva said, looking down at herself. Drat! I was going for respectably plain. Kitty has asked me to assist with her charity work today. Well, you would shine in a burlap sack, my little sunshine, Lady Stanton quipped. I know that it is an admirable pursuit for young ladies, but are you sure that this is the best use of your time? Of course I am, mother, Eva said, reaching for her teacup. Kitty says that Lady Fairweather is a patron, and you know that her drawing room is one of the most exclusive in London. Lady Stanton mulled that over, reaching for a slice of ham and putting it on her plate. I suppose that is so. I only hope we can have as much grace when it is our turn to be receiving the charitable visits. Oh, Mother, really, it is not even ten o'clock yet, Eva sighed. It's never too early for a reminder about the importance of this season, Lady Stanton insisted, lest you forget you must... The distinctive ringing of the bell at the front door was purely a blessing as far as Eva was concerned. The footman ducked out to answer the door, and Eva stood, placing her own napkin on the table next to her plate. That must be Kitty now, she said. I've quite lost track of the hour. Oh, very well, Lady Stanton groused. Be off with you, but be back well before dinner, or I'll rouse the watch to find you. Of course, Mother. Eva said, stooping to press a kiss to Lady Stanton's cheek before nearly skipping to the front door. Kitty gave her a significant look as she slipped into her pelisse, navy blue with copious white fur trim along the neck and down the front closure. Are you ready for our day of charitable giving? Kitty asked, arching one eyebrow. Kitty, you know that I am always eager to lend a helping hand to those that need it, Eva replied, sliding her hands into a matching fur muff. It was a credit to their many years of exploits that they were able to make it out of the door, down to the street, and securely into Kitty's father's carriage before being overtaken by laughter. As they had not had a day out in quite some time, the ladies had decided that it would behove them to visit at least one confectioner's shop and Harding, Howell and Co. before they needed to be at the theatre. Kitty had been sent along with her maid, who had a real knack not only for hairdressing, but discretion also. In fact, as long as she was slipped a shilling or two, she was quite content to spend the day making eyes at her groom beau stationed at the rear of the carriage. By midday, both Kitty and Eva had treated themselves to a decidedly unladylike amount of sweets and other treats, perused the selection of gloves and reticules on offer at the arcade, and generally had quite a time of it. It was very much a day in the manner of years gone by when both were simply glad to be out in society. The hour finally arrived when they were supposed to attend the rehearsal. Eva had not the least idea of what to expect, including where she was to be admitted. It was only when the toe of her boot hit the pavement just outside of the theatre, strangely lonely and forlorn at this time of day, that Eva realised that she did not have any notion as to what she was supposed to do. Thankfully, two young ladies disembarking from a gentleman's carriage in front of a theatre in the middle of the day drew some attention. From one of the doors came bustling a short barrel of a man, a powdered wig precariously balanced on his head. Eva tried valiantly not to stare at it as the man spoke, wincing when he became too animated, certain that it would simply slide right off. Ah, you must be Lady Eva Stanton, he said, hurrying forward. Mr Galpin said to be on the lookout for a well-heeled beauty come a-calling, and here you be. And what a fine sight, not just one lady of quality. But two, he said with a plummy grin at her. Eva stared down at him, not sure what exactly she was supposed to say in response. I'm sorry, I... Who are you, precisely? Beg your pardon, miss, my lady. Everyone about here calls me Knots. 
I'm the stage manager of this fine establishment, he said, puffing himself up further. Eva and Kitty exchanged a look of alarm about the strain upon the buttons of his waistcoat. Good afternoon, Mr. Knotts, Eva said politely, smiling at his enthusiasm. Would you be so kind as to show us to Mr. Galpin? Mr. Knotts, she says, airy bitter lady, Knotts breathed. As you please, ladies, as you please, follow me just this way. With an arm thicker than a ham, he held open the theatre door for them, bowing and waving them in with the other arm. Eva and Kitty linked arms and squeezed through the door past Knotts, who seemed chuffed at being the one to show them about. He emphatically gave them a brief tour, showing them the ticket office and letting them poke their heads into the manager's office. Mr Knotts, I really hate to press, but Mr Galpin? Eva reminded him gently. Oh, here's me. Quite lost my head at having such lovely creatures to squire about. If you please, young ladies, right this way, Knotts said, hurrying down a hall adjoining the auditorium, then turned and opened a plain-looking door that led to the maze of Warrens that was backstage. The theatre had appeared quiet, sedate almost, while Eva and Kitty were nosing about. It was another matter entirely backstage. The stage crew was busy shifting props and scenery, carrying them hither and thither. Dancers had their legs popped up on any level surface, stretching and rubbing their muscles, causing Kitty's eyes to go wide. Actors and actresses practised their lines at full stage volume, creating a chaotic din. And somewhere behind it all, a soprano warbled along to the plinking notes of a piano. Eva and Kitty held tightly to each other's hands so that they would not become separated in the chaos. Eva also suspected that it was also because they required the comforting support, not that either of them would admit to being discomforted by the goings-on backstage. At last they reached an area that Knotts helpfully informed them was the wings, or the area where performers waited to make their entrance on stage. While it was dimly lit backstage, the stage itself was a wash in light. From their position in the wings, they got their first glimpses of the dancers. Oh look, that's Beatrice Hart, Eva said sotto voice to Kitty. She's so beautiful and talented. She nodded her head in the direction of a woman who stood in only her stays and chemise with a skirt over top, her hair cropped short in the Parisian style. Oh my, oh she is really standing before all of those men in her underpinnings, Kitty hissed. And her skirt, it's a good six inches above her ankles. It's part of a costume, Kitty. I really doubt that she goes about like this off stage, Eva said placatingly. Kitty shot her a look that asked, Are you quite sure about that? A series of loud, authoritative claps sounded out above the murmuring dancers, and a hush fell. Kitty and Eva watched, fascinated, as Josiah Galpin strode forward, like a king surveying his subjects. All looked up at him with reverence and awe, except for Beatrice, who met his gaze straight on. We must do it again, Josiah said loudly, and we must get it right this time. The timing is tight. We've no time for missteps and fumbling about. That means you, Jean-Paul. A young man wearing breeches and a shirt and not much else hung his head a little. My, my, Kitty murmured. Thank you for taking me sightseeing. Eva gave her a despairing look. But Kitty was busy eyeing not only the dancers, but the well-muscled stagehands who stood ready to lift and change scenery at a moment's notice. At Josiah's signal, the dancers all scurried into position. There was a moment of expectant silence, and then the musicians, hidden in the pit below the stage, began to play. Eva did not recognise the music but it was a leaping, jaunty tune with an exotic flair. From the moment that the dancers took to the stage, nothing else existed for Ava. Chapter 15 Josiah could feel Beatrice's exasperation practically radiating through her skin. She was a challenging partner at the best of times, demanding and unyielding, which was the primary reason that he had made her the female lead of his troupe. She was the sort of dancer who expected excellence, not just from her partner, but from herself as well. She had no time or patience for novices, no matter how much their friends contributed to the purse. I simply do not understand why you invited her here in the first place, 
Beatrice griped for about the dozenth time that morning. Because I believe that she will find it edifying, Josiah repeated, his tone carefully even. Beatrice made a dismissive sound. What does a lady of the ton need to come to a dance rehearsal for edification? Let her sit around with her empty-headed friends and talk about poetry and watercolours. Josiah sighed. There was no point in arguing with Beatrice when she was in one of these moods. He remained focused on the task at hand, which was to attempt to get everyone prepared for the performance that weekend. It wasn't all Beatrice's fault, anyway. He was frustrated by the lack of progress shown by the dancers, and for some reason he wanted it all to be perfect for Eva specifically. It was nonsensical, really, demanding that a rehearsal go perfectly still several days out from the performance. It was especially nonsensical to hope that it would go perfectly, because no one special, simply a student, was coming to view it. But of course, following that logic, it stood to reason that Eva was someone special, else he would not be going to these lengths to make things just so. He didn't care to dwell on that. And then, there she was. He caught a glimpse of her, her face shadowed in hues of red from the curtain. She was tucked well away in the wings, but there was no mistaking her. Eva was busy speaking to someone else, another young lady that Josiah did not recognise. His mouth quirked, threatening to smile, which really would not do when he had a rehearsal to run. He clapped his hands, calling everyone to order, and then they were underway. Josiah did not look at Ava while the dance was proceeding. It would not be fair to his dancers. The moment that the last strains of music were dying away, however, he automatically looked to her. She wore such an expression that he had only seen once before, when he was in Italy, and tourists were craning their necks up to stare in awe at the frescoes and painted ceilings. Her friend pulled at her arm, trying to get her attention, but Eva's eyes were riveted to Josiah's. Without quite understanding how, Josiah found himself standing before the pair. He blinked, finally tearing his eyes away from Eva's, his feet having simply carried him forward. Mr. Galpin, Eva said, her voice low and smooth. I cannot thank you enough for inviting me to see this. It was my pleasure, Lady Eva, Josiah replied, bowing at the waist. Silence fell again in which they were content to stare at each other again. It was impossible to determine how long they might have remained in that attitude if not for the timely intervention of the other young lady. She pointedly cleared her throat, and Josiah thought he caught her gently digging an elbow into Eva's side. Eva looked about, blinking at her friend and flushing a little. Oh, Kitty, darling, might I present Mr. Galpin? He is the dancing master who has been taking such care to make sure I am fit for the ballroom. Mr. Galpin, this is Miss Kitty Johnson, my dearest friend in all the world. Miss Johnson, a pleasure, Josiah said, politely taking the fingers that Kitty offered and bowing over them. So, he said, looking between the two, what did you think of our rehearsal? It was nice. Very nice, Kitty amended, seeing Josiah's face fall a little. Expectantly, he turned to Ava. It made me wish that I was a scholar, Eva said thoughtfully, her gaze lingering on the stage. A scholar? Why? Josiah asked, intrigued. Lady Ava offered up a shrug, tilting her head and smiling a little. If I knew more languages, I might have a word for how it made me feel. Oh, now that's hardly fair, Josiah's brain griped. His heart, however, was busy being thoroughly charmed. You've seen us perform before, he reminded her. Yes, and as I recall, I was quite moved by that as well, Eva retorted. It's different seeing it from this angle. It's like, it's like it is somehow more real, more accessible. Seeing it from out there, she said, gesturing to the theatre seats. It's something that we mere mortals could never aspire to. Back here, it's... I could walk out onto the stage, it's so close. Josiah looked out at the stage and then back to Lady Eva. Do you want to? What? Her eyes darted back and forth from the stage to Josiah and then to Kitty. Just walk out there onto the stage. Why not? 
Josiah asked. I'm not sure that I should, Ava said, waffling. She bit her lip, her eyes glued to the stage. I'm not sure that it's proper. I'm not exactly a performer. Your mother would have a conniption, Kitty murmured under her breath. Undoubtedly, Josiah agreed. Eva had not taken her eyes off of the stage, still awash with lights. It was as if she were hearing a distant song that only she could make out. Josiah recognised this well. He had seen many fall under the siren spell of the stage, had fallen under it himself. The inner workings of her mind were clearly manifested in the tension in her person. Josiah watched, unable to take a breath, as Eva slowly stepped forward. It was like she had taken a plunge into a pool of cold water. The first step was the hardest, and once begun, she continued onward with quicker and quicker steps. Eva crossed the invisible threshold from backstage to onstage proper, her back straight and her head up. Josiah was not aware that he was grinning until he caught Beatrice glaring at him from across the stage in the opposite wings. Her eyes shifted from him to the perceived interloper, and then she rolled them. He shook it off and meandered up to Eva, pausing to see if Miss Johnson would follow. She seemed caught, unsure if she should continue or be left alone among who knows what sort of characters. She bounced a little her curls springing about her face, and then followed along reluctantly several steps behind Josiah. Satisfied, Josiah turned back to Eva. She was standing still in that particular way of hers, but Josiah did not get the sense that she was frozen, as many are when confronted with the stage. When he reached her and came to stand next to her, he saw that his assumption was correct. Her face was thoughtful, introspective even. She saw him beside her, and she briefly caught his eye, a cheeky smile blooming on her face. Does the world look different from up here? he asked, returning her grin. It does, she replied, her face reflective again. So many seats, so many people from so many different walks of life. She trailed off, then turned to face Josiah, smiling radiantly again, her dark eyes sparkling in the stage lights. And they all come to see one thing. you. Josiah made a non-committal shrug, not wishing to appear conceited. Eva, however, was having none of it. Oh, please, she said, playfully rolling her eyes. Do not pretend like you are so modest. You know that you are a great artist, else you wouldn't take such care to maintain your artistic integrity. Josiah couldn't help but laugh a little at that. I suppose that is true, Lady Eva. Still with an amused expression, Ava turned and walked a few steps along the front of the stage, her eyes dancing over the auditorium seats. Josiah could feel rather than see someone coming to stand at his elbow. He turned, expecting to see Miss Johnson, and was instead confronted with Beatrice's face tightened with hauteur. Really, Josiah, she chided. What are you playing at here? Why let this amateur pretend she could trod the boards with us? She put an emphasis on the last word, giving it a cutting edge that clearly separated herself and Josiah into one class, Ava in another. Beatrice, he sighed under his breath. She looked at him, her eyes hardening. She had just taken a breath, mouth open and clearly ready to argue the point further, when a bright voice piped up from behind them. Why, if it isn't, Miss Hart! Both Beatrice and Josiah turned around, and there was Miss Johnson, her face all adorable smiles and rosy cheeks. It would have been easy for anyone to miss the hard glint to her eye. Beatrice, this is Miss Kitty Johnson, Josiah hurried to intervene. She is here with Lady Eva. Of course she is, Beatrice said, a smile curling her mouth at the corners. I've been enjoying myself immensely. Miss Johnson said, all girlish gushing and batting eyelashes. It's been very educational, she said with a pointed glance up and down the length of Beatrice, who had haphazardly thrown on a dressing gown over her scandalous ensemble. I'm so glad to hear it, Beatrice said, matching her tone. So many young girls come to the theatre for an education before they are married. The navvies here aren't too particular in their tastes, you see. 
Miss Johnson accepted the barb and seemed at the point of retorting when her eyes flicked over Josiah's shoulder. He turned and saw Lady Eva standing behind him and was simultaneously grateful for the interruption and terrified. Have you completed your tour of the stage then? He asked good-naturedly, as if discussing a trip around the continent. He turned slightly to the side and with a sweep of his arm said, Lady Eva Stanton, may I present Miss Beatrice Hart? Though Josiah had presented Beatrice to Eva, as was only right and proper for their respective social standing, it was Eva who spoke first. I am so pleased to have the chance to meet you, she said with complete sincerity. You are positively mesmerising on the stage. Beatrice looked from Eva to Josiah as if trying to determine if she were in jest. It's the product of years of hard work and dedication to my craft, she answered eventually. Eva smiled, not a demure little grin, but with the full force of her beauty. Beatrice blinked and seemed a little stunned to be on the receiving end. I can believe that, she said. Your dedication shows. Yes, I take my craft quite seriously, Beatrice quipped. I should hate for anyone to think me one of those pretty little playthings that float about the theatre. There are certainly enough broken hearts every season when the rich get tired of toying with us. Without a by your leave, Beatrice gave a significant look to Josiah and glided away. As if unable to resist when eyes were on her, or perhaps simply because she wished to remind everyone of her prodigious ability, Beatrice gave a neat little twirl on one of her feet, whipping around. Josiah turned to Eva, fully prepared to make apologies. He instead found her face thoughtful again, watching Beatrice depart. Miss Johnson, too, seemed a little concerned and hovered nearby Eva's shoulder, watching her face. Are you all right? Josiah asked softly, not wishing to upset her. She used her whole foot when turning, Eva said slowly. She didn't merely balance on her toes, her entire foot moved. She looked up to Josiah, as if seeking confirmation, but also a little accusatory. You did not tell me to do that. Josiah could only stare down at her. There were not many people who could simply take Beatrice's prickly nature in such stride. Eva was taken with her ability, unbothered by the rest of it. She found the beauty in the moment regardless of everything else. Unbidden, he felt something shift within him, and a soft, slow smile dawned on his face as he gazed into her dark, dark eyes. Chapter 16 Ava had always looked forward to her dancing lessons. They were one of the few ways she was able to leave the house without her mother hounding her about husband hunting, but her eagerness had taken on a new tenor. Dance was proving a means for her to explore not only what she was capable of physically, but also as a means of escape. Life made sense when she was dancing. She practised as much as she dared to, doing tiny pirouettes in her room, mincing along on her toes down the hall, plié at the breakfast table before her mother came down. She could feel herself becoming stronger, her muscles lither. It was a satisfying feeling knowing that she had found a way to express her inner strength physically in a way that wouldn't provoke too much comment. Her social circle had shrunk considerable over the past year, not least because of the shenanigans her mother had put her up to with Lord Tom. Therefore, there weren't too many people there to witness Eva's transformation. It was not simply that her legs were stronger or that she carried her arms more gracefully. She was a more deliberate, thoughtful person than she had been before. It wasn't all down to the dance, of course, but it had a meditative quality to it that allowed for introspection without seeming morose. It was also strangely important for Eva to impress Josiah. She did not know why this was, but his approval meant a great deal to her. It would have been easy enough to dismiss this as him simply being an accomplished master, so naturally his opinion mattered the most. She began to look forward to her dancing lessons, specifically with Josiah. He was an integral part to the experience. The time was approaching for her next lesson, the first since she had been invited to observe the rehearsal at the theatre. Like a child about to go on holiday, Eva found herself having difficulty sleeping the night before. Consequently, she woke early and dressed hurriedly, which left her a deal of time to pace about, restless. 
She tried reading, but her mind kept sliding away from the words on the page. It seemed to take agonizingly long for her mother to put on her gloves and tip it. Ava had to resist the urge to tap, tap, tap her foot on the foyer floor in impatience. She twisted her own gloves in her hands, eager to be off. Her edginess did not affect her mother in the slightest. In fact, it seemed that Lady Stanton was in a world of her own, paying little mind to Eva's subtle and not-so-subtle attempts to hurry her along. The walk to the dancing academy was oddly silent, which put Eva a little on edge. Silence from her mother rarely boded well. In fact, it usually precipitated a plot or scheme of some sort, or some sort of horrid news. Ava slid her mother sidelong glances but did not say anything. Truthfully, she did not wish to ruin her lesson by worrying about whatever it was. As ever, Eva's cares melted away when she entered the comforting silence of Mr. Galpin's school. The maid could not help her out of her boots and into her dancing slippers fast enough. She stood and practically pranced out onto the dance floor, which warranted only a tired sigh from Lady Stanton. To Eva's surprise, there were two people waiting for her, Mr. Galpin, and a man nearly bent double with age. Eva stopped short, a strange kind of panic rising within her. Mr. Galpin had been speaking quietly with the strange man, but he looked up and smiled when Eva appeared. Lady Eva, punctual as ever, he said with a small bow. Lady Stanton, good to see you as well, he added like an afterthought. Eva looked warily between the two men standing, or well, stooping before her. Mr. Galpin caught this, and his smile widened a little. I thought perhaps we might try something new today, he said, gesturing to the stranger. This is Mr. Holden Randall. He is by far the most accomplished pianist you will ever have the pleasure of hearing. He shall accompany us today. On the piano, Josiah clarified swiftly, catching Eva's worried look. Oh, we'll be dancing to music today then she asked, brightening considerably. Mr. Randall smiled a smile that was mostly gums. Best hope so, else he dragged these old bones out into the cold for no good reason. Eva laughed, turning the full force of her smile and beautiful eyes on Mr. Randall. The wrinkles in the old man's face lifted upward in response, clearly charmed. There's something to put in your eyes and look at, he said appreciatively. Now... Help this bag of bones over to yon pianoforte, he said, gesturing with a gnarled old stick in his gnarled old hand to the instrument in one corner. Mr. Galpin stepped forward to offer him an arm and was promptly swatted at by Randall's stick, narrowly avoiding a whacking. Not you, Mr. Randall said contemptuously. What would I want you for when I have this pretty young thing to help me about? Ava laughed again, throwing her head back a little, and obligingly offered her assistance to him. They slowly shuffled their way to the pianoforte, with Mr. Randall looking smugly chuffed about the procession. There was a bit of a to-do about getting him settled comfortably on the stool, with a series of grumpings about not being able to afford an old man a proper cushion, but he was soon sat before the instrument. Ava was not entirely sure how the crooked old man would play, his back hunched in such a way that he was not very far from the keys. To her surprise, he lifted his hands, cracked his knuckles in such a way that made her wince, and then commenced to play. She stared for a moment, her ears not believing what her eyes were seeing. Playing was perhaps not the right word. His fingers skipped across the keys with a lightness that was not to be credited if one had not seen it. What is the young lady's fancy? Mr. Randall asked. A quadrille? A minuet? One of those uncouth country jigs? To Eva's delighted surprise, he plonked out the first few notes of each, weaving them together seamlessly. How could I possibly choose? Eva said, clapping her hands together under her chin. We've been working on a German waltz, Randall, Mr. Galpin called, raising an eyebrow at him. Ein Walsy, eh? These modern dances, pa, he said, wobbling his balding grey head. No style, none at all. Eva put her hand on her hip and Mr. Randall's head swivelled a little to look at her. His weathered face softened. Well, if I were to do it for anyone, it would be you, my lady. 
shameless flirt, Mr. Galpin muttered, which only made Eva laugh harder. Nonetheless, they took their positions, and at a nod from Mr. Galpin, Mr. Randall obligingly played the offending waltz. Eva was delighted to find that, though the addition of music was a challenge at first, her feet knew exactly where to go. Her hours of practice had paid dividends. She glided along easily, keeping pace with the music. Mr. Galpin, too, took note of her progress with an approving smile and nod. You are doing well, Lady Eva, he said as she passed under his arm. I dare say that you shall be ready for any ballroom quite soon. Though relishing the praise, Ava could not help but feel her heart fall just a little at the realisation that she would soon have no need of Mr. Galpin. She could not bear the thought of their lessons coming to an end. This thought was unshakable and added a kind of gravitas to her movements. Still, she was keen to be praised, and Mr. Galpin obliged when the dance was concluded. Even Mr. Randall, from his place at the pianoforte, paid her the compliment of a few claps. Eva, delighted in spite of herself, could not resist giving a little twirl of happiness, which made Mr. Randall break into another gummy grin. When she had completed her turn, she was face to face with Mr. Galpin again, who watched her with a kind of wonder. What? she asked, feeling a little discomforted. Do that again, he demanded, watching her closely. Do what, Mr. Galpin? This? Eva obliged him, turning again, arms flung out and then pulling them back in. How did... You only saw Beatrice do that once, he said, handsome brow furrowing a little in confusion. Yes. Saw the cool Miss Hart dance, did you? Mr. Randall called from his corner. Startled, Eva turned to stare at him. How did you know that? Oh, he's got ears like a fox, that one, Mr. Galpin said. Can't stand up straight any more, but he can hear a fly at the palace from St. James. And don't you forget it either, Mr. Randall said to Mr. Galpin, jabbing a knuckly finger at him. Miss Hart's a good enough dancer, but claws sharp as knives, that one, he continued to Eva. She's so graceful, though, Eva sighed. She makes it look so easy. What's all this? Lady Stanton's voice carried across the dance floor, and everyone turned to look at her. For possibly the first time in her existence, everyone had forgotten that she was present until she spoke up. The sudden silence that followed only seemed to confirm her suspicions that something untoward was happening. With sharply narrowed eyes, she rose from her chair near the fireplace and began marching closer. Lady Eva was just commenting on Miss Beatrice Hart's dancing, Mr Galpin explained. She's an example of the virtue of practising diligently, much like Lady Eva. Lady Stanton stopped, her mouth slightly open in surprise. Ava could practically see her trying to determine exactly how outraged she should be by the very idea of comparing her daughter to a dancer. Fearing the worst, Eva drifted back slightly, taking up a position behind her mother. I'm not sure how Eva would have been able to observe Miss Hart from our box seats to make such a claim as to the quality of her dancing, Lady Stanton said at last, clearly trying to re-establish the correct societal borders. True enough, Mr Galpin agreed, attempting to pacify Lady Stanton. Thankfully, Lady Eva was able to observe her much more closely at the rehearsal this Wednesday past. Eva could feel the blood draining from her face. Her head whipped to Mr. Galpin, desperately trying to catch his eye. From behind her mother's back, she pleaded silently with him, Please, please, please do not give me away. Please. With widened eyes and an entreating face, she tried her best to make herself clear. A rehearsal, Lady Stanton repeated slowly, her voice oddly low and dangerous. What rehearsal? Oh. She was kind enough to pay a call on us to view a rehearsal. I'm sure she found it instructive. Mr. Galpin darted a glance to Eva, then kept his eyes fixed on Lady Stanton. And where exactly was this rehearsal, Mr. Galpin? Lady Stanton demanded. Right here, of course, Mr. Galpin said without hesitation. She was with Miss Kitty Johnson, I believe. Well, 
I certainly am glad that you had time to stop in and watch dancers when you were meant to be doing charitable works, Lady Stanton snapped, rounding on Eva. Eva laughed easily, waving her mother off as if she were the silliest thing in the world. Oh, mother, really, she chided her. It was nothing of the sort. I thought I might have left one of my gloves here, you know, the pretty mauve kid leather ones. I could not find it anywhere, and you know how much I hate to have an incomplete ensemble. Well, Kitty suggested we stop here and look in, and I'm so glad we did. It was like a gratis lesson. Lady Stanton looked with narrowed eyes from her daughter to Mr Galpin, still suspicious, though the idea of a lesson that she had not had to pay for had worked its magic and made her reconsider. Eva kept her face impassively bemused, as if her mother were being just this side of ridiculous. Inwardly, she was praying that her mother would believe the story without questioning. It's true enough, Mum, Mr Randall chimed in. I was providing accompaniment for the dancers, as is my wont, and the young lady and her companion popped round for a few moments. Lady Stanton looked about again, then grunted in grudging acceptance. Eva doubted that she was completely taken by the story, but she also did not have enough to pursue the matter farther. Come along, Eva, she said at last, her eyes lingering only for a moment more on Mr Galpin. We've other calls to pay and have taken up enough of everyone's valuable time. Lady Stanton flounced out of the room then, calling for the maid as she went. With a last grateful look, Eva began following her mother out. She was glad that Mr Galpin had felt compelled to help keep her secret, and the winning Mr Randall for that matter, but humiliated also that she had to sneak around in such a matter. Eva was left alone in the dressing room for a moment to change to her boots, the maid kneeling down to help her. Lady Stanton had already made her way to the entrance and was awaiting Eva there. From the dressing room, which did not boast particularly thick walls, Eva could hear Mr Randall say something in his warbling, gravelly voice, indistinguishable. Don't you start, you saucy old man, Mr Galpin retorted, which only made Mr Randall laugh. Chapter 17 Though Eva had always enjoyed a degree of freedom, likely in the hopes that this would allow her to find a husband on her own, this was quickly changing. Though her mother had no real proof of any misdeeds, Lady Stanton still clearly suspected that something had happened that she would not entirely approve of. This was also a perfectly natural response after the downturn in Eva's reputation. Lady Stanton was attempting to control any damage that might be, so that she could get as respectable and wealthy a husband as she might. Still, despite this newfound scrutiny at home, Eva found herself wishing to explain her situation and the reason she had to keep her adventure a secret. It was an odd compulsion, as Ava would not a year ago have felt compelled to explain herself under any circumstances. It also made no sense for Ava to need to explain herself to a dancing master. It wasn't as if his good opinion should actually matter to her. And yet it did. The real question was how to go about getting her thoughts known. It wasn't as if she could simply sneak out to see Mr Galpin again at the theatre or the academy. Lady Stanton was threatening to escort Eva everywhere, just to ensure that Eva's good name was insured. This also meant that any outings with Kitty were curtailed as well. She wasn't forbidden to go, but it really was not on to be accompanied around town by one's mother if one wished to do clandestine activities. Kitty was proving to be as sympathetic as one might expect, which was fairly significant by virtue of her being Eva's very dearest friend. She had brought over a conciliatory box of violet and rose creams, which they were eating as they lounged atop Eva's bed. Are you certain that you even need to say anything to Mr Galpin? I'm sure he's seen his share of histrionics, Kitty said philosophically. Eva shrugged, doing her best to appear nonchalant. I just don't want him to think that I am permanently wedged beneath my mother's thumb. Which you are. Kitty reminded her. Eva sighed and reached into the box for a rose cream. Yes, but how will it be if that gets around town? Kitty, having just popped a violet cream into her mouth, chewed thoughtfully. Well, she said, swallowing, I don't see why it should. He doesn't strike me as a gossip. No, 
Eva agreed. But the potential is there. He moves about in such rarefied circles these days, and you know how the ton would just love to have more unsavoury gossip about me. It's your own fault for being the most beautiful girl in London, Kitty said. Eva smiled at Kitty, patting her cheek affectionately. Perhaps, but you are undoubtedly the sweetest girl in London. She paused, considering before flopping backward onto the bed. I know it is not particularly sensible, but I just can't bear the thought of him thinking poorly of me, she said quietly, barely audible. Kitty absorbed this, not saying anything. If you can't speak to him, perhaps you should simply write to him. Eva propped herself up on her elbows, staring at Kitty. Just write him a letter. But he's a single man. Can you imagine the scandal if it were found out? That would be the end of my reputation. Then do not sign it, Kitty said with a pragmatic shrug. Simple as that? Eva asked softly. I don't see why it shouldn't be, Kitty answered, especially when we're faced with a real problem here. Which is? There's only one cream left. Receiving post was something of a mixed blessing for Josiah. On the one hand, there were frequently notes of introduction, invitations, occasionally even invitations to perform. Unfortunately, there were also bills mixed in that needed payment, which was naturally a negative for anyone that had to sort out their own finances. Josiah idly flipped through the post, finally home for the evening in his plush townhouse. It was not the largest of homes, but the address was fashionable enough, and it was warm and comfortable. Lately, it was a rare evening that Josiah was able to retire at a reasonable hour, and truth be told, he would almost nearly always rather be working. But the night was chilly and sleet had begun to tap at the windows. February was right around the corner, and winter was not being particularly kind this year. Even the ton, always so eager for a ball or a party, seemed subdued because of the inclement weather. It was as if all of London had decided to simply stay tucked up in bed. The sounds from the street outside had died down before Josiah had even concluded his supper. Sighing, Josiah sat heavily at the chair before his writing desk. He tossed the pile of posts down, not particularly enthusiastic about reading any of it. As the pile of letters landed, however, the corner of one poked out. The writing was unfamiliar, which was not unusual, but there seemed to be a familiar scent that wafted up. Reaching down, he lifted the letter. There was no return direction given, but there was indeed a familiar scent that he could not quite place something spicy and floral all at once. Intrigued, he slid his finger past the seal and unfolded the letter. Dear Mr. Galpin, I am sure that you are surprised by my brazen forwardness in writing to you unbidden. I would beg your indulgence on this matter, as well as that you grant me further indulgence to allow myself to explain my circumstance. In truth, it is rather simple. I must find a husband this season or mother and I will face destitution. We have been living essentially on borrowed time, and the hourglass is nearly empty. To this end, it is vital my reputation remains as spotless as is possible. Bearing this in mind, I hope it is a testament to my dedication and love for dance that I took the risk of coming to the theatre regardless of the potential consequences. I find myself in your debt for protecting my foray, and I hope that I may be able to repay it some day. Yours in friendship, Eva Stanton. Josiah read the letter again and again, his eyes running over the words. It was a very daring thing to do, but he was coming to understand that Lady Eva was a daring girl. He tilted the letter toward the candlestick on his desk, illuminating the words better. Idly, he let his thumb, quite near the bottom of the letter, brush over Lady Eva's signature. A brave thing to do indeed, he murmured to the empty study. Ostensibly, he meant the outing to the theatre, but her bravery and trust in him also showed with the letter itself. Not only had Lady Eva taken a chance in sending it, but also in the fact that she had signed her name to it. Moreover, she had dispensed with the title, choosing to sign simply as herself. She was right to trust him. There was nothing that could induce Josiah to betray her. He was fond of her. 
fonder than he was of his other students. There was something irresistible in her pluckiness, her enthusiasm for dance. When he saw her taking her first tentative steps into his world, it was like he was seeing it all over again for the first time. She made him love his art more. Leaning back in his chair, Josiah looked up at the ceiling, a little lost in thought. He did not wish to endanger her prospects. If something should go array for her, he would feel immensely guilty. It was a difficult world for women, especially those who sought independence. Beatrice had reminded him of that often enough. And if this is what Ava truly wanted, then he would not interfere. But there was something undeniable about her. It was not just that she loved to dance. There were scores of young ladies who liked to turn about the dance floor. It was like she had been searching for something, and dancing had been it all along. She saw the possibilities, the art of it, rather than simply using it as a tool to get along with the ton. Her letter spoke about her situation, but showed no enthusiasm for it. She simply laid out the terms, no real plan or confirmation that this is what she would do. Josiah suspected that there was more to her mother's urge to protect her daughter's reputation than the usual. He had heard hints and whispers about Lady Eva. She was known for gadding about London with a fast set, and all generally agreed that she had been allowed too much freedom the past few years since making her debut. It was also not a secret that Lady Stanton was on the make for her daughter, no matter how circumspect she thought herself to be. It seemed that the ton generally agreed that she was at the centre of at least one fiasco of a romantic plot, and caution was advised. The real question, then, was if Lady Eva was simply going along with her mother's plans, or did she endorse them? If given the choice, which would Eva choose? For that matter, did she even know that there was a choice for her? Josiah wondered if Eva's enthusiasm for dance was not in actuality an escape attempt a last bid for some kind of freedom. Perhaps all that she really needed was to know that there were options. Laying the letter to one side, he pulled out a sheet of writing paper and a knife, cutting a quill with a small knife automatically. He dipped it into the inkwell and, hesitating only once, decided to be a little bit daring himself. Dear Lady Ava Chapter 18 Eva could remember a time, barely, when the arrival of the post was a moment of great celebration in the Stanton home. Letters from friends and distant family, invitations, sometimes even gifts accompanied by little cards, all of it arrived with some regularity. Lady Stanton had been a celebrated beauty and hostess in her prime, and she and Lord Stanton had worked to make their home a shining example of the ascendant ton. If Eva closed her eyes, she could see light and music pouring from every window of the house, the front door thrown open and welcoming everyone within. Even as a young girl, she had been allowed to dart amongst the crowd, her father happy to show her off, forgiving any of her trespasses for a smile and a kiss on the cheek. They were easy, carefree days, and Eva sometimes found herself irritated that she had not taken more care to appreciate them as they were happening. Now. The windows of the Stanton house were dark, save for the lone candle here or there. Those that could remember more joyful days would sometimes pass by, shaking their heads ruefully. Eva had sometimes felt terribly responsible, not having been born a boy and thus able to secure their fortunes on her own wits. The fact was that as a young lady she had only one real way to ensure their survival, and it was a prospect that was growing more and more distasteful with every passing day. Their lone footman, who Eva suspected was being paid in the family silver, would stand in the foyer and await the postman at the appointed hours throughout the day. On one cold day, as February was dawning, the footman delivered the usual stack of bills and demands for payment to Lady Stanton, but kept one letter back, placing it into Lady Eva's hands directly. They were seated together in the parlour, the only room with a fire in it. Lady Stanton was poring over the letters, and Eva was allegedly working on needlepoint, which she was terrible at and detested, but her mother insisted it was a necessary skill for a young lady. Lady Stanton was too preoccupied to notice that Eva received a letter, 
and Eva gave a querying look to the footman, who only shrugged. By rights, Lady Stanton could demand to know who was writing to her unmarried daughter. Surreptitiously but quickly, Ava slid her finger past the unfamiliar seal. Her heart nearly leapt clean up to her throat when she began reading the familiar, sprawling script. Lady Ava, I should like to thank you first and foremost for your trust in me. It is a dear, precious thing, and I promise that you shan't ever find it misplaced. I can appreciate your situation, as I have found myself in a similar predicament on more than one occasion. It is a terribly terrifying thing to find oneself at the mercy of the world, particularly if one is ill-prepared for it. I have seen a number of young ladies who had to fend for themselves, and I cannot say if they would trade their situation for one of easy luxury. You are a clever and capable young lady, and I have no doubts that you will find a way forward, no matter what path you choose. I wish you the best of luck, Josiah P.S. There is a new fad for Polonaise dancing said to be coming from the frontier of the continent. Shall we try to master it before anyone else in London? Ava knew that it was of vital importance that she kept her face as impassive as possible. If her mother thought that she was receiving clandestine notes, there would be no stopping her. There was no denying, however, the way that her heart had begun to thump about in her chest at an excited tempo. It was a fight to keep a grin from spreading on her face as well. Her eyes floated down to the bottom of the letter again. The signature, written with a confident flourish, was undeniably personal. There was no Mr. Galpin. He was simply Josiah. It was a big step to call someone by their Christian name. Eva was not even sure it was wholly proper, but she frankly didn't care. She liked the idea of friendship with him. The invitation to learn a new dance, too, made her smile. He wanted to master it with her, no one else. She almost giggled at the thought, but checked herself just in time. What's that? Lady Stanton asked, nearly causing Eva to leap out of her skin. A letter, Eva said, perhaps unnecessarily, from an acquaintance I met in Bath some years ago. She might be in London for the season. Hmm. Lady Stanton hummed, clearly beginning to lose interest. Anything to entertain? You seem to find it amusing. Not really, no. More just the memory of Bath. Such a diverting town. Lady Stanton sighed, and Ava instantly regretted her words. Perhaps you might go again if things go well for you this season. That would be nice, wouldn't it? I ought to write her back since she took such trouble. Eva set her needlepoint back into the basket next to the settee and rose. She was just at the doorway when Lady Stanton spoke again. Has this friend any brothers? Eva bit her lip for an instant, then without turning back said, I don't believe so, no. Pity. It was about the fourth or fifth time that Josiah stumbled that he was finally willing to admit that he might in fact be distracted. Beatrice had been sighing at him all day, and this was the last straw for her. Honestly, Josiah, why even bother? If you did not wish to do the exhibition for the Duchess of Brandon, you should simply have said so, instead of whatever sabotage this is, Beatrice huffed. Josiah too sighed. He knew that he was not at his best. He was distracted, plain and simple. He stepped back from Beatrice, rubbing the back of his neck and rolling his head about. He was down to his waistcoat and shirt sleeves and was beginning to feel a little strangled by his cravat and neatly starched stock and collar. Irritated, he pulled at the cravat knot, attempting to loosen it. Beatrice watched this with her trademark dispassionate coolness. She tilted her head, her cat-like green eyes running over Josiah. He could feel it, and it only unnerved him more. What? he snapped, uncharacteristically. Beatrice straightened, folding her arms over her chest. I'm trying to decide what sort of intervention you might need. Josiah gave her a withering look. I'm being completely serious. We've a chance to secure yet another wealthy patron, possibly one of the most powerful men in all of England, and you are stumbling about like a newborn colt. Beatrice stepped closer, her eyes narrowing. I am trying to decide if you are simply mad 
or under some sort of spell. Beatrice, Josiah said wearily, rotating one arm in an attempt to loosen his shoulder. I'm simply a little distracted. Distracted, Beatrice repeated deadpan. Distracted? You've been moving about in a daze for weeks now. It is quickly wearing thin. She began pacing, her steps quick and precise. Oh, oh, good Lord, she said, drawing to an abrupt halt. You're infatuated. It sounded every bit an accusation, particularly with the way that she curled her lip up. Do be serious, Josiah said, fighting with his cravat again. If I could only get the blasted thing off, I might be able to think straight. I am being serious, Beatrice said, putting her face right up in Josiah's. I'm always serious about my work, which is more than I can say for you right now. We are all depending on you, all of your students, all of your other dancers, everyone in your employ, and you are too busy being adulpated by some girl. Beatrice turned her back on Josiah, paused, her back becoming so rigid that Josiah could easily see it. Please do not tell me it is that, that amateur that you brought to the theatre. Josiah sighed, rolling his eyes upward as his fingers yanked at the knot at this throat until it at last loosened. He whipped it off, the linen catching at his stock and pulling it a little off centre. She has a name, you know, Josiah said, at last meeting Beatrice's outraged gaze. Josiah, you can't be serious. All of the years I've known you, all of the society women who have flung themselves at you, and you've always kept your distance. Now you let yourself get distracted by a pretty face, not even one with a fortune dragging behind her, and... That's enough, Beatrice, Josiah warned. Now it was his turn to give his back to Beatrice, which he did, shifting from foot to foot as he attempted to collect his thoughts. It isn't what you think. Then what is it? When I look at her, I can see... He paused, his eyes falling down to Beatrice. She can be more than just an ornament for some man, more than some society lady. Beatrice let out a derisive snort. And what makes you think she could? What makes you think she even wants that? I'm not sure, Josiah admitted. I just feel like she deserves a chance. His eyes stared pointedly into Beatrice's. Much as you did, he added. In spite of her irritation, the tone of Beatrice's gaze changed, her shoulders falling a little. Both of them were aware that Beatrice owed the ease of her success to Josiah. There was little doubt that she would have clawed her way to where she was, but it was unlikely her path would have been so easy. Oh, Josiah, Beatrice sighed, exhaling between her lips. You are chasing dreams again. Why not be satisfied with what you have? She's no more substance than a puff of smoke she said, softer, coming to stand before him again. Why not focus on what is real? I am the one standing before you. I am here with you. There was truth to her words, particularly when she took Josiah's hand. He sighed. He knew what she meant, and he wondered, not for the first time, if he weren't foolhardy to not simply accept her as more than a dancing partner. She was, in fact, here, and would continue to be so. There was nothing holding her back, no expectations, no mother she had to provide for. Shall we continue? Josiah said at last, and lifted her hand to shoulder height, as was necessary for the first set they had been practising. Beatrice did not object, but took her place next to him. Quietly, Josiah counted out the rhythm and began guiding Beatrice in the dance. Josiah owed it to her, to his entire troupe, to focus and he did make a concerted effort. It was for naught, however, as he quickly found himself drifting away, mentally replaying the last lesson he had with Ava. He closed his eyes just a bit too long to be blinking, and then he gave in. He had strived to maintain the correct distance between himself and his students, but his mind was on a course of its own now. When next he looked to Beatrice, he found himself imagining that it was Eva's hand he was holding, this made it easier. The harmony that had been missing from their dance steps was quickly replaced. When Josiah was required to place his hand at Beatrice's waist, he did so without hesitating, his eyes unfocused, relying purely on muscle memory. There was no more uncertainty, 
only the easy simplicity of two people moving in perfect synchronization. It was a fine thing to imagine, his arms full of Eva, who smiled up at him and... Josiah. He did not even know that he had closed his eyes until Beatrice said his name. Startled back to reality, he blinked down at Beatrice, who was staring up at him in confusion. His throat was oddly dry, and he swallowed hard. I think that we should have no problem being ready for the Duke's ball, he said, his eyes on Beatrice's face, but not really focused. We will be if you can keep your head out of the clouds, she snapped, stepping away from Josiah. She looked down at the floor, then out the window. When she spoke again, it was in a far more even tone. Perhaps it would be best if we take a few minutes to clear our heads. The other dancers will be here soon, and it would be nice to think that we will be a unified front by then. Josiah nodded, blankly watching her go. He knew that he was making a fair mess of everything, and it wasn't fair to Beatrice or the other dancers. He shook his head hard, clearing the last wisps of fantasy. He hadn't been a good partner to Beatrice, and she simply wanted the best for all of them. Resolved to apologise at once, he turned to hurry after Beatrice to do just that. She had taken up position in front of the large practice mirror, working on her turns. Faster and faster, her head whipping about, she pushed herself harder and harder. It was a marvel to witness, and Josiah could not help but admire her sharp technical skill. There could be no doubt that Beatrice was a fine dancer, and deserved more respect than Josiah had been affording her. He had just opened his mouth to speak, when the expression on Beatrice's face changed. A dancer that has practiced the same step over and over will know instantly when it has gone wrong. And this is exactly what happened with Beatrice in that moment. Her ankle wobbled oddly and then completely rolled beneath her. She cried out, instantly crumpling to the floor like a marionette whose strings had just been cut. Chapter 19 Ava could hear Kitty huffing and puffing along behind her, struggling to keep up. Kitty had never been one for physical exertions, and Ava's weeks of walking and dancing had given her an even quicker gait than normal. Come along, Kitty, we haven't much time, Eva encouraged, striding along at quite a clip. Your legs are longer than mine, this is hardly fair, Kitty groused, but redoubled her efforts. Eva had found a spare few minutes in which she was not under the direct supervision of her mother. She had immediately sent a note to Kitty, and they had set out allegedly to visit the shops. Eva's steps had very quickly bent toward Mr. Galpin's dancing academy, without her quite realising it. Kitty was far too focused on keeping up with Eva's excited pace to notice where they were going until they were directly in front of the academy. Where are we? Ava, what are we doing here exactly? Kitty demanded, one hand to her stomach as they stood out on the street before the simple but elegant facade. I just want to see if they're rehearsing or anything else, Ava said. This was half true. In actuality, she was hoping for the chance to show off what she had been practising for Mr Galpin, Josiah. Kitty sighed, but immediately pulled in a deep breath and walked up the few stairs to the door. Eva smiled, knowing full well that Kitty would likely give her an earful about this particular escapade. But she would likely be forgiven if there was indeed a rehearsal going on and all the muscular calves that Kitty could wish for on display. Once they opened the door, however, it was clear that they had walked into a scene of barely contained pandemonium. Crowded in the entrance was a bevy of other dancers from Mr Galpin's troupe, all of them wearing worried expressions. There was murmuring and shuffling about as everyone craned their necks to look at something. A pit of worry opened up in Eva's stomach, and she began to jostle her way forward. What's happened? Eva asked generally. One of the younger dancers, a boy of no more than fourteen with a shock of red hair on his head, whispered without turning. One of the principals has been injured. The doctor's looking at it now. Surely not Mr Galpin? Eva asked, alarm creeping into her voice. The boy turned to look at Eva, a grim smile on his face. No, miss, himself is hale and hearty. Twas Miss Hart who took a tumble. Ava allowed this information to wash over her. 
her first impulse was one of relief, which immediately made her feel guilty. A feeling of shame and pity for poor Miss Hart bubbled up with her. It was very possible, after all, that this could be a life-altering injury. If Miss Hart were unable to dance, she would have no career, no means of feeding herself. It was a harsh reality to be confronted with. If even someone as seemingly independent as Miss Hart could be laid low so easily, Ava murmured her thanks and pardons as she pushed a little closer to the front of the group squeezed into the hallway by the cloakroom. The dancers, recognising Ava's fine police and bonnet as the markers of the upper classes, instinctually parted and slid back a little so that she might have space. There, on the dance floor, was indeed Miss Hart, one stocking and shoe missing. She was not weeping and wailing, as one might expect from a performer in such a conundrum. Instead, her face was ashen but hard, her eyes glittering. Mr. Galpin knelt before her, patting her hand and supervising as the maid pressed a bag full of freshly fallen snow to the offending ankle. Even from her position, Eva could see an ugly bruise blooming beneath Miss Hart's skin. Poor Beatrice, one of the dancers murmured, and this chorus was taken up by all present. Poor us, another answered from farther back. We've the exhibition at the ball coming, and no female lead. That set off a new round of muttering and shifting, worried looks passing between everyone. Josiah clearly heard them all fretting, and without looking up, he loudly proclaimed, Let us not lose our heads just yet, shall we? The doctor will be here in short order, and then we shall know more. In the meantime, please do not excite yourselves. This settled the crowd into an uneasy silence. Eva and Kitty exchanged a look and melted a little off to the side. As promised, the doctor arrived in less than a quarter of an hour, brushing snow from his shoulders. He had a prodigious amount of sideburns but was otherwise dressed unremarkably, with tiny little spectacles that seemed to constantly be slipping down his hawk's beak of a nose. Clear a path, clear a path, he groused flapping the gloves he had just taken off before him to get people to move. Thank you for watching. Before we continue into the story, do us a favor. Hit the subscribe button this way we will be able to create more audiobooks for free for you. Thank you again. Now, back to our story. Kitty and Eva found themselves pressed further off to the side, which suited them just fine as they could watch the drama unfold without being directly in the way. Let's have a look now, shall we? the doctor said, kneeling beside Miss Hart with a little groan. The audience watched with bated breath as the doctor poked at the offending ankle, which caused Beatrice to furrow her brow. Tell me, does this cause discomfort? he asked quietly, gently grasping Beatrice's foot and rotating it. Beatrice did not answer in the sense that she said actual words, but her face managed to become even more pale, and she let out a tiny grunt. The maid, clearly disturbed, set to hovering about Miss Hart, taking her hand and patting it as quickly as a hummingbird's wings. Well, the doctor said slowly, drawing the word out, I do not believe it is broken. He stood with another groan, pushing his spectacles back up on his nose again. Quite a nasty sprain, though. She must stay off it for at least a week and then only light exercise after that. A week! Beatrice practically shrieked. And not a moment sooner! the doctor said, jabbing a finger at her with the hand that still held his gloves. Eat plenty of eggs and beef broth. It will help you mend faster. And keep your foot up as much as possible, he added, jamming his hands into his gloves. The entire crowd was gravely silent as the doctor exited, clearly having no idea the dire sentence he had just handed out. For her part, Miss Hart was on the floor, the tension seemingly gone out of her. Her hands lay on the wood floor, slack and limp. Stevens, help me with Miss Hart, Josiah said quietly. A great hulk of a dancer disentangled himself from the group and obligingly lifted Miss Hart, not daring to meet her eyes as he held her. Meanwhile, Josiah had disappeared behind a screen and was dragging a chaise lounge across the floor in great groaning squeaks that made everyone wince. There, he said, once it was arranged along one wall. Mary, if you would be so kind as to find a blanket and some cushions for Miss Hart, he instructed, and the maid scurried off. 
With a gingerness that belied his great size, Stevens deposited Miss Hart upon the chaise lounge and then scurried backward as if he were afraid she might swat at him for the impertinence. Mary bodily shoved her way through the crowd, bearing a pillow and blanket, and began fussing over Miss Hart, who bore it without comment. Oh, look, Kitty murmured, the Queen has her own throne now. A chorus of nervous titters met that remark, which drew the sharp gaze of Miss Hart. The laughter died out in an instant and the crowd shuffled and averted their eyes. Josiah, meanwhile, was standing with his hands on his hips, looking down at the floor. With one hand he raked his fingers through his hair, some of it having come loose from his cue. He heaved a great sigh, then turned to face the crowd. Well, there's nothing for it, he said, his grey eyes dull. I do not know how we can complete the exhibition now. But, sir, it's so much money. Dancing for the Duke. I've already told me, Mum. Bully to your mum. Some of us have rentals we must pay. Josiah lifted his hands, attempting to pacify the other dancers. I will speak to the Duchess and see if a smaller programme mightn't be acceptable. The grumbling died down, but was not fully extinguished. Why not simply let someone take Miss Hart's place? A voice piped up. Josiah turned a wary glance to Miss Hart, who folded her arms and looked away sharply. I'm not sure we have anyone who could, he said truthfully. The female members of our troupe are engaged at the theatre for quite some time, and there's no one else that knows the steps. Ava could feel her heart sinking. This was proving to be a disastrous day for Josiah, and she could not help but pity him, and Miss Hart for that matter. Beatrice may not have been the easiest to get along with, but to see her sidelined in such a manner was not easy. And then there was suddenly a sharp shove against Eva's back. She went stumbling forward, accidentally pushing through the crowd. She whipped around and saw Kitty standing there, looking innocently skyward as if she were a saint in a Renaissance painting. Ava was preparing to demand what exactly she was about when Mr. Galpin spoke up, his voice as confused as Ava felt. Lady Ava, what on earth are you doing here? Turning back about slowly, she offered a weak smile. I was hoping to observe another rehearsal, but she trailed off, looking significantly at Miss Hart, who responded by glaring. I really am so sorry to see that you... It really is a shame. Sir, why not ask Lady Eva? A voice from the crowd asked. You've said she's your best student. Why not let her try? Beatrice scoffed, her voice tight. It is one thing to be able to minuet in the safety of a studio... It is another thing entirely to put on an exhibition worthy of a duke. He is not paying to see rank amateurs, no matter how lovely their face is. Eva could not deny the truth of that, but still tossed her head proudly. She looked to Josiah, expecting him to reject the notion outright. Instead, she found him looking at her thoughtfully. His head tilted a little. What say you, Lady Eva? It is nothing too complicated. Some waltzes perhaps a polonaise. You have already been learning some of these dances, he asked. I would understand completely if you should find yourself unable to perform, he added gently, giving her an out. His concern for her opinion and reputation made Eva smile despite the pressed situation. She looked about the room, from Beatrice glaring daggers at her, to Kitty, who was watching her with a bemused expression to the collection of eager, hopeful faces of the other dancers. Josiah still waited before her, outstretching one hand and offering it to her. With a smile, Eva stepped forward and placed her hand in his. It was all the contract they needed. Chapter 20 In spite of Lady Stanton's newfound interest in Eva's whereabouts, it proved shockingly easy for Eva to come up with an acceptable excuse for her to be out of her mother's house regularly. The best part was, it was not even wholly a lie. The Duke of Brandon, who you might remember is Lady Patience Chester's brother-in-law, is hosting a ball in a couple of weeks' time. There promises to be some of the new modern dances, and Mr Galpin believes it would be to my benefit to practice more beforehand. Eva lied, with a pure heart and clear conscience. She did not think that she could be punished for a fib that was in service to others. 
Lady Stanton was quite on board with this, especially as it meant an invitation to a party hosted by a duke. Surely this meant that Ava would naturally be thrust into the path of wealthy, titled, available men. This was all the incentive that Lady Stanton needed to approve Eva's attendance. Her easy acceptance of the scheme could not all be attributed to Eva's cleverness. Lady Stanton was, in a word, distracted. She had taken to locking herself in her room for hours on end, writing letter after letter at her small table near the window. When she was not writing letters, she was out paying calls, but would not elaborate with whom. The times she was home, she was more often than not found pacing back and forth, reading a letter or occasionally staring out the window as if waiting for someone. If Eva had not been so preoccupied herself, it likely would have set off her own suspicions. As it was, Eva was in a world of her own, learning all the variations of waltz that she could, and other dances besides. She was pleased to learn that once she knew the basic step and rhythm of one, it was easy enough to learn another. The dances themselves were enjoyable, though she knew that some decried them as being too fast or unseemly, particularly for respectable young women. The waltz in particular was viewed with suspicion, as it required the partners to be face to face, alone instead of in a set, for more of the dance than was generally accepted. Eva had only met the Duchess of Brandon once before, but she thought it a bold and daring move for such a personage to host a demonstration of this new modish dance. Eva had always been fond of a turn about the dance floor, but she found that she was absolutely mad for waltzing. She liked to think that it was the cheery but dignified tempo, the graceful movements that it called for. If she were being completely honest, then she would have admitted that she also very much enjoyed the fact that it was Josiah whom she was dancing with. The brief moments that his hand was at her waist, or their hands met over their heads and they were locked face to face, made Eva's heart pound so hard that she worried he would hear it. She found that she followed him easily, her faith in his ability to guide them about complete and unshakable. He was not pushy either, as some other gentlemen had a tendency to be. He made direction changes clear with the softest of nudges or pressure on her arm and gave her the option of following along. Once, when they were rehearsing, the other dancers scattered about. Ava caught a glimpse of herself in Josiah's arms. They were such complete opposite in terms of their looks. Josiah was tall with hair so fair it bordered on silver, with light grey eyes that shaded to blue when the sun was out. Eva was of average height, her hair dark and abundant, her eyes even darker and fringed with thick lashes. The contrast was pleasing to Eva's eye, and her imagination was fired as to all the ways that they could play this up for theatricality. As the date of the ball approached, Eva had assumed that she would begin to feel some sort of nerves, an apprehension about the coming performance. There was a degree of excitability about the prospect, but Ava found that mostly she was overcome with an eager kind of thrill about being the one performing with Josiah. A small part of her was concerned about getting caught. As it turned out, this should have been a much larger part, as she was getting a little lackadaisical regarding her mother. Kitty, that bastion of girlish solidarity, had been accompanying Eva as much as possible so that Eva could at least truthfully say that she was not unchaperoned. This arrangement suited Kitty just fine, as she rather liked being able to sit in the corner, fan in hand, and observe rehearsals, strictly for learning purposes. It was nearing St. Valentine's Day, and there was a persistent smattering of snow on the ground. Though it made the footing treacherous on occasion, it was nearly universally agreed that it was preferable to the grey wash that winter had thus far been. Kitty and Eva were returning to the latter's home, arm in arm, their heads locked together in giggling gossip. The other dancers had been exerting themselves, and there had been a profusion of forearms on display. They knew they ought to have been scandalised seeing so many young bucks in just their shirts and breeches, sleeves rolled nearly to their elbows, but in private they found the whole thing exhilarating. I declare it a most enumerating afternoon, Kitty declared, certainly more educational than a trip to an art gallery. Eva playfully swatted Kitty with her free hand. You are terrible! 
I do not hear you disagreeing, Kitty replied easily, which made Ava laugh again. You may be right, she allowed, but I doubt that there will be very many governesses altering their curriculum for their girl wards. Can you imagine? Everyone would be wondering why there was an epidemic of governesses fainting hither and thither, Kitty laughed. They rounded the corner to the street where the Stanton home stood in a row with other fashionable families. They slowed their pace, not wishing to enter domesticity just yet, and it was not quite time for tea. I really would like to think that you have learned something other than how to flutter your eyelashes at young men, Eva said. I've enjoyed watching your Mr. Galpin instruct his charges, Kitty said a little thoughtfully. Although sometimes I find it hard to watch him for too long. Ava stopped short, very close to taking some kind of offence as if Kitty had spoken ill of herself. What makes you say that? Kitty gave a little shrug and tugged Eva onward. He's just too much to look at. He's so very graceful and... It's a bit like watching a statue come to life. He looks more like a prince from a fairy story than a dancing master sometimes. Ava relaxed and nodded at the truth of that. I admit it is sometimes a challenge not to stare at him as we are dancing together. Sliding Ava a sly glance, Kitty tipped her head a little closer, the edges of their bonnets nearly touching. I don't expect he would mind if you did, she whispered. What makes you say that? Eva asked, looking askance at Kitty. Has he said something? No, it's in the manner in which he stares at you when you're not dancing. Which is? Ava prompted. Like, like he regrets letting go of you. It's quite a wistful thing, very sentimental. Only in the eyes, Kitty said, waving vaguely at her own face. It's quite romantic, really. Romantic? Ava whispered, the word hanging in front of her in the cold air. Surely you are mistaken. Kitty shrugged nonchalantly again. Perhaps I am. Of course, she said, another mischievous grin growing on her face. Would it be so terrible a thing if I wasn't? Mr. Galpin surely has the finest calves in the whole kingdom. In spite of herself, Eva couldn't help but giggle as well, as if she were a girl of seventeen again. I think his eyes are far more handsome than his legs. They were still bickering playfully about the fine qualities of Mr. Galpin when they attained the door to the Stanton home. As Ava was reaching up for the latch, the door was yanked open quite unexpectedly, making both of them start backward. Standing framed in the doorway was Lady Stanton, who stared at both Kitty and Eva hotly. Both young ladies stared back a little agog at being surprised so. They had been in the midst of conversation. Kitty had just said the words lovely straight nose when they were interrupted. Good afternoon, girls, Lady Stanton said in tightly controlled tonies. I had wondered where you were off to. Hello, Lady Stanton, Kitty said quickly, recovering first. I hope you are well. Quite well, Miss Johnson, Lady Stanton replied, still staring at Eva. Will you be joining us for tea? Oh, well, I'm not sure I... I insist, Lady Stanton said, then stepped backward to allow the ladies to enter. They did so with their heads held high, but refusing to meet Lady Stanton's piercing gaze as they removed their outerwear. Gloves, bonnets, and snow-dusted pelisses dispensed with, they obediently followed Lady Stanton into the parlour. Eva could not shake the notion that they were naughty schoolgirls that had been caught at mischief. Did you have a pleasant afternoon out? Lady Stanton asked, deceptively mild. I think so, yes, though this weather makes going anywhere a bit of a chore, Eva replied. Lady Stanton did not reply immediately, instead ringing a small brass bell on the table next to her. When the footman appeared, she imperiously ordered tea for them. Only when the footman had departed did Lady Stanton say, and yet this has not stopped you from going out rather frequently of late. Certainly not, Eva said easily. I know how eager you were for me to take advantage of Mr. Galpin. Kitty interrupted with a fit of coughing, which warranted an acerbic look from Lady Stanton and a solid thump on the back from Eva. As expert teaching, Eva finished, 
resisting the urge to glare at Kitty herself. I see, Lady Stanton said. And you have been spending all of your free time at his academy? No, not all, Ava said, looking to Kitty for a moment. We've spent more than a few moments perusing the arcade and shops as well. This was true, particularly as Kitty had recently taken a fancy to reticules. The footman reappeared with a tea tray, which he set down with a bit of a clank on the small table near Lady Stanton. He shot a helpless glance at Eva and Kitty, then scampered off before he could get a whacking for lingering. Lady Stanton began to pour the tea, appearing as cool and collected as could be. It was unnerving, an interrogation by politeness, and Ava resisted the urge to squirm. And may I presume that it was either at the dancing academy or the shops that you saw a man with a lovely straight nose? Lady Stanton asked, her tone deceptively calm. Eva opened her mouth, fully prepared to denounce the idea in the harshest of terms, her back up, defensive and prickly. Before she could say anything, however, Kitty broke in with a gale of laughter. Instantly, like a guard dog that has heard a squeaky floorboard in the night, Lady Stanton's attention snapped to Kitty. Please forgive me, Lady Stanton, Kitty said, covering her mouth with her fingertips. I really do not mean to laugh, it's so terribly rude of me. She made a show of tamping down her humour, attempting to compose herself. Eva settled back a little, instantly recognising Kitty's trademark ability to get them out of a fix. Lady Stanton's attention was now solely on Kitty, who had managed to get her mouth set into a sombre straight line. It was only her sparkling eyes that indicated her amusement. I'm sorry, Lady Stanton, it's just... The very notion of anyone down at the shops being described as handsome is, well, I mean, have you seen some of those shop girls? Honestly, there's one down at the Modiste in Mayfair that looks as if she would be better suited to unloading ships at the docks, Kitty said, leaning forward and lowering her voice as if they were all enjoying a good gossip. Well, I've heard that some shops have taken to employing only the handsomest of clerks to entice ladies to come and spend, Lady Stanton said, taking the bait. She glanced pointedly at Eva. It would be very unfortunate if a young lady were to form an inappropriate attachment as a result. Oh, you must mean Mr. Elliot at Harding Howell, Kitty gasped, leaning forward further, picking up her teacup and stirring in a spoon of sugar. Isn't it just the most scandalous thing? I mean, it's one thing if a widow takes up male companionship, but a dowager. Now Lady Stanton was well and truly invested. She loved a good scandal, and Kitty was a font of gossip. You don't mean that he's a kept man, she replied back, Eva completely forgotten, who was perfectly happy with this turn of events. Not yet, but I believe that is the aim. And let's not pretend the dowager Countess Jenkins hasn't got the banknotes to offer someone carte blanche, Kitty replied saucily, sitting back with her teacup in hand. Eva could only watch in vague awe, not entirely sure how she had managed to turn the conversation so quickly. Oh, I can't hear another word of this. It's so tawdry, Lady Stanton said, waving off the very idea. But in the very next moment, she was leaning forward again, staring across the table to Kitty. What of her son, though? How does he bear it? Oh, he's gone off to Italy, Kitty replied, then took a sip of her tea. He's threatened to become an artist or a poet, and last anyone heard of him, he's taken up with an Italian widow. Merciful heavens, Lady Stanton muttered. She sat back, staring absently at the tea table. Whatever her concerns had been, Kitty had just expertly put them into some kind of perspective. There followed a profound silence, with all present contemplating the information relayed. By the time conversation resumed, it was far more congenial. An easy hour passed, with Ava growing more and more relaxed. It seemed that Lady Stanton had completely forgotten her earlier suspicion. Or that is what Ava thought, until the moment that Kitty had departed. They farewelled her happily, and saw her sent off in her father's carriage. It was only when the door was firmly closed that Lady Stanton turned to Ava, her face inscrutable. She said nothing, merely stared at Eva, who, to her credit, did not cower or back down. 
The message was silent but no less clear. Ava was under suspicion and would have to be careful. Her days of easy freedom were at an end. Chapter 21 The curtains in Eva's room were thrown back dramatically, letting a shaft of sunlight in that hit her square in the face. Instinctually she groaned, putting up a hand to block the intrusion, and flopped over on her side, curling up against the light. Up, Ava, up! Lady Stanton cried jovially, pulling back the blanket that Ava had pulled up over her head. M mother Eva said blearily, cracking her eyes open. Lady Stanton was indeed in Eva's room at the very crack of dawn, the maid puttering around behind her. What on earth? What time is it? Time for you to be up, you silly thing, Lady Stanton chided her. Obediently, Eva sighed and sat up, rubbing her eyes with the heels of her hands. Is everything all right? Are you quite well? What sort of question is that for your mother? Honestly, Eva, you have become nearly unmanageable lately. Lady Stanton sighed, exasperated. The maid appeared next to Eva's bed, and Eva automatically pushed the blanket the rest of the way down and swung her legs down. A chill made her shiver and clench her teeth the moment her feet touched the floor. Best get all of your shivering out of the way now, Lady Stanton warned. She had turned and was going through the cedar closet and chest that housed the bulk of Eva's wardrobe. I don't expect it shall get any better for a while. Why are you... Mother, what is all of this? You must have been awake before dawn, Eva said, allowing herself to be herded by the silent maid to an adjoining chamber where a low fire was lit. No time for chatter. Lady Stanton clapped her hands, and the maid began to help Eva out of her night rail. Eva could be forgiven for not immediately understanding what was happening, given the unusual turn the morning had taken so far. Seeing Lady Stanton up and about before the clock struck nine was about as likely as the Queen doing cartwheels down the aisle at St Paul's, and just as confusing. She had also not felt the need to supervise Eva's toilette since... Oh, good Lord, Eva groaned. She's found some poor old codger to introduce me to, one likely with a bigger fortune than life expectancy. There was always a pattern to these days, with Lady Stanton hovering and dressing Eva like an oversized doll. True enough, right before the fireplace was a low hip bath, which the maid hustled Eva onto. Unceremoniously, she dumped a bucket of water over Eva's head and then attacked her hair, scouring her scalp with such ferocity that Eva was nearly knocked over. Oh, for... Were you a badger in a previous life? You cannot actually dig up my scalp, you know, Ava groused. The maid did not respond, couldn't respond as she was mute, which meant that she was a bargain, but did scrub Eva's head a bit harder. Leave the poor girl alone, Lady Stanton called. We are going out, and it is high time that you were made presentable. Ava was about to demand to know when she ever looked less than presentable, but was prevented from doing so by a pitcher of absolutely frigid water being poured over her head. Unbidden, Ava squealed and leapt up, too cold for even her teeth to chatter. The maid, clearly expecting this, had Ava wrapped up in a drying cloth faster than a poacher clearing a trap. A quilted dressing gown was added, and the maid helped Ava into a pair of fur-lined slippers. Even so, it was all Ava could do to get back to her room for shivering where the fire had been built up a little. Lady Stanton had placed the chair from the dressing table before the fire and encouraged Eva to sit. Working in tandem, both she and the maid began to meticulously comb out Eva's copious hair, working the jasmine-scented pomatum through it that would enable styling later. Eva closed her eyes, letting herself drift far away. It was easier this way. Easier to ignore the pain of her hair being yanked this way and that. Easier to ignore what was to come next. It was a stark reminder of the reality of her life. She had allowed herself to live inside a dream forged by dancing for weeks now. She honestly did not know how to put off any more of these questionable suitors either. Especially not when the house was growing colder and darker. When Eva's hair had been combed out thrice, 
she was left to sit with it drying over the back of the chair toward the fire. She was allowed a few moments to eat breakfast, which was surprisingly sturdy. An egg and cheese pie, currant buns, a thin slice of ham, and a strong blend of tea. Ava did her best not to feel like a lamb being fattened for slaughter. Men don't want a thin stick on their wedding night, Lady Stanton reminded Eva when she pushed the food about on her plate dubiously. This did absolutely nothing to dissuade Eva's feeling of being a piece of glorified livestock. Once breakfast was dispensed with, Lady Stanton began to assemble Eva's ensemble for the day. She had pulled out a gown of bright blue polished cotton with a gathered line down the bust, pulling it into a sweetheart style. Ava frowned at the daring neckline, which would surely raise some eyebrows at being worn during the day. To her relief, there was also a cream-coloured chemisette to fill in the neckline, but it was not enough to completely dispense with the suggestive nature of the gown. Stockings, chemise and jumps were all assembled, as well as a sash of satin in a dark wine colour to go about Eva's waist. Ava obligingly allowed herself to be dressed, still feeling pleasantly distant from all of it. The whole time Lady Stanton kept up a litany of admonitions, a kind of light sermon as to the importance of marriage for young ladies. It's high time you were married, high time, she emphasised. You've been allowed your head for too long. Honestly, this past year you've been running about like a wild boy. And whose idea was that, mother? Eva had to bite her tongue not to retort. Lady Stanton had long hoped that Eva would snare Lord Tom Chester for herself, or at least one of his fashionably rich friends. Others had certainly commented on the fact that Eva was moving with a fast set, but Lady Stanton had brushed it off. Eva wasn't sure which was more condemnable in the eyes of the ton. The fact that Eva had behaved in such a brazen manner, or that her mother had turned a blind eye to it, doing nothing to check her. Once dressed, Eva was powdered, scented, and then the arduous battle with her hair commenced. The maid proved a dab hand with the curling tongs, expertly arranging Eva's tresses into an artful pile at the back of her head. They carefully wrapped a matching length of silk about Ava's crown, just behind her ears, securing it with hairpins. From this, locks of shorter hair were pulled through, then curled until the pomatum sizzled. When they were done, both Lady Stanton and the maid stepped back, admiring their work. For the first time since they started, Eva was allowed to see herself. She could not deny that they had done good work. The colours were exceedingly flattering, and her neck looked longer than ever. She tilted her head this way and that, looking at her coiffure. Not for the first time, Ava thanked Fortune that she had been blessed with dark eyelashes and brows, lest her mother be tempted to darken them with burnt cloves or little lead combs. Well, Lady Stanton demanded, I think whatever you are paying this girl is not enough, Eva said with a glance to the maid, who preened under the praise. Eva frowned. Do you know her name yet? Lady Stanton shrugged. I've been calling her Sally. She seems to like it well enough. Eva looked to the maid, who shrugged and bobbled her head about in a good enough gesture. Fair enough, Ava sighed. Now stop wearing your face under your feet and let's be off, Lady Stanton announced. And I mean it, Eva, no moping. It was not particularly reassuring that Lady Stanton's destination seemed to be the fashionable shops at the arcade. Eva knew that their purse had nearly run dry, but Lady Stanton was perusing as if she had money to burn. She had worn a silk-lined bonnet and had taken one of her sables out of storage. Though it was not yet evening, she had put diamond ear bobs in as well. It would have been humiliating if Eva had not been so practised at appearing aloof and separate from everything. They did not seem to have a particular destination once at the arcade, meandering slowly from storefront to storefront. Their route was so circuitous that Eva began to wonder if perhaps the entire point of the trip was simply to be seen. It wasn't outside of the realm of possibility, perhaps an attempt at reassuring the ton that they were still worthy of notice. Why look, it's Lady Cluet, and her charming son too, he must be down from school, Lady Stanton said, tipping her head in their direction. Of course, Eva groaned inwardly, 
but carefully kept her face impassive. Her mother took her arm, her face also a deliberate mask of pleasantness. Under the guise of holding on to Eva's arm, Lady Stanton pinched her, not entirely gently. Smile, Eva, she muttered between clenched teeth. It would not do to make a bad first impression. Eva wondered, not for the first time, how exactly she got here. Nonetheless, she put on her most demure smile and smiled at the approaching young man and his mother, her heart divided between duty and dreams. Chapter 22 Why, Lady Cluet, what an unexpected pleasure, Lady Stanton said, dipping her head slightly as the other woman approached. She had a plain, round face, but her hair was an extraordinary auburn shade, and she wore a green pelisse over a purple calico gown that highlighted her unique colouring. At her arm was a young man, who clearly was in his majority, but still had a boyish quality about himself. Lady Stanton Always a delight to see you, Lady Cluet replied. Her eyes immediately travelled to Eva, who could feel herself being weighed and assessed. We were just taking in the delights of the arcade, Lady Stanton continued, and now we've run into you. What a happy coincidence. Happy indeed, Lady Cluet agreed. Eva did her level best not to stare between them, her mouth hanging agape. It was all such a farce, play-acting for the purpose of preserving everyone's pride and respectability. They were speaking as if no one could see exactly what was happening right in front of them. All of this would be so much simpler if we could simply say what it is that we really meant, Eva thought bitterly, her mind drifting a little as the ladies exchanged pleasantries and small talk. Why not save everyone time and trouble better spent elsewhere? Hello, this is my son. His prospects are good, but he's a bit of an awkward fellow and been unlikely thus far. He requires someone who can help him navigate society without letting him make any terrible blunders, Eva narrated in her head, watching the ladies' mouths move but not hearing their words. Ah, yes, this is my daughter, who is a great beauty but penniless. She is an old hand at finding her way about the best drawing rooms in London. Don't you worry, however, for she is not too social. Is everything all right, dear? Eva came back to herself suddenly, aware that Lady Cluet had asked her a question. Lady Stanton was busy glaring daggers at her, clearly mortified that Eva could have appeared so feather-headed at this crucial juncture. Forgive me, Lady Cluet, Eva said, punctuating her words with her most contrite smile. I was simply distracted by that beautiful necklace you are wearing. Appeased, Lady Cluet reached up with one hand and touched the string of coral beads. How kind you are to notice, she said. My dear husband, Viscount Cluet, brought them to me from an excursion to Spain. Ava smiled again. Lady Cluet had made her position in society clear and intimated that they were a family of means. Now it shall be up to me to convince her that I am worth the money and title, Eva thought with an inward sigh. How thoughtful, Lady Stanton replied, as was expected. Is your husband a great traveller then? Oh yes, particularly in his younger days, Lady Cluet responded. I was never one for being tossed about on a ship, nor was my son Seth for that matter. He's much more of a homebody like his dear mamma. All eyes shifted to the son in question, who quickly swept his hat off and bowed to the ladies. This revealed the reddest hair that Eva had ever seen not coppery in the least, but true, true red. Rather than replacing his hat on his head, he held it in his hands, anxiously turning it around and around by the brim. He smiled genially at everyone, but generally did not seem to be following the conversation at hand. Eva inhaled deeply, but managed to stop herself from singing at the last minute. The poor son was clearly as surprised as she was by this ambush. Eva felt like a spectator at a show, asked to participate when required, but otherwise to remain dumb. In a definite and real coincidence, it happened that both parties happened to be heading in the same direction, never mind that Eva was quite sure that they would have been going to the moon if that was where Lady Cluet claimed to be going. The ladies urged the younger people on, 
under the guise that they would surely outpace them and could look for a table at a tea room. Obediently, Ava walked a few paces ahead, and Seth followed suit. In spite of her bonnet, Eva found herself casting a sidelong glance at her forced walking companion. He wore all browns and tans, and walked with a sort of rambling, uncontrolled gait. If he were bothered by the idea of being manipulated like a puppet, he did not show it. His face was pleasant and undisturbed. Ava quickly realised that she would have to speak first, or else they would spend the entire walk to the nearest tea room in complete silence. So, Mr. Cluett, have you been in town long for the season? Mr. Cluett looked a little startled, as if he had forgotten that he was not alone. I, oh, yes, we typically live in town. Mother does not care for the country. Well, I can agree with her on that point, at least during the winter. It's so frightfully dreary out there, Ava said. Mr. Cluett said nothing to that, but he may have nodded his head a little in agreement. It was difficult for Ava to tell, for he had a floppy, disorganised way of walking, like a puppy that hadn't yet figured out how large its paws were. So you, ah, uh, you prefer town then? Seth asked hesitantly after another few beats of silence. Generally speaking, though I do long for the country when the summer is on London, Ava replied, trying her best to sound light and unbothered. Thought so, Seth said definitely nodding his head now. I'd heard you were quite fond of the theatre and all other such diversions. Not much of that on offer in the country. Indeed, Ava agreed unnecessarily. Ava cast a glance over her shoulder and saw that the ladies had fallen quite a way back, walking as slowly as humanly possible. They clearly wished to give the young people as much time as possible to converse. And do you care for the theatre? After a fashion, I suppose, Mr. Cluett said. You'll probably think me dreadfully common, but I like the variety shows better than the opera or ballet. It's less complicated. Eva almost laughed out loud. This was hardly surprising. She did not fault the poor boy, but it was clear that he hadn't an artistic bone in his body. Yes, well, Eva said, and then looked away because she did not know what else to say. I've heard that you are a skilled dancer, Mr. Cluett said with an attempt at continuing the conversation. Ava contemplated looking down bashfully, as was expected when a young lady was paid a compliment. Instead of demurring, however, she stared directly at him, allowing him a real look at her face past the edges of her bonnet. I am, she agreed softly, her tone belying the intensity with which she spoke. I am a very good dancer. It brings me great joy, as if, as if it were bringing me truly to life. Mr. Cluett stopped walking, and Eva pulled up short too. He was studying her face as if he had just heard something new for the very first time. Wow, he breathed. I've never heard anyone speak like that about dancing. He broke into a smile. Eva couldn't help but smile in return. It really was impossible to dislike this young man, but Ava also was not prepared to like him, at least not in the manner in which was expected. She suspected that he was the sort that would be forever in awe of any woman that paid him mind, whether she deserved it or not. It was not an unappealing prospect to have a husband that would heap praise upon her if she so much as crooked a finger. It was not what Ava wanted, however. She wanted to be seen, admired, cherished, desired, for who she actually was. They resumed walking, conversation momentarily spent. Here we are, Mr. Clute said as they reached a door to a small but elegantly furnished tea room. He looked at Ava blankly, who was staring at him expectantly. Her eyes flicked to the door, and Seth followed her gaze. Oh, yes, the door, I just, please, forgive, allow me, he stammered grasping the latch firmly and pulling it open. Eva was about to step within when she turned to look behind her. The other ladies were some distance behind them still. Perhaps we ought to wait for our respective mothers, Eva suggested. She did not wish to enter a tea room in the company of a young man, 
the London gossip mill would have that grist ground down and distributed before the day was out. Ah, yes, good thinking, Mr. Cluett agreed with another unabashed smile. This presented another problem, however. Mr. Cluett was clearly a bastion of good manners, which meant that he was caught holding the door open at varying widths, anticipating Eva and the other ladies entering. In fact, if Eva so much as shifted slightly toward the door, it would come flying back open. Eva found this great sport until there was an exaggerated sigh from the hostess, who was being subjected to cold February air at intervals. This, of course, led to Mr. Cluett stammering an apology through the open doorway, which only allowed more cold air within. Eva had to smother a laugh behind gloved fingers held delicately to her mouth. She looked up at Mr. Cluett, feeling a kind of sad wistfulness. Eva didn't doubt that it would be easy to be fond of him. She was in great danger of taking a liking to him as it was. But to love him? To be lost to passion with him? To call him husband? Impossible. He was a broad-shouldered specimen with a winning smile. Ava did not doubt that he would have more offers than he knew what to do with in short order. She simply did not want a husband that would make her feel as if she were too much for him. For goodness sake, sir, we're all to catch our death of a chill in here, the hostess barked out again. Mr. Cluett jumped and apologised again, closing the door a bit more. Instinctually, Eva turned and looked expectantly at the door, which Mr. Cluett obligingly opened again, his face looking a little panicked. Eva laughed, but not at him. The situation was simply too absurd for words. Chapter 23 Eva could not recall a single other instance when the act of drinking tea had been such a chore. She had endured her share of awkward encounters, but the tea with Mr. Cluett and his mother was the top of the pile. The poor boy had looked vaguely helpless the whole time, which Eva empathised with completely. Both of their mothers seemed desperate to shove them together, which only confused Eva further. It did not help that her own mother seemed bent on speaking about Eva, as if she were a cow that must be sold before the season is out. By the time the tea was concluded, Eva was unsure who she was more disgusted by. Her mother for so desperately trying to pawn her off on a stranger, or herself for simply sitting silently through it. It had crossed her mind to simply stand up and walk away, but there was an invisible shackle holding her to the table that was called duty. Her reticence was, of course, duly noted by her mother. The entire trip home, which Lady Stanton had rented a carriage for in order to keep up appearances, she had shaken her head and seemed at the point of despair with Ava. Ava did not even have the wherewithal to object at this point. She had only one duty as a daughter, one way that she could materially contribute to her family, and she was neglecting it. Just what is there to object to with Mr. Cluett, Lady Stanton had demanded. He is handsome and kind, and his position is secure, far more secure than ours is. Eva, heedless of her bonnet, had simply laid her head against the carriage window. I just don't think I can love him, mother, she said quietly, tiredly. No one is asking you to, Lady Stanton had snapped. You are simply being asked to make sure that neither you nor I starve. What could Eva say to that? It was true. Eva had elected to stay in her room the remainder of the day, laying across her bed, staring up at the ceiling, where she remained. It was easy enough to ignore her reality when she was playing at dancer, but the time was running out for that particular fantasy. Her last lesson was tomorrow. After that, she would have no more excuses to seek out Mr. Galpin's tutelage, or his company for that matter. She knew that he was counting on her for the demonstration at the Duke's ball but how could she possibly explain that to her mother, to anyone, really? Eva pressed her fingers against her closed eyelids and let out a sound that was somewhere between a groan and a sigh. And yet I cannot bear to disappoint Josiah, she thought ruefully. I cannot bear to disappoint myself any more. Slowly, Eva lowered her hands, placing them on the bed and using them to push herself upright. As she did so, her reflection in the dressing table mirror against the wall next to her bed came into view. The lone candle that she was allowed burned brightly in the murky gloom of the encroaching evening. 
It cast a warm glow that contrasted sharply with the cool shades of the room. As her eyes adjusted, Ava took stock of herself in the mirror. Her hair was mussed from laying as she had been, and her dress was creased. The candle's lonely flame sat at the level her heart, illuminating her like a votive saint. The contrast between herself and her surroundings was like a sun rising on a cold winter day. Her eyes were dark and sad, giving her beautiful face a tragic cast. Perhaps I should simply run off and become a poet's muse, she thought wryly. Surely Byron would do a credible job of ruining and celebrating me. The notion made her smile, but did not wholly erase the sad lines that clung to her eyes. As her smile faded, it dawned on Ava that this was a glimpse into her future. A mouth that smiled and said the right things, but eyes that were pools of regret. The cost of duty appeared to be her own happiness, but she was hardly the first person to have to make this choice. The real question, Ava thought slowly, rising and sitting at the little chair before her dressing table, is whether or not I can still stand to look at myself, should I choose to do this. Unbidden, her mind flashed to a vision of herself, dancing and confident, a bon vivant of the dance floor. In a trice, all of her apprehension for the future was gone. Resting her chin on her palm, her eye was caught by the stack of dancing plates that Josiah had sent to her. She couldn't help but thumb through a couple of them, as was her habit. She had an inkling, a notion, that Josiah had been quietly pushing her towards something, but she could not quite make out what. It was not simply that he wished her to be a more competent dancer, it was something more. He had taken special care with her, encouraging her to do more than the minuet or waltzing even. He had invited her to expand her horizons. And for what? Ava sat up slowly, a new idea dawning on her. He had encouraged her to see herself as more, to show her things that were outside of the realm of possibility for young ladies of the Tarn. He had taken great care to induct her into his world, to show her the young people that made their way on their own wits and toes, as it were. He couldn't possibly mean for me to. But why? Eva's forehead creased as she considered. A strange feeling was brewing in her chest, a light, fluttering kind of hope, coupled with a healthy dash of daring. It had never occurred to her that he might be tentatively inviting her to join his world until that very moment. Ava could not contain a breathy bark of a laugh. It was such a cliché, a handsome dancing master seducing his pupil and convincing them to untoward acts. In Josiah's case, it appeared that it was not so much a seduction of Ava's person, but more a seduction to his way of life. Ava looked down to the stack of dancing illustrations again, this time placing a fond hand on the stack. It was not such a very difficult task, Ava murmured. The door to her room creaked open at that moment, startling Eva a little. It was the maid, come to help her loose her hair and undress for bed. The girl, Sally, was quiet as always, which gave Eva a kind of comfort. The only sounds in the room for a while were the occasional plink as the hairpins were pulled from Eva's hair and set into the little porcelain dish on the dressing table. Could she tolerate this for the rest of her life? especially knowing that there was another possibility out there? She might have been able to bear it if an alternative had not only been presented, but also given her such delight and fulfilment. Eva felt as if she were teetering on the edge of a precipice, and it would take only the lightest push to send her over. Sally, if you had the chance to make a wish come true, something only for you that would only be for your benefit, would you do it? even if it might mean that others might be not so fortunate? Eva asked quietly, her words hovering in the dark room. She did not really expect an answer. It wasn't the sort of thing a maid would be expected to answer under the best of circumstances, never mind Sally's difficulty in speaking. It was all the more startling and more poignant when Eva felt a hand on her shoulder. Her eyes flicked up to her reflection catching Sally's eye. The maid's face was scantly illuminated, a round cheek here, the tip of her nose there, the bulb of her chin. 
She stared back into Eva's eyes, her eyes earnest, and pressed Eva's shoulder again. Thank you, Sally, Eva replied, feeling an unexpected kinship with the maid. Tomorrow would be her last official mother-sanctioned dance lesson with Josiah. Eva was not one to torment herself in indecision. When she came to a resolution, she acted on it, and with haste. This was what gave her such a reputation for boldness, for better or worse. It had been a long time since she had felt like herself, like the daring girl who had no qualms about galloping horses through the park, beating gentlemen at playing cards, even placing a wager here or there. In her dark, silent room, Ava reaffirmed her resolution to be more herself and less like others expected. The ballroom in the Stanton's townhouse was opened yet again, this time for Eva's final dance lesson. When Josiah arrived, Eva could hear Lady Stanton making a big to-do of apologising for the state of it, citing difficulties with a new decorator. Waiting within alone, Ava allowed herself to roll her eyes. She would likely never understand her mother's compunction for keeping up appearances at all costs. When Mr Galpin was shown through the door, Ava felt her heart skip a beat. A fool grin was threatening to break out on her face, which would surely give the game away. She tamped it down hard, attempting a look of friendly disinterest that was expected of her. Josiah did not appear to be convinced, however, for when he met her eye, his own face seemed in great danger of lifting upward. He bowed gallantly to her, and she responded with a quick curtsy. She knew that she was staring, but she found that she could not stop herself. He was dressed remarkably, in a dark red jacket that only served to highlight his unusual colouring. His waistcoat was a dark blue sateen, Eva's favourite colour, and matched the ribbon that held his long hair back. Lady Ava, he greeted her. Eva's stomach did a little flip when he said her name, and she nearly fell to blushing like a debutante in her first season. Mr Galpin, she returned. I am so pleased you were able to come today. She looked into his eyes when she spoke, hoping that he would understand what she truly meant, that her words carried more weight than a typical greeting. I would not have missed your final lesson for anything in the world, he replied, his eyes refusing to leave hers. As this is her final lesson, I expect that we shall both be pleased by her progress, Lady Stanton cut in. Eva was brought back to herself by the interruption. She would have to be careful. If her mother suspected anything, her plans would be squashed before they were even begun. I have every reason to believe you shall be, Josiah returned easily not even bothering to look at Lady Stanton. Lady Eva is a credit to whatever dance floor she graces. Well then, Lady Stanton sniffed, I suppose we'd best get on with it then. We've much to do today. Significantly, Ava flicked her eyes to her mother, then back to Josiah, trying to give him a carefully concealed, pleading look. Please, Eva thought at him, hoping against hope that he would hear her. Please help me to be strong. There was no one to accompany them this time, but Josiah was perfectly able to keep a rhythm under his breath. When he held out his hand to Eva, she placed her hand in his with a held breath, the simple gesture feeling far more intimate than it had any right to. Their hands were ungloved, skin against skin, and Eva fancied that he understood what it meant to her. Eva's feet had a lightness to them, her whole body did really, but she found that she could lift onto her toes with ease. There were no cares when she was dancing, no pressure beyond her desire to perform well. Josiah could clearly feel this, for he barely guided her with the deftest of touches. He was there to help her be a shimmering example of grace and ease, not to command her with a heavy hand. If there had been anyone there to watch that could appreciate what they were seeing, they would have surely been dumbfounded at the display. But it was only Lady Stanton, and when Eva passed beneath Josiah's arm, she caught sight of her mother's face. It was hard and flinty, her eyes watching with a suspicious displeasure. Chapter 24 Apprehension settled in Eva's stomach like a lead weight. Her body automatically stiffened in response, bringing her back down to earth. 
Josiah clearly noticed her sudden reticence, and when they were facing one another again, he gave her a quick, querying look. She shook her head almost imperceptibly, not wishing him to complicate things by worrying or asking questions. The lesson proceeded, with Josiah only gently correcting Eva's form once or twice. She followed him automatically, but her heart was not as enthusiastic as it had been just a few moments before. It wasn't that she was rethinking her decision, which had very nearly been made, but more that it would be impossible to go through with it on her terms if Lady Stanton were to intervene. That would only lead to more heartache and complication than would be strictly necessary. She hoped to present a fait accompli rather than having to fight her way forward from the very beginning. When the hour had passed, Josiah stepped back from Eva, but Eva could almost still feel him near her, as if the physical distance did not matter. Unconsciously, she had oriented herself about him, adjusting whenever he moved. It was like they were still dancing even when simply standing and speaking. You have done well, Lady Eva, Josiah said earnestly, ducking his head a little to catch her eye. I mean it. You should be very proud. I am, Eva replied softly but with no less feeling. Lady Stanton, having noticed their stillness, took the opportunity to march forward. That is the hour concluded, yes, she said. Without waiting for a reply, she snipped. I should hate to think that I shall be charged more than an hour for the sake of conversation. No one would ever think of charging you for conversation, Lady Stanton, Josiah retorted breezily. His face was all politeness, and it was all that Eva could do to keep herself from laughing aloud. She was momentarily afraid that she might actually rupture something from the effort especially when Lady Stanton's eyes narrowed suspiciously. I'm glad to hear it, she replied at last, her gaze lingering on Mr. Galpin. I presume that you have deemed Eva ready for the ton, then? She was ready before, Josiah said with a sideways glance to Eva. But now she shall be a leader of fashion. There are not many young ladies who will know how to waltz yet, and even fewer that can do it well. And this is where dance is headed, in your opinion? Lady Stanton asked, scepticism writ large across her face. Josiah gave an elegant little shrug. It is, though it is not just my opinion. The dance is sweeping the continent, and where Europe goes, Britain typically follows in these matters. I should not be surprised if dancing is only done in couples within a decade, two at most. And not in sets. Lady Stanton pursed her lips at the notion. That is an absurd notion. I can't countenance such a thing becoming de rigueur in the better houses. The Duke and Duchess of Brandon are having a demonstration of the new waltzes at their ball next week, Eva chimed in, and then immediately began mentally kicking herself. She should not have tipped that particular hand just yet. Lady Stanton stared at Eva for a moment. I suppose it is good that you are so well prepared for such a fashionable occasion then. She turned her attention back to Mr. Galpin. We've already had our invitations. The Duke and Duchess are great friends. Have you indeed? Josiah replied coolly. I shall look forward to seeing you there then. You'll be attending as well? Lady Stanton asked, her brows darting upward. I shall be demonstrating, Josiah said with a sweeping bow and an elegantly turned calf. Oh, Lady Stanton laughed. You shall be attending as a performer. I thought for a moment you meant to say that you would be an invited guest and that the Duchess had taken leave of her senses. Why would that be, Mother? Ava blurted, defensive. Why shouldn't Mr Galpin attend? Because it isn't done, Eva, Lady Stanton said, waving her daughter off. Don't take on with me. Mr Galpin isn't offended. He knows the way of the world. Indeed I do he murmured, his voice low and rife with barely concealed irritation. It's different for people born into a certain class, Lady Stanton continued, as if she hadn't heard Mr Galpin, which she very likely did not. Take my daughter, for instance, born to a specific way of life and never losing sight of that. From the time she was old enough to form words, she knew what her duty was, and happy she was to do it too always had her sights set very high. Mother, I really don't... Eva tried to interject, but to no avail. 
Nothing less than a duke would do for her, Lady Stanton said, looking at Eva with such overbearing condescension that Eva thought she might suffocate from it. She always told her father, rest his soul, that she would marry into only the highest echelons of the ton. I see that Lady Ava has always been goal-oriented, Josiah commented, his voice tight. Ava could scarcely bring herself to look at him, her cheeks burning. She couldn't even deny that she had said those things, because of course she had. It was all that she was brought up to expect. What else had she known? Position is everything for my Eva, Lady Stanton said, smiling beatifically at her daughter. I'm sure she will be very grateful to you when your lessons help her to achieve this. Then I'm sure she will consider it time well spent, Mr. Galpin said in clipped tones. Now I believe that our business is ready to be concluded, Lady Stanton. Unfortunately, I cannot linger in your company. As you so graciously pointed out, I unfortunately must continue to work for my bread. Yes, yes, of course, Lady Stanton said. Now, will a banker's draft do? I can have one drawn up for you, Chadwick. Wherever has that footman got off to? Lady Stanton bustled over to the door, sticking her head out and searching for the offending footman. Eva, taking advantage of the comparable and momentary solitude, turned instinctually to Josiah, trying to catch his eye. He remained aloof, however, his chin lifted proudly, and his gaze a thousand yards away. Please, Mr. Galpin, I... Please do not be offended by anything my mother says, she whispered urgently. On the contrary, Mr. Galpin replied smoothly. I feel that I owe her a great debt for her candour. What do you mean? I mean, Josiah said, turning his stormy grey eyes to Eva at last, that she has made certain things abundantly clear. I am glad to be apprised of these things before I... well... He straightened abruptly, smoothing his cravat a little. I have never been one to stand between a lady and her dreams, and I have no intention of starting now. Eva reared back, placing one hand at her throat. What do you know about my dreams? More than I should like to, he snapped. The door to the ballroom creaked open again, and Ava turned away from Josiah, feeling cold and bereft as she did so. Lady Stanton returned, a footman in tow, who carried a ledger, as well as Josiah's hat, greatcoat and walking stick. Lady Stanton took up a pen, and after twice having Mr. Galpin confirm the amount, the banker's draft was complete. She tore it from the ledger with a ripping sound that echoed down the length of the modest ballroom, making Eva wince. She remained turned away. She had her pride, after all. Still, she could not stop herself from glancing over her shoulder once as Lady Stanton passed the draft to Mr. Galpin. There, she said, a note of triumph in her voice. I believe this concludes our business. For a long moment, Josiah simply stared down at the draft in his hand. Yes, he said slowly, folding it crisply and placing it into his inner jacket pocket. I believe we are finished. Without further prompting, he took his hat and removed his gloves before settling it firmly on his head. A small bow and without second glance, he turned and left. Eva hated that she did not turn to watch him go, knowing that it was the last time anything would pass between them. The story of Lot's wife had never held any particular meaning for Josiah. As a practical, single-minded child, he'd always listened to that story with a sort of superior smugness. It's so simple, he'd think to himself. All she had to do was not look back. It was such an easy task, simply keep walking forward. It wasn't anything strenuous, like crossing a sea or not getting eaten by hungry lions. Just don't look back. As he got older, Josiah's opinion hadn't really altered. It was never any doubt that he just simply wouldn't turn back around. As he walked away from Lady Stanton's ballroom, away from Eva, he realised what a prideful fool he was. Step by agonising step, the urge to turn and look back was pure torture. He felt as if he were walking through molasses, his legs and feet preternaturally heavy. Just as he was at the point of turning back, the door to the ballroom latched closed. Whatever spell he had been under was broken in that moment. 
he firmed his grip on his walking stick and stepped out of the townhouse onto the street. The cold February wind that whipped down the street helped to clear his head, and he sucked in a greedy lungful. It's my own fault, he thought bitterly. I should not have expected so much of her. It's not even really her fault. The yoke of polite society is hard to throw off. He set off down the street, his gait and bearing such that those that were in his path took one look at him and quickly scampered out of the way. He did not even really see where he was going. He simply knew that he didn't want to be anywhere near Ever Stanton anymore, lest his resolve crumble. I just expected more of her, he lamented to himself, which he supposed was really his failing. She had given no indication that she wanted to leave her life, to be free, to be with him. The simple fact was that he was only a part of a transaction, a stepping stone. The banker's draft in his pocket pressed against him, weighing as much as an anchor. Chapter 25 Josiah had no memory of actually walking back to the dancing academy. He simply found himself standing before the familiar door, his hand on the latch, reaching for the key in his pocket. It should be empty at this particular hour of the afternoon, which was a blessing for Josiah. He had no wish to speak to anyone. If only she weren't so beautiful. If only she weren't so compelling. If only... was the constant refrain that he had kept up on his journey. His feet had apparently carried him of their own volition to the academy. It was appropriate as it felt more like home to him than anywhere else in London. Sighing. He jammed the large brass key into the lock on the door and twisted, but instead of the familiar clank of the tumblers falling back, there was only a hollow clinking. He frowned and then sighed again, heavier this time. The door was already unlocked. Someone was clearly within. He debated for a full minute about simply turning about and returning home, but ultimately decided that wouldn't do. Someone may well have heard him fiddling with the lock and he didn't want anyone to be alarmed. Of course, there were only two other people beside himself who had a key to the door. One was the maid, and it wasn't the poor girl's fault that he was having a bad day. She had the innate talent for being silent and making herself scarce when it was clear that she needed to, so it would not be hard for Josiah to pretend that he was alone if it was she within. The other person who had a key was Beatrice. And she, well, Josiah doubted that she would be sympathetic. It was this thought that had him hesitating, freezing on the doorstep to his own dancing school. On the other hand, if he did not speak to her now, the expectant conversation would hang over him relentlessly. Better to get it over with then, Josiah thought grimly. Resolute, he withdrew the key and replaced it in his pocket, took a deep breath and opened the door. The entryway to the school was not particularly warm, but the cloakroom and connecting dressing room was always a bit warmer. There were small brass braziers, and the maid diligently kept them warmed with coals during the winter months. There were the two fireplaces at either end of the dancing hall, which threw out warmth and light well enough, but on particularly cool and draughty days, these were supplemented with additional braziers. Such was the case today, in anticipation of the rehearsal that would commence in an hour's time. Josiah had been counting on this hour of solitude to pull his thoughts together, to regain some kind of composure. Robbed of the opportunity, he instead steeled himself for a conversation with Beatrice. He paused long enough to remove his snow and dirt-covered boots in one of the dressing rooms, replacing them with his leather dancing pumps. The familiar feeling brought comfort, as it always did, but there was an unfamiliar sort of sadness this time as well. It was a strange feeling, like a preemptive disappointment. He flexed his feet a couple times, sighed and rose, pushing off from the chair with his hands. In the dancing hall, Beatrice was indeed there, which was not unexpected. What was unexpected, however, was the fact that she was standing next to the bar, bolted to one long wall. She stood firmly on one foot, grasping with the hand on the same side. With her injured foot, she was cautiously placing weight on it, flexing her ankle slowly. She winced, then tried again. Aren't you supposed to be resting that foot? Josiah demanded. 
One of the things he simply couldn't abide was his dancers not taking the proper due care and jeopardising themselves further. Aren't you supposed to be teaching a saucy bit of rich baggage how to drag her hooves across the floor? Beatrice snapped back. Josiah did not rise to the bait. Beatrice was at her most spiky when she was vulnerable, and being injured was just about the most vulnerable she could be. He simply ignored her, and made as if he were going to perform some stretches of his own. After a few minutes of silence, punctuated only with sharply inhaled gasps whenever she placed her foot too quickly on the floor, Beatrice spoke again. This time, her voice was more even and contrite. I'm sorry that was uncalled for, she said. I'm just worried about you. You seem to have taken a greater interest in her than your other students in the past. Josiah turned and watched as she attempted to bear weight on her foot again, wincing and gritting her teeth. How long have you been at this? he demanded, nodding toward her injured limb. Long enough, Beatrice admitted. Would you help me to my seat, please? Of course. Josiah went to her and placed his right arm securely about her waist, allowing her to hold on to his left hand. Slowly they hobbled along, making their way in little hops and starts to the settee that had been pushed against the wall. Beatrice let out a strained, breathy laugh at one point about halfway there. At least you're used to leading me about, I suppose. There is that, Josiah agreed. That's my point, though. She paused and gritted her teeth for a moment, then continued on. I know this life of ours. I know the demands placed on you. Is it fair to expect someone else to just throw themselves into our world and expect them not to drown? Josiah said nothing, but he could feel his jaw clenching. Beatrice, apparently taking his taciturn silence as encouragement, continued speaking as they reached the settee. I'm not speaking ill of her. It's not her fault, really, Beatrice said, speaking in tones that indicated that she felt she was being incredibly generous. She was brought up to one life, and it's all that she knows. Is it decent to both of you to expect her to completely throw away everything she knows? Conversation was again interrupted as Beatrice released her hold on Josiah, sliding down to the settee with a pinched face. Honestly, I do not know how I managed to get that far. Which brings up another problem, Josiah said, turning away as Beatrice hoisted her bad leg up next to her. What shall we do about the Duke's ball? Oh, honestly, Josiah, come off it already, Beatrice sighed, exasperated. She was leaned forward at an awkward angle, tenderly massaging her sore ankle. It is not that difficult of a prospect. Josiah turned back to her, one eyebrow arched. I thought you were the one pushing for the demonstration, as it would bring further opportunities for patronage. I am, Beatrice said, her eyes still on her swollen ankle as she turned her leg this way and that, attempting to get a better look at it. But it is a waltzing demonstration, not exactly the ballet at the Royal Opera. What do you suggest, then? Giving up on her ankle, Beatrice sat back, meeting Josiah's eye with a careless shrug. Just pull Lily or Ruth from the theatre for a couple of hours on the day of. No one will be any the wiser, and it's not as if anyone will really be able to tell if they miss a step. Josiah frowned, but did not immediately veto the idea. It had merit, and was likely not only the most practical solution, but also the only solution. He turned away, looking out the window. The sun had been out earlier in the day, but clouds were now hiding its face again, threatening snow or rain. I suppose I haven't much choice, he said finally. Why look so morose then? Honestly, Josiah, you are the only man I know who can be presented with a perfectly serviceable solution to a problem and find it upsetting, Beatrice huffed, folding her arms over herself. I just, I thought she might be great. Josiah said softly, turning at last to look at Beatrice. Her face, hard and inscrutable, softened a little as she gazed at him. Not everyone is destined for greatness, Beatrice said with surprising gentleness, putting her hand on Josiah's arm. Trying to drag others to your level of achievement will only drive you mad. He had nothing to say to that, at least nothing that wouldn't end in a quarrel. So he elected for silence staring out at the empty dance floor of the school.
In less than an hour, it would be populated by members of his troop again, eager to perfect their performances. It would have been easier if she had not shone as bright as a sun, Josiah lamented. He would allow himself this moment of melancholia, then put it away for the sake of those who depended on him. But your mother didn't really say anything that was untrue, Kitty argued, far too reasonably for Eva's taste, from her usual spot at the foot of Eva's bed. The bed's owner had flopped face down across it and had scarcely moved since Kitty had arrived. Ava had summoned her immediately after the lesson with Josiah. Yes, but she didn't have to say it, Eva objected, her words muffled as she spoke into the quilt. I'm not the same person that I was at sixteen, and it's unfair to pretend that I am. True enough, Kitty agreed. The bed dipped a little as she leaned back on her elbows. For instance, you used to find Pamela to be the very last word on literature. What are you implying? Eva said, her head snapping up. Kitty gave a one-shouldered shrug, a playful look on her face. Only that perhaps it was not only your taste in marriage prospects that was questionable. In spite of her misery, Eva floundered around behind herself with one hand until she found a pillow, which she quickly put to use by thumping Kitty on the head. How very dare you, Kitty said with the least amount of outrage humanly possible. I shall have to call you out for this grievous insult. Eva flopped over onto her back, looking up at Kitty. Shall it be pistols at dawn, then? I was thinking more along the lines of pillows, Kitty said, taking up the pillow herself and letting it fall onto Eva's stomach. Who knows? We may start a new fad for entertainment. Ladies dueling with pillows in the parks and back alleys at dawn? Why not, I suppose? Mother says that in her youth there was a great spate of ladies' bare knuckle boxing, Eva mused. Good Lord, Kitty muttered. Wait, at dawn? Oh, yuch, no, far too early. Her pert little nose wrinkled up in distaste, which made Ava laugh. Life's greatest sins as far as Kitty was concerned were cakes that were too dry, ugly shoes, and having to rise before the clock struck nine in the morning. Though their conversation was purely nonsensical, it did have the benefit of distracting Eva from what had made her so unhappy in the first place. Kitty was a good friend. She knew the precise ratio of serious conversation to cheering that was required at any given moment. It was relatively seamless then, when she turned a level gaze on Eva and spoke more practically. So why do you care what Mr Galpin's opinion is of you? Logically it shouldn't matter. You likely won't ever see him again. Eva leaned over a little, not wishing to meet Kitty's eye. With one finger she traced the curlicue pattern of stitching on her bedspread. That's not entirely true, she admitted quietly. What do you mean? Which part isn't true? Kitty demanded. I shall be seeing him again. I imagine we all shall. He is invited to demonstrate at the Duke's ball, Eva said, glancing up once. Oh, yes, I remember. You were supposed to dance with him there, yes. Oh, oh, I see. Yes, that does present a bit of a problem. Kitty's face creased a little as she thought. I just don't know if I can bear to see him after the display this afternoon, Eva said, still looking down at her bed. You still haven't answered the question as to why it matters so much to you, Kitty reminded her. There followed a few beats of silence. Eva half hoped that Kitty would become bored and forget what they were discussing, but to no avail. Realising that she wouldn't be fobbed off so easily, Eva sighed. I just want him to think ill of me is all, she said unconvincingly. She felt the bed shift a little as Kitty folded her arms and pursed her lips at her. Oh, very well, Eva said, flopping backward again. I suppose you might say that. It may be entirely possible that I may have formed the slightest, most inconsequential attachment to him, she admitted at last, dragging her words out reluctantly. In the manner of a condescending governess, Kitty reached over and patted Ava's hand comfortingly. There, that wasn't so very difficult, was it? Eva's head rolled so that she could glare up at Kitty. You already knew, she said, less of a question and more of an accusation. 
Of course I knew, Kitty said offhandedly, as if discussing the weather. How long have I known you? Give me some credit. Fair enough, Ava grumped. And now this is the part where you tell me I'm being foolish, throwing away my chances and so forth. Kitty looked surprisingly thoughtful. No, I don't think I will. As long as I've known you, you've hardly formed an attachment to anyone. The fact that you have done so now is surely significant. So should I attempt to set things right with Mr Galpin then? Laughing gently, Kitty patted Eva's hand again. Oh, Eva, darling Eva, was that ever really in question? You are single-minded when the fancy strikes you. I expect there isn't a man alive who could resist your charms when you are decided. Eva smiled and squeezed Kitty's fingers. There is still an even greater problem to surmount. Your mother? Kitty asked, clearly knowing the answer full well. She was very eager to show me a letter that arrived this afternoon, confirming that Lady Cluet and her son are anxiously awaiting the chance to become better acquainted at the Duke's ball. Eva reached up and scrubbed her face with her hands. I have no idea how I will begin to make this come off. Hmm, Kitty agreed. Abruptly, she leaned over Eva, quirking her brows. Tell me about the lucky Mr. Cluet. Oh, you know the type, Eva said, waving her off. Big, burly specimen. Handsome enough in a rustic sort of way. Likely a Highlander or two in his family tree, I'd wager. Far too nice for his own good, or mine for that matter, she added. I am generally opposed to eating off someone else's plate, but I must admit that I am sorely tempted in this case, Kitty said with a coy little smile. Eva sat up so suddenly that her head nearly collided with Kitty's. Kitty, I think you may be in great danger of being a genius, she said, her eyes darting back and forth as she thought. Her mind was working quickly, putting pieces of a puzzle together. Slowly, her gaze lifted, and she looked at Kitty, who wore an expectant expression. I think we have a chance to both get what we want, if we are clever. Is there really any doubt of that? Kitty asked rhetorically. Chapter 26 The Duchess of Brandon was quickly gaining a reputation as a leader of society. This was a bit of a surprise, given her somewhat unusual origins. But once the Tun realised that she fully intended to throw the best parties, host the most interesting salons, and serve the best food, they were quick to get over much of their snobbery. This ball was no exception. Though the season had technically started earlier, the Duchess Ball was generally acknowledged as the true start of the season. This was in full accordance with the weather, as the season did not really take hold until the roads were safer to travel. Ava was not wholly sure what to expect, but it certainly wasn't what greeted her when she was admitted through the foyer and into the Duke's palatial London home. There were candles everywhere, in golden candlesticks and gleaming chandeliers, shining brightly in seeming defiance of the winter chill. The glow could even be seen from the street, light pouring out the door that was thrown open wide to greet guests and to give a tantalising glimpse to those poor souls not invited. Rather than a proper supper, the Duchess seemed intent on encouraging conversation and mobility. In nearly every room there were tables laden with food, glistening candied fruits, buns and dainties of every description, sugar sculptures, fragrant sliced meats, even a pair of pineapples. Footmen circulated with trays of champagne glasses with little bowls of strawberries and raspberries in the centre so that guests could drop them into their drink. Adding to the ambience was the subtle aroma of evergreen, courtesy of pine needles scattered on the tables and underfoot. It was almost an assault on the senses of the most pleasurable kind. When Ava entered, it took her several moments to adjust to the sights, smells and sounds. Everyone seemed in the highest of spirits, and the revelry was well underway by the time that she and Kitty arrived, chaperones naturally by Lady Stanton. Did you ever see anything like this? Eva breathed to Kitty, who shook her head, her own eyes sparkling at the spectacle of it all. They slid out of their evening cloaks dumbly, the maids removing them deftly. Lady Stanton, however, was not having any of it. It's bordering on the vulgar, she sniffed. 
She had not overcome the notion that the new Duchess was not a real lady, no matter who her natural parents were. Of course, her prejudice did not extend so far as to reject such a coveted invitation, especially if it meant that she might eat and drink as much as she liked without paying a penny for any of it. She set off after a footman with champagne glasses immediately, clearly forgetting about her duties as a chaperone. Look, Kitty hissed, nudging Eva with her elbow. Isn't that Edmund Keane? Eva, her own agenda quickly forgotten, swung her head around to ogle the celebrated actor. Oh, he's so handsome. His eyes are said to hypnotise anyone who speaks with him. I can believe it, Eva murmured, observing the gaggle of admirers that had clustered about him. Mama was furious that she was turned away from seats at Drury Lane to see him. Kitty giggled, and now here we are, watching him eat sweetmeats. The famous Mr. Keane was not the only artist in attendance. Everywhere they turned, they saw notable painters, poets and dramatists. It was not only celebrated men either, Ava noticed, spotting Miss Sharples and her mother, her trademark playful smile giving her away. Now, Kitty, Eva began noticing that Kitty's eyes were gradually taking on that faraway, glazed look that came over her whenever there were pretty dresses and pretty men on display. Don't lose sight of our mission tonight, I am relying on you. What? Yes, of course you can rely on me, Kitty said, all distraction as she spied a bevy of young bucks standing in the corner. Immediately she had her fan whipped out and was fluttering it demurely in their direction. Eva sighed and hooking her arm through Kitty's, and began dragging her away in the direction of the ballroom. They made a brief detour to the table lined with dance cards which they slipped over their wrists. Kitty was already busy trying to establish how many dances she might have spaces for, but Eva kept her head on the swivel, surveying the crowd for a totally different reason. With luck, she would be able to find a spare few moments to speak with Mr Galpin before. Darling Ava, there you are! Lady Stanton cried at a volume that caused those in the immediate vicinity to turn and stare. Eva fought the urge to blush but did allow herself to widen her eyes, hoping that her mother would catch the silent message. She did not, for she continued in loud, plummy tones. Look at who I have found, Lady Cluette, our new friend. And look who is with her, her charming son, Eva half expected her mother to flourish her arms like a showman presenting some new spectacle. Oh my, Kitty muttered from behind her fan, so low that only Eva could hear her. She clearly had caught sight of the strapping Mr. Cluett, who seemed to be doing his best to make himself as small as possible, especially when eyes were turned on him. Eva subtly dug an elbow into Kitty's side, then turned the full force of her personality on Mr. Cluett hoping that perhaps he might simply shrink away from the attention. How lovely to see you both again, she said, forcing the words out between her teeth as she smiled. May I present my dearest friend, Miss Kitty Johnson? Kitty, dear, this is Lady Cluette, the wife of Viscount Cluette, and their son. There was a round of bows and curtsies, followed by a strained silence as conversation flowed all about them. Ava, meanwhile, determinedly kept smiling, which she suspected might be bordering on the maniacal. Lady Cluette, too, seemed to be feeling the strain, for she was fanning herself more and more rapidly. Lady Stanton politely coughed behind her hand and tilted her head in Eva's direction. Having evidently grown exasperated, Lady Cluette not too subtly nudged Mr. Cluett forward. What charming dance cards, she said, still fanning. That will make a delightful keepsake for all the young ladies. Oh, yes, Lady Stanton agreed, nodding her head authoritatively. I found them to be just so, especially as I entered my married years. Don't you find that dancing is a most amiable way of passing the time? She asked, turning her attention to Mr. Cluett, who looked vaguely panicked at being noticed. Never cared much for dancing myself, he offered, which almost made Eva smile for real. Not particularly good at it either, he added. Lady Stanton's smile tightened, and Ava got the sense that Lady Cluett was at the point of letting her head drop into her hand. Well, that's perfect then, Lady Stanton said, 
clearly trying desperately to salvage the situation. Ava has become quite the expert at dancing these last weeks. She's had lessons from the famed Mr. Galpin. Mr. Galpin indeed, Lady Cluett said, clearly impressed. She turned an assessing eye on Eva, and more subtly Lady Stanton, as if reconsidering their suitability. He's quite the talent, I understand. So you see, you would make a perfect match on the dance floor, Lady Stanton continued, nodding. Eva, meanwhile, wanted nothing more than to roll her eyes at her mother's obvious manoeuvring. And you must have two dances, she added hurriedly, so that you might take full advantage of Eva's expertise. Mr. Cluet, looking well and truly trapped, looked helplessly to Eva, Kitty, and back to Eva again. If the first two dances have not been claimed yet, I would be glad to have them, Lady Eva, he said at last, with as much enthusiasm as a man that was about to mend a carriage wheel. But only if you wish me to. Eva somehow resisted the urge to sigh heavily. Despite her misgivings, the fact that he had asked for her permission was not lost on her. I would be honoured, Mr. Cluett, she responded dully, contrasting sharply with her smile that she refused to let budge. Obligingly, she raised her hand so that Mr. Cluett might scribble his name on the first two lines on the card that dangled from her wrist. The evening was off to a less than spectacular start for Eva. She was being forced to dance with a man that looked as apprehensive as she felt at the prospect, and she had yet to lay eyes on Mr. Galpin. More and more of a crowd was pouring into the ballroom, and the musicians who had been picking out a quiet air struck a couple of sharp notes, calling the assemble to order. Obligingly, they pressed to the outer edges of the dance floor. Eva, meanwhile, was craning her neck around, trying her best to spot Josiah. She'd had no luck so far, and it seemed that her time had run out. The Duke and Duchess, hand in hand, proceeded to the centre of the dance floor. The first dance was to begin imminently, and there would be no getting out of it, no avoiding it for Eva. She could feel her heart and stomach dropping simultaneously at the realisation. She glanced sidelong up at Mr. Cluet, who gave her a grim smile, commiserating in her evident reticence. Well, at least I can be sure that we are equally miserable. She groused inwardly as he offered his hand, and she placed hers atop so that he might lead them out to their place on the dance floor. I suppose that's at least one thing we have in common. The couples waited, some eager and clinging to each other's arms as the Duchess consulted with the Duke. It was up to her to announce the first dance of the evening and to open the ball accordingly. It would set the tone for the rest of the evening, and the audience watched with bated breath. The Duke leaned close to the Duchess, who spoke smilingly into his ear, and made him laugh. It made Eva's heart squeeze to see such marital bliss before her, especially when contrasted with the prospective husband at her side. The ship's cook, the Duchess called, and after a surprised moment of silence the guests obligingly applauded. It was a rousing almost country dance, an unexpected choice for a Duchess. But then, the ton was coming to expect the unexpected from her. Ava exhaled then attempted to put on a brave face. She and Mr. Cluett took their places among the assembled, and as she looked across at him, she couldn't help but feel a resigned kind of defeat. Mr. Cluett, bless, attempted a winning smile, but Ava could nearly see the nervous sweat breaking out on his forehead. The musicians lifted their instruments, ready to begin. Ava attempted to loosen her shoulders, relieving her tense posture. Mentally, she was preparing for the first steps of the dance, which were a sort of sideways galloping with one's partner. Idly, Ava wondered if Mr. Cluet would recover from having to hold her hands and dance, or if he'd take them both down in a great heap after tripping. Thus, Ava was lost in thought, and not paying attention to what was happening about her. She did not know what compelled her to look about the ballroom again, but the moment she did, she beheld Josiah, standing among the crowd thronging around the edges of the dance floor. He was staring right back at her, gleaming and elegant in his black tails and white waistcoat. Eva nearly broke into a relieved, eager smile when she saw him, but her heart was falling right back down in the next moment. Standing beside him, one hand proprietarily on his bent elbow, was Beatrice. 
She stared at Eva for a moment, and with a cat-like expression of having been at the cream, she placed her other hand on his elbow, possessive and triumphant. Chapter 27 For all of her feelings of superiority about dancing, it was Ava who nearly sent everyone toppling. Her feet felt glued to the floor for a moment as the music started, her eyes riveted to Beatrice on Josiah's arm. It was Mr. Cluett who had taken her hands, urging her onward that finally got her to move. Her body fell into the familiar rhythm, automatically carrying her along as her mind reeled. There was no real reason for her to be as stricken as she was. There was nothing inherently wrong with what Beatrice was doing. It would, in fact, be considered perfectly reasonable, given her injury. Still, there was something in her pointed cat's grin that unsettled Eva. Mentally, she shook herself, trying to focus on what was happening. Mr. Cluett, galumphing along as best he could, was looking at her with concern in his eyes. Eva, aware that more than his eyes were on her, threw back her shoulders, lifted her head and put on her most dazzling smile again. This only seemed to discombobulate Mr. Cluett further, who blinked at her in some kind of alarm. It was only when Eva had come back to herself that she realised, much to her dismay, that Mr. Cluett hadn't been speaking with false modesty regarding his dancing abilities. He was, in a word, hapless. Eva doubted that he could have found the tempo of a ticking clock, much less a song as rousing as ship's cook. It was also clear that he was not familiar with the steps, always at least a pace behind everyone else. It put Eva in the position of having to subtly lead him, which was frankly just embarrassing. Even so, Eva felt no contempt for him. He had clearly been thrust into a situation that he had not desired, possibly even as much as she herself had been. Her heart went out to him, especially as he tried to give her an earnest smile. It was clear why as Eva promenaded around him. Their mothers were both staring hard at them, willing both of them into compliance. In the spirit of keeping up appearances, Ava shouted over the music, How do you find London this season, Mr. Cluett? This proved to be a near-fatal mistake, as this clearly broke his concentration. He looked up at her, and almost froze on the spot as he tried to keep up with her. I'm... It's thoroughly tolerable, I suppose, he answered wanly. Eva kept her own counsel for the rest of the song. When it concluded... The dancers and spectators applauded briefly and waited amid excited murmurs for the next song to begin. It was announced to be the hole in the wall to much excitement. Ava allowed herself to close her eyes just a bit too long to be blinking. When she opened them again, she saw Mr. Cluett already staring down at her feet. Here, Ava said, stepping forward so she could be heard more easily over the din. Don't look down at my feet. Keep your head up, and the rest of you will follow. Mr. Cluett nodded, obediently keeping his eyes on her face. The dancing began, and Eva felt a rush of sympathy for Mr. Cluett. He was doing his level best, but Eva had danced with a true master. Anyone would fall short. I'm not a fool, Mr. Cluett said abruptly as he held her hand aloft, along her to pass beneath. Whatever do you mean? Eva asked, surprised. I know I seem like a country clodhopper, especially to someone as cultured and talented as you, he continued, but this just, I don't fit in here. Eva nearly laughed out loud, but settled on smiling gently at him, genuinely this time. You might not believe it, but I don't particularly feel that I fit in here either, not any more. Mr. Cluett bobbled his head around, agreeing. Can see that. You need someone who can keep up with you. Not sure that's me. You shouldn't have to try, Ava replied softly. But we seem to be a little trapped, don't we? Mr. Cluett had nothing to say to that, but Ava could see his shoulders fall a bit. Again, she couldn't help but feel pity for him. They were alike in this way, at least, but Ava really did not think that this was a proper foundation for a marriage. A lifelong commitment. The musicians played on and Ava continued trying to guide Mr. Cluett around, all the while keeping up the appearance of being unbothered. If she were to look as troubled as she actually felt, 
there would scarcely be a soul in the ballroom who didn't suspect that something was amiss. Lady Stanton, for all her faults, had also grown to have quite a sixth sense when it came to her daughter's plots, which Eva was well aware of. If Eva was being honest, she also wanted Mr Galpin to see her and think her lovely, irresistibly charming even. She wanted to appear to be the sort of woman that any man would count himself lucky to keep company with. She did not look to where he had been standing last, but she fancied that she could still feel his eyes on her. The song came to an end, and as she and Mr Cluett made their closing bows, Ava allowed herself one furtive glance to where Josiah and Beatrice had been standing. They were not there now, and before she could stop herself, her eyes darted about in an effort to locate them. Mr. Cluett cleared his throat, and with barely a look to him, she automatically put her arm through his and allowed him to escort her back to her mother. Ah, here they are, Lady Stanton said, beaming at Eva on the arm of Mr. Cluett. Don't they make a handsome pair on the dance floor? She asked Lady Cluett, who wisely kept her own counsel. Eva released Mr. Cluett, who stood with his arms hanging loosely, like he couldn't figure out what to do with his hands. She couldn't resist allowing herself another scan of the crowd, craning her neck. Lady Stanton, her voice tight, asked with false cheerfulness, Is something amiss, Eva dear? No, not at all, mother, Eva replied hastily. I was simply hoping to catch another glimpse of the Duchess Brandon. I was hoping to discover who her modiste is. Don't you find her dress charming? Lady Stanton made a sound between a cough and a laugh. The Duchess and modistes was a loaded topic, one which she couldn't help but rise to the bait of. You mean if she hasn't made it herself, she said with a snobbish toss of her head. And just like that they were lost in discussion regarding the Duchess's story her taste in entertainment, the quality of her cook. No aspect was left undissected, and Ava found it easy to slip into the background. Kitty, meanwhile, had found one handsome young man to swing her about the dance floor after another, and was looking quite content. Eva envied her easy happiness. As she watched the couples glide by, forming patterns, skipping in circles, breaking apart again, Ava had a vision of her future if she did not act. She would smile and be polite, doing and saying what was correct, until there was simply nothing left inside her anymore. It would be a slow, agonising, spiritual death. It all played out before her as if it had already happened, the world fading to muted, dull colours as if it were already complete. But then, she realised that it was not simply the edges of her imagination going dark. It was actually getting darker in the ballroom. Footmen were deftly slipping through the crowd, quietly snuffing candles here and there so that most of the light in the room was coming from the massive chandelier hung over the dance floor. It happened so gradually that no one realised how dark it was until the edges of the ballroom were bathed in shadows. In contrast, the gold and crystal chandelier shone brilliantly, shining out like a miniature sun caught and hung from the ceiling. The musicians abruptly stopped playing, and the Duke stepped forward at the head of the dance floor. An anxious, excited murmur had begun to circulate around the ballroom, punctuated by an occasional squeal as some took advantage of the low lighting to sneak a quick squeeze of the hand. He raised his hands, lowering them slowly with his palms facing the floor, signalling for quiet. My lords, ladies and gentlemen, he called, his voice ringing out. Lord and Lady Chester, those committed patrons of the arts and London's newest shining lights of the ton, have decided to present you all with a gift tonight. Another murmur swept through the crowd like a wave. As they are committed to being at the forefront of fashion and taste, they have elected to bring us the very latest in dances from the fashionable capitals of Europe. May I present the celebrated Mr Galpin and his troupe, who will demonstrate the very last word in modern dancing, the new German waltz. A small outcry met the last of that announcement. The younger people were thrilled, while the older, stodgier persons in attendance were dutifully outraged. The Duke did not seem particularly bothered by any of this, and he stepped back, gesturing with one broad sweep of his arm. Mr Galpin, hidden in the shadows, took his cue and stepped forward. 
He bowed to the assembled gracefully, one hand on his hip. His calf turned out exactly so. It was a posture that would have been at home at the former French court in decades gone by. Behind him, hands twisted together nervously, was a young girl with ash-blonde hair. Josiah paused, clearly expecting her to join him, but she remained frozen in place. Ava could see his shoulders tense, his jaw clenching. Unconsciously, she had stepped forward so that she was now in front of her party. She was staring at Josiah down the dance floor, and it was as if nothing else in the world existed. She could hear her own breath, her heart beating loudly in her ears, willing him to look at her, to see her. Eva continued to stare at Josiah, pulled toward him by some cosmic force that she could neither deny nor understand. And then his grey eyes found hers and she knew that she was lost. Chapter 28 The seconds that ticked by after Josiah had stepped forward were absolutely agonising. He had worried that something like this might happen. Lily was young, barely seventeen winters and still held by the shackles of polite society. It was one thing entirely for her to dance for the relatively egalitarian audience at the theatre, another thing entirely to perform for so many of the great and good at such close range. She was frozen like a deer, unwilling to step forward. Josiah was attempting to formulate a dozen different solutions at once that would not look awkward or unrehearsed while maintaining his poised facade when he spotted Ava at the far end of the ballroom. She stood at the edge of the ring of light on the dance floor, wearing the white that all young ladies wore at balls, but she seemed lit from within somehow. Her dress was daringly cut, the bodice fitted and moulded with pleats, and a plunging neckline that was filled in with a spray of lace and feathers. She wore a gold filament headpiece that gave her the effect of a halo, some kind of solar goddess come down to earth to witness mortal revels. She was staring at him, a raw expression on her face, her eyes glistening with some mercurial emotion. Automatically, he turned to face her a little more fully, unable to look away from her. He could feel the moment that she saw him looking at her, for her lips parted slightly, and the ghost of a sad smile curved her perfect lips. Like a bolt of lightning, Josiah saw what should be done, how he could save the performance and steal a few precious moments with Eva. Despite everything, Whatever her mother said, there was no denying the manner in which she looked at Josiah. He lifted his head a fraction and gave a minute nod, hoping that she would see it. Straightening his spine, he assumed the opening posture of the waltz, as if his arms were around an invisible partner. Ava, still watching him, tilted her own head curiously, her eyes narrowing for just a moment before realisation dawned. She gave her own nod of understanding. Josiah felt relief wash over him as if poured from a pitcher, but did not linger. He had to focus now. Alone, in the strange silence of the ballroom, Josiah began to dance. Every eye in the ballroom was on him, the only sound the soft steps of his own feet. The demonstration was precariously balancing on a knife's edge. One side brilliance, the other. Total failure. As he turned, he caught Eva's eye again and saw understanding dawn. It was her turn now. She did not hesitate. And if Josiah had not been in love with her before, he most certainly was now. She slipped onto the dance floor, her head held high and eyes hooded in the perfect marriage of bliss and confidence. There was another murmur from the ton, especially as she too began to dance as if with an invisible partner. It was not only an aesthetic choice, but this allowed the ton to see the exact steps and postures required of the dance. On opposite ends of the dance floor, Josiah and Eva danced, turning, hands reaching, arms stretching overhead, separate but together, one facing east, the other west. The musicians, clearly caught off guard, neglected their instruments, adding to the eerie atmosphere. It was almost like watching two ghosts dancing in silence. Closer and closer they twirled, Josiah keeping a practised eye on Eva. He hoped and prayed that the musicians would catch on to what was happening. Miraculously, Josiah was not disappointed. 
At the exact moment that they finally met exactly in the centre of the ballroom, their hands touched, and the musicians began to play. The audience let out a collective sigh, murmuring their approval at the spectacle of it all. Though it was improper to stare at one's partner continuously while dancing, Josiah found that he could not stop himself from staring down into Eva's eyes. In them, the glittering light from the chandelier reflected as if she were made of stars. She smiled openly up at him, rapturous wonder on her face. His own mask of professional detachment slipped, and he could not resist smiling back down at her. To most of those watching, it would have appeared that they were simply full of the joys of the new dance, which had a gliding hypnotic tempo and step. With great enthusiasm, he swept Eva along with him, her willingness and ease to follow only making his heart swell further. It was a perfect moment of perfect grace, and Josiah willed it never to end. Time stops for no man, no matter how much he longs for it to obey him. The last strains of the music began to die away, and he was left facing Eva, hands still clasped. There was another profound silence, and with great reluctance they released each other. He forced himself to step back, feeling like he was letting a piece of himself go in the process. Blinking, he stepped back again, putting a respectable distance between the two of them. The silence stretched, and Josiah slowly came back to the reality of the situation. He had a duty to his dancers and to the audience. Tearing his gaze away from Eva, he turned and held out an arm. Taking her cue, Eva dropped a deep, tidy curtsy. Josiah bowed in turn, still trying to clear his vision. He felt almost like he had been staring into the sun itself. The crowd reacted at last, Lord Chester being the first to begin applauding with gusto. The others around him, including the Duke and Duchess, followed suit, until the entire ballroom was awash with applause. As it built to a crescendo, Josiah allowed himself a sigh of relief. He turned again to Ava, who looked stunned and gratified at the praise of the audience. Josiah smiled at her again, fond and proud. She had done well and he understood better than anyone how intoxicating the applause was. He had never seen her look so alive, glowing beneath the low lights. The moment was bittersweet, however, for it was a stolen fantasy. Reality was catching back up with him, the dream fading as the footman began relighting the tapers in the ballroom. Josiah finally broke away from Eva, nodding to the other dancers of his troupe that had accompanied him. Their job was to circulate around, and to answer questions about the new dance, and more importantly, to gently encourage the guests to take lessons. When he turned back to Eva, her mother had stepped forward and laid a possessive hand on her arm. Eva, dear, Lady Stanton said tightly, a false smile stretching her face almost grotesquely, I had no idea that you'd learned such modern dancing. Oh, mother, Eva said her voice cracking on something that was neither a sob nor a laugh. She too smiled winningly, unwilling to have the light of her triumph dimmed so easily. You know me, I love to be the most modish girl in the room. There was another lady near them that Josiah did not recognise, who surveyed him shrewdly. He could almost feel her eyes weighing him from head to foot, but he refused to be cowed. You certainly have a sprightly step on the dance floor, young man. I'll give you that, she said at last, grudgingly. Colour rose a little on Eva's cheeks, and the light in her eyes was banked a little. Josiah frowned at the change, but forced himself into a neutral expression. I am glad you found it pleasing, he said with another small bow in her direction. The lady in question lifted her chin and an eyebrow simultaneously, as if to say... I did not say I was pleased, did I? Eva, meanwhile, was busy looking between the lady and Josiah, uneasy. The lady gestured behind her, and a great hulk of a man stepped forward, dutifully taking his place next to the lady. It was the same young man that Eva had been dancing with previously, though Josiah was loath to use that word to describe the way in which he had been flopping about the dance floor. With the disparity in size between the lady and the young man, Josiah couldn't help but be reminded of a spectacle he had seen in the Russian Empire, 
wherein a lady walked a bear on a leash. May I present Mr. Josiah Galpin? Mr. Galpin, this is Lady Cluette, and her son, Mr. Cluette, Eva said, her face and voice growing duller and duller with each word. Lady Eva has been spending many happy hours with Mr. Cluett these past few days, have you not? Lady Stanton asked, her face hard as she stared significantly at Josiah. Ah, there you are, darling Josiah, a voice purred from behind him. Automatically, he felt his jaw clench, his teeth on edge. No good can come of this, his mind warned. He feared that this would be borne out, as Beatrice, forcing herself to walk as elegantly as possible on her injured leg, took her place next to Josiah. There was no missing the sharp, pointed smile that she gave to everyone assembled, her green eyes narrowing as if she had just sighted some easy prey. Ladies, sir, may I present Miss Beatrice Hart, Josiah said flatly. She is the principal female lead in my company of dancers, he added, perfunctory. Why, if it isn't Lady Cluett, Beatrice said, all congeniality and sugary smiles. I've had the pleasure of meeting your husband, the Viscount Cluett at the theatre. Lady Cluett visibly stiffened at the implication. He's always had a taste for the local wildlife. He's an adventurous traveller, she shot back, whipping out a fan and fluttering it rapidly. Josiah closed his eyes, hoping that Beatrice wouldn't say anything else sharp. But he knew that this was a pointless prayer. His stomach was about level with his feet when he heard Beatrice laugh, a light and easy sound that he knew concealed a cutting edge. She was mad, and there was no telling what she might do when she lashed out. And here is Lady Stanton again, always a delight to find oneself in your interesting company, Beatrice cooed. Ah, and your lovely daughter. She is truly an ornament to make any occasion sparkle. Josiah's eyes shot open, and without thinking, he snapped his head to give Beatrice a warning glance. She ignored him, instead sliding her arm proprietarily through Josiah's, causing him to wince internally. Lady Ava's eyes watched the motion, but she said nothing. I was saying just this very thing to my dear Josiah, Beatrice said, looking up adoringly at him again. Her phrasing could not have been more obvious. Everyone there would surely think that they had formed an attachment. Why, Lady Eva is such a darling creature that she made even backstage at the theatre shine like a palace. Beatrice, Josiah warned, but it was too late. That was so long ago I'm surprised you remember, he said pointedly. You remember, Lady Stanton, when you engaged me for lessons with Lady Eva? Lady Stanton's eyes were busy shifting from Eva to Josiah to Beatrice and back again. Josiah put his hand over Beatrice's, which made Eva's face fall. However, it was purely to disguise the fact that he was squeezing her fingers in an attempt to convey his displeasure. Oh, Josiah, you really are entering your dotage if you don't remember Lady Eva's second tour of the theatre. It was all that Mr. Knott spoke about for weeks. She was the highlight of his year as far as he was concerned. Beatrice laughed, playfully batting Josiah on the arm with her free hand. Second tour? Lady Stanton asked with narrowed eyes. Josiah had once seen a chicken puff itself up before pecking a snake to death, and that was precisely what Lady Stanton looked akin to. Yes. You remember, Mother, when Miss Johnson and I were doing our charitable visits? Eva jumped in touching her mother's arm and wordlessly tilting her head slightly in the direction of Lady Cluette. Ah, oh, what a clever thing, Josiah thought a little gleefully. Eva was using her mother's one weakness to prevent an ugly scene, the loss of their one asset, Eva's reputation. Lady Stanton, for all of her bluster, caught on quickly and smiled benignly at Beatrice. Oh, of course, you simply must forgive me. Lady Ava has so many charitable endeavours that it is difficult for one to keep track of them. Yes, I recall seeing many unfortunates there when we saw a performance, and Lady Eva really does have a tender heart, always believing the best in people. Lady Stanton gushed, speaking half to Lady Cluett, half to Beatrice. Oh dear Eva, you seem to have torn your hem a little. Shall we find the dressing room to have it mended? Without waiting for an answer, Lady Stanton had seized Eva by the arm and was dragging her away. 
Lady Cluet hesitated a moment, then turned to her son. Come, dear heart, I am rather parched. Let us find the lemonade. Obediently, the son turned to follow her away, but not before giving Josiah a thoughtful, slightly melancholy look. Josiah was ready to run after Eva, consequences be damned. He simply refused to go the rest of his life without experiencing what he had on that dance floor ever again. Before he could take a step, he was pulled sharply back by the elbow. Let her go, Beatrice said, disdain dripping from her voice. She just doesn't belong in our world. Her mother is going to tear her to strips just for setting foot in a theatre's backstage. And whose fault is that? Josiah snapped, trying to wriggle free. Vaguely he was aware that he was beginning to draw attention from those around him. Fine, Beatrice hissed. Blame me for that if you wish, but it would have happened sooner or later. Josiah, look at me, Beatrice said, coming to stand before him. She took him by both arms, forcing him to make eye contact. You are chasing a dream. She is of no more substance than a puff of smoke. You want to take her and mould her to your life, when you don't even know if she wants to give up her own life. She has a young nobleman wriggling on her hook. Why would she give that up? Beatrice's voice softened, which was somehow all the more disquieting. It was like when a cat rolled over to show its belly and beg for pats but waiting with shining claws to pounce at the first fool who tried. She tightened her grip on Josiah's arms, keeping him stationary. Listen, she said earnestly. You have something real right in front of you, you have for years, and you have not even noticed it. I am already part of this world. I've already made my choice years ago. I won't carry regrets into your life. There is a much easier choice one that will do nothing but make your life simpler. Josiah stared down at Beatrice, certain that he could not be hearing her correctly. What of your cherished independence? Are you willing to give it up for sentimental reasons? After all of those years of decrying those other... Beatrice laughed mirthlessly. Oh, please, no. Can you imagine me a victim of sensibility? No, not even for you, Josiah. I am speaking practically. We will not be young forever. I can help you, and you will provide me security. It will be neat and tidy, exceedingly practical. As if sensing his hesitation and distaste, Beatrice leaned in closer. Do you think you are better than her? She's making the same choice right now. Safety and security. Josiah stared down at Beatrice, unable to move or speak. Her words made sense and rang true to him, in a way. Perhaps he had been a fool. Perhaps he should not have hoped for so much. Perhaps. Chapter 29 There had been a floorboard that creaked in one particular spot in the parlour for as long as Eva could remember. She'd gotten into the habit of skipping or hopping over it as a young girl until her governess had wrapped her on the knuckles for such undignified behaviour. Even so, Ava had never stopped her habit completely. She still took a longer step over it. It was at this floorboard that Eva stared as Lady Stanton paced across the floor. Eva could time when her mother would make the floor squeak down to the second, and mentally counted them down. Five, four, three, two, and squeak. It helped to keep her mind occupied. They had left the ball relatively early though the hour was still quite late for those that did not keep London hours as they were known. Lady Stanton had clearly been hoping to avoid more of a scene, which was threatening to disrupt all of her carefully laid plans. She was so incensed that she had not even allowed Eva to change yet, even though she was in her best gown, and it was in great danger of becoming creased. She had been all but flung onto the settee by Lady Stanton, who alternately paced, glowered and lectured. Do you have any idea how close to the edge you came tonight? It was bad enough having to explain that. That vulgar, tawdry display of... Of is that even dancing? Lady Stanton demanded, stopping her pacing to stare down at Eva with hands on hips. You know very well it is, Mother, Eva answered tiredly. It was manageable. Everything was manageable. But so help me, Eva, if this latest tomfoolery of yours has jeopardised your chances with Mr. Cluet. 
Lady Stanton paused, letting the implied threat hang in the air. It was as if she were expecting Eva to put up some argument, protest in some way, but she did not. She merely sat and stared dully at the floor. We must move quickly, Lady Stanton said, changing tack and resuming her pacing. We must, Eva asked, lifting her eyes, before any rumours can begin circulating. Your reputation already hangs by a thread and it is all that you have to trade on. Your dowry is a pittance at this stage. Your settlement won't even have a dress allowance for you. No pin money either. Eva sighed but did not object. She was suddenly very, very tired, too tired to mount a defence. As you say, mother, she said quietly. Lady Stanton whirled, clearly anticipating that Eva had spoken in sarcasm. Eva's face was oddly blank, however, merely staring back at her. Lady Stanton's face was still suspicious, but she only harumphed a little in response. We will invite Mr. Cluett over tomorrow, Lady Stanton resumed, as if she had not been interrupted. I will leave him alone with you in the salon, and then we shall have him. Eva winced a little, both at the prospect that her freedom would be at an end as soon as tomorrow, and the way that her mother spoke as if they were going to net a prize cod. Lady Stanton noticed, and stopped her pacing to lean over Eva, bending slightly so that their faces were closer together. I won't have any histrionics or further mischief from you, Eva. I mean it. You've been allowed your head for far too long, and it is time that someone checks you. Do you understand? Do not fail me. Do not fail us tomorrow, Lady Stanton said, enunciating clearly. Yes, mother. Go to bed now, Lady Stanton instructed, straightening. We can't have you looking unwell for your future husband. Wordlessly, Ava stood up, ready to comply. It wasn't simply her impending engagement that had sapped the spirit from her, it was everything else too. It was the fact that she had a real taste of the sort of life she might lead, one in which she enjoyed freedom and art and dance, her body and spirit strong together, the audience's adoration, only to have it snatched away from her. That loss hurt almost as much as seeing Beatrice on Josiah's arm, the way that she had spoken about him, as if they... What meaning would that life have for you if it wasn't with Josiah? Eva's heart demanded as she began trudging heavily up the stairs. It took monumental effort to lift one of her legs after the other, her progress upstairs slow. It was the truth. It was only with Josiah that she had felt alive, her skin electrified, her heart full. Dancing was all well and good, but ultimately meaningless without the correct partner. Much as life is, I suppose, she thought bitterly. Eva! Lady Stanton stood downstairs, holding onto the railing as she peered up at Eva, some few stairs above her. Eva looked down at her, the perspective strange and confusing. For a moment, Ava could glimpse the sort of little girl that her mother would have been, demanding and impossible, but easily frightened and always in need of reassurance. Lady Stanton hesitated for a moment before demanding, Are you in love with him? Mr. Cluett, Ava asked, a little confused. No, the dancing master. That Mr. Galpin, Lady Stanton said, pulling a face as if the words were flavoured with vinegar. Ava looked away from her mother staring up the darkened stairway. They could not afford to light it, so Ava had to find her way by keeping tight hold of the banister. Upstairs was as black as pitch, the curtains drawn for the evening, and the maid not having gone up to light the solitary candle in Eva's room. Hanging on the wall of the stairs, portraits of ancestors seemed to sneer down from the gloom, displeased with Eva, the state of the house, or both. Does it matter now? Eva replied finally. Lady Stanton said nothing to that, and Eva continued her resolute march into the darkness. Eva could not remember falling asleep last night, and waking was a strange experience. She merely opened her eyes and was suddenly completely awake and aware. She laid in bed, staring up at the ceiling, her hands folded on top of the quilted bedspread. She stared up at the ceiling, hoping that if she laid perfectly still, she might simply vanish from existence. 
There was no such luck, however, for soon the maid was entering quietly, stirring up the fire and setting a cup of tea down on Lady Ava's dressing table. Mechanically, Ava rose, holding her arms out and allowing herself to be dressed as if she were a doll. The smell of the tea roused her a little when she lifted the cup. It was unexpectedly strong, given that Lady Stanton had insisted on serving weaker and weaker tea when not entertaining in an effort to cut down on costs. She had even taken to using the same leaves more than once, wringing every bit of flavour from them that she could. Eva drank appreciatively, savouring the fact that there was even a bit of milk in the cup. After she was clothed in a day dress of cream with a tiny blue flower print and her hair dressed, she descended the stairs on numb feet. Eva clung to the railing lest she take a tumble, an odd floating sensation taking hold of her entire body. It was as if she were on wheels and someone was simply pushing her along to the parlour as that was what was expected of her. The ground floor of the house had been transformed while she was sleeping. The surfaces gleamed as they hadn't for months, left to collect dust with a lack of servants. Now a girl with a white cap and apron was scurrying about, polishing everything furiously. Where shelves and mantles had been going bare, now a few knick-knacks were back in their places. There was even a vase with a few flowers on an end table. Unsettled, Eva continued to the parlour, where the shutters and curtains had been thrown open in defiance of Lady Stanton's fears that the sun would bleach the carpets and upholstery. Rugs, paintings, even candlesticks were back in their proper places. Walls and floors that had been bare now were comfortingly decorated again. A merry fire crackled in the little hearth. A small tea service awaited, along with a sideboard full of cakes and pastries. Though they had no doubt been bought in, they were arranged on platters and trays in such a way that they looked homemade. This gave the illusion that not only could they afford to keep a cook, they could afford a good cook. Ava wanted to laugh or cry. It was all set dressing, like the backgrounds at the theatre that looked like forests or Roman temples far away, but were really just smudges of paint on ripped canvas. Ava half fancied that if she blew hard enough, it would all float away on the wind like dandelion clocks in the spring. There you are, Lady Stanton said from behind Eva. Ava turned and blinked, not recognising her mother for a moment. She wore an apron, her skirt tucked up for scrubbing, and her sleeves rolled to her elbows like a washerwoman. Her hair was a mess, her cheeks ruddy, and there were tired hollows around her eyes. Don't stare, she snapped. Sit here, she said, guiding Eva to a seat that allowed her to be silhouetted by late morning light coming in from the windows. Eva merely stared up at Lady Stanton as she sat, who stood back and looked at her with pursed lips. Like a doll, her mother posed her exactly so, folding her hands demurely in her lap, crossing her legs at the ankles and tucking them beneath the chair. There, Lady Stanton pronounced, nodding satisfactorily. Now smile. We mustn't let Mr. Cluett think that he is marrying a sad, dour stick, no? Obediently, Eva smiled without showing her teeth, as was proper for a young lady. Lady Stanton jerked her head once in a sharp nod. She issued further instructions to Eva not to move, and she would greet Mr. Cluett when he arrived. Eva was not to say anything, give no sign, with the implication being that she might try some last-minute dramatics. Your only concern right now is to simply say yes, Lady Stanton instructed as she left the room. Despite admonitions not to move, Eva turned her head a little to watch her mother go. It was impossible not to see the tired stoop of her shoulders or the state of her hair and dress. It was enough to move Eva, even in her fog of depression. How could it not, when her mother was trying so hard and sacrificing so much to ensure her security? Despite her own pain, Eva found tears welling in her eyes, which she dabbed at delicately with the back of her fingers, refusing to let them fall. Perhaps I have merely been a selfish girl for too long, Eva thought willing her eyes to clear before anyone could see her in such a state. Minutes ticked by, the silence almost deafening, the four-hire scullery having been either dismissed or chased downstairs. It was an oppressive, heavy silence, which only highlighted the fact that this was Eva's life now. What else did she have to look forward to? She would marry, 
have children, and would be only known as a wife and mother from then on, her place determined by others. It's strange to think that one's fate can be decided with just a few short words, she mused absently. Out of habit, she reached up to toy with the golden sun charm that she customarily wore, only to find it missing. She frowned, then immediately reached up to smooth her face, willing the lines away. Though the room she was waiting in was at the rear of the house, she could still hear the front door being knocked on. Eva allowed her eyes to flutter closed, letting herself have this one moment before she had to perform the role assigned to her. What a jape, mother, Eva thought with a bitter smile. For all your worrying, I have become an actress anyway. There was a hesitation, and then more knocking on the door. To Eva, each rap sounded like a hammer driving home the nails in her coffin. Chapter 30 It was clear from the moment that Mr. Cluett was admitted into the Stanton home that the strategy was to overwhelm and discombobulate him. Eva could hear Lady Stanton keeping up a constant stream of inanities and platitudes, but didn't bother attempting to make out individual words. All of her energy was spent in keeping up her demure smile. We are really so glad that you could join us, Mr. Cluett. Lady Stanton said as she entered the parlour, holding Mr. Cluett by the elbow. I am only sorry that we had to cut our evening short last night. Well, the better said about that, the better, I suppose. But, well, it was very kind of you to accept our invitation. Twasn't any bother, Lady Stanton, I... He began, but was promptly cut off by more of Lady Stanton's gushing. Oh, what a charming young man you are. So polite and good-hearted to call on us like this. And look, here is my Eva. She was so eager to see you again, I simply had to send a note over right away, Lady Stanton said, smiling up at Mr. Cluett, her face hardening when she turned to look at Ava. Ava could not bring herself to respond, but smiled and ducked her head in a way that she assumed would be taken for bashful. Lady Stanton nearly pushed Mr. Cluett down into a chair, inviting him to sit and take tea with them. Mr. Cluett looked at Ava a little helplessly, which she studiously ignored. It was more difficult to ignore her mother's foot tapping on her own beneath the table, try as she might. Eva merely continued to pour the tea, a saintly expression on her face, as she offered a cup to her mother. Lady Stanton resorted to nudging Eva's shin with her toes. Resisting a sigh, Eva turned her attention to Mr. Cluett. How did you find the ball, Mr. Cluett? Eva asked, fluttering her eyelashes and smiling, feeling like an insipid fool. Crowded, he replied bluntly, and loud. Oh, I do agree, Mr. Cluett, Lady Stanton responded, seizing on his few words as if they were pearls of wisdom. So many people invited, scarcely any of them the right sort. I knew you were a man of discerning taste. Well, don't know a... Mr. Cluett began but once again found his words curtailed by Lady Stanton's interruption. I wondered about the new Duchess of Brandon, and I have tried to make allowances for her. One can't expect too much, really. But if last night is any indicator, I fear the ton shall be in great need of leaders of society with strong character and the correct friends, Lady Stanton said with all the authority of a vicar delivering a homily. The Duchess has always spoken kindly to me. Mr. Cluett offered. Sister too, Lady Chester. Pa, Lady Stanton said with a dismissive wave of her hand. Do not speak to me about Lady Chester or her husband for that matter. I thought they treated my Eva quite shabbily, though she won't hear a word against them. My Eva has always been a kind soul. Anyone would find her a friendly and loving companion. Eva wished very much that a hole would open up in the floor and simply swallow her up. Her mother was being so ridiculously overt that it was positively humiliating. Any hopes that she was harbouring that her attempts to paint Eva in the best light possible seemed to be backfiring, however, as Mr. Cluett only looked more and more panicked. Didn't know you were such a fine dancer, Lady Eva, Mr. Cluett said, nodding toward her. Heard you cut a dash on the dance floor, but had no idea you were... It was topping, really. You're very kind, Mr. Cluett. Eva replied softly, giving him a small, genuine smile. 
I imagine these newer dances would be seen as far too fast for anywhere outside of London, Lady Stanton said. I much prefer the older ones myself. Mother hoped I'd get a bit of London bronze. Why we came up, Mr. Cluett said, gingerly lifting his teacup, which looked positively absurd in his large hand. Thinks it will help when I join father on his ventures. Ah, so much to ask of a young man, Lady Stanton said, all sympathetic clucking. This is why it is so important to find a wife that will be a true helpmate, she continued, stirring her tea. Clearly, you need a wife that will help you navigate the social sphere so that you can concentrate on more important matters. Mr. Cluett bobbed his head in agreement. Exactly so, just what Mother advised. Ah, but the vagaries of the marriage market these days, Lady Stanton sighed, her shoulders falling as if filled with great tragedy. You wish to find a wife that would help you to rise in standing, and my Eva needs a husband who can help her to be more level, a calmer existence. Too much excitement is bad for young ladies, you know. Their humours can't take it. Mr. Cluett looked to Eva again, who stared back blandly. Lady Eva seems the picture of vitality, he said, nodding his head again. Seems to thrive at navigating the ballroom and salon, he added. Why, Mr. Cluett? Lady Stanton said, as if something were dawning on her at just that moment. I do believe you are right. My Eva could be of great help to you. She, me? Mr. Cluett asked, looking more panicked than ever. You said it yourself. Lady Stanton said, nodding sagely, like she was listening to a philosopher opine. She thrives in society and would suit you quite well. Yes, Mr. Cluett said, clearly sweating beneath his collar. Eva pitied him. Lady Stanton's face had taken on a fox-like cunning. He had no idea exactly how trapped he was, caught in a slowly tightening web of Lady Stanton's making. Be lucky to have a wife like her. Why, Mr. Cluett? Lady Stanton gasped, placing one hand on her chest. Are you offering for my daughter over tea? Of course she is most flattered by your proposal, aren't you, Eva? Most flattered, Eva echoed, not entirely confirming or denying. And she would of course be a fool not to accept, Lady Stanton pressed, staring hard at Eva. Eva knew that she was on thin ice, but still could not resist looking down at her hands in her lap for a moment. She was worried for a moment that she might burst into tears, but the impulse passed. Any woman would be lucky to have you for a husband, she answered at last. Oh, happy tidings indeed, Lady Stanton sang out. She stood from the table, hands clasped at her chest, and very likely genuine tears of relief in her eyes. She began bustling about, searching for pen and card so that she could begin spreading the news as soon as possible. No doubt that she had funded the decor and comestibles for the day on credit, trading on her name more than anything. If word got out that her daughter was betrothed to a man with standing, it would go far toward getting the creditors to treat her favourably. Eva watched all of this dispassionately, as if she were simply an observer to someone else's life. It wasn't even like she could truly be upset about developments. Mr. Cluett was amiable, handsome in a rugged sort of manner, and would provide security. To ask for more was to be greedy, really, when so many others would have traded places with her in a trice. Her eyes found Mr. Cluett's, and they shared a moment of clarity, both looking as stunned and miserable as the other felt. Lady Stanton, having forgotten Mr. Cluett for the moment, took him by the arm and bid him rise. Eva supposed that Lady Stanton wanted to usher him out of the house quickly before he had time to realise that he had been all but duped, or Eva recovered herself and protested. Eva did no such thing, however. She just stared down at her teacup, leaning over the table to see her reflection. As she watched the tiny mirror image of herself, the image was disturbed, waving and wrinkling, as a single fat tear plopped into the cup. Kitty Johnson knew that she was very likely in Lady Stanton's bad books. She didn't have any proof that any of Eva's late indiscretions had been at her urging, but Kitty had been part and parcel to nearly all of them. 
At the very least, she was guilty by proximity. It was surely tempting fate to turn up unannounced and likely pushing the limits of Lady Stanton's patience. Still, Kitty wasn't deterred. She was, above all, fiercely loyal to her friends, of which Ava was the best and longest held in her heart. Besides which, the business last night had unsettled her. Kitty liked to concern herself with things that were, well, unconcerning. Her life was untroubled, and that was the way that she preferred it. When those that were close to her were troubled, she felt it her personal life's mission to return them back to equanimity as quickly as possible. This was not selfishly done, but rather because she felt that her few intimates should feel at least as well as she. It had been particularly hard to watch Eva struggle these past months. She knew the business with Tom had troubled her. Kitty had simply accepted that it was what Eva had wanted at the time and had acted accordingly to protect her friend's interests. But that was nothing compared to the burden she now carried. It was a difficult thing for a daughter to carry the family's survival on her shoulders. Naturally, it also did not help that Eva was clearly in love with the dancing master. Kitty did not personally understand it, but that was neither here nor there. She preferred a man that was a little more earthy. She liked her men broad of shoulder, tall and strapping with kind faces, rather like... Mr. Cluet? Kitty asked. She and her maid had navigated the slick sidewalk nearly to the Stanton home and saw an impressive and familiar specimen of the male sort standing outside. He was looking a little gobsmacked holding his beaver-skin top hat in his hands. He turned to look at her when she said his name, his face lighting up with recognition. Miss, he asked, looking a little apologetic. Johnson, she supplied, jerking her head to her maid, who was already in the process of taking several steps back. Have you been calling on the Stantons, then? Mr. Cluett nodded, his shoulders slumping a little. You are her particular friend, aren't you? I am, Kitty confirmed. Something in his manner of standing and speaking had her narrowing her eyes, eyeing the front of the house suspiciously. Has something untoward occurred, Mr. Cluett? You seem positively rattled. Yes. That is, no, not exactly, he amended, consternation on his face. Lady Stanton seems to think might have gotten engaged this very afternoon, he said, his brow furrowed. Dash if I can figure it out, though. Engaged? Kitty's eyebrows flew up at that. Well, that is... Wait, do you mean to Lady Stanton or to Lady Eva? She asked, stepping closer. Mr. Cluett went white as a sheet, and Kitty nearly burst into laughter. You don't really think that she meant... No, no, at least I don't believe Lady Stanton would mean herself. Kitty reassured him, frowning just a little. I suppose I ought to congratulate you then, yes? A hapless sort of shrug was his answer. Mother will probably be pleased at least, he added, gazing thoughtfully down the street. I see, Kitty said quietly. She followed the direction of his gaze. Well, I had intended on calling on Lady Eva, but I suspect she will need a few moments to compose herself. Might you escort me to the lending library just down the way there? I do feel ever so better with male protection when walking down the street. Kitty smiled winningly. She always smiled winningly at Mr. Cluett, who could not resist grinning back and nodding his assent, slapping his hat back atop his head. They walked in silence for a moment or two before Kitty turned toward him. As you have said, I am Lady Eva's particular friend, she began, speaking clearly and gently. Bearing this in mind, do you suppose that I might presume upon this friendship with her to gain your confidence as well? Don't need to stand on ceremony, Mr. Cluett replied easily. You're a good sort. Anyone could see that. Kitty was momentarily taken aback. Why, Mr. Cluett, do you possess a discerning heart? Mr. Cluett duly blushed and shrugged his wide shoulders. Kitty fancied she could nearly hear the seams straining from the movement. Kitty couldn't help but laugh a little, which only made Mr. Cluett smile again. What a dear thing he is, she thought. All the worse that he is caught in one of Lady Stanton's schemes. 
So does this mean that I may ask you a question that borders on the impertinent? Kitty pressed. Mr. Cluett nodded his assent. She stopped walking, facing him fully now. He stopped immediately as well, turning to her with a questioning look. Do you wish to be engaged to Eva? That is, do you find this a state of affairs that pleases you? Mr. Cluett hesitated, clearly torn between his clear, natural inclination for honesty and what he was expected to say. His eyes wandered away as he thought and it was easy for Kitty to imagine that he had been chastised frequently as a boy for inattention. Kitty knew better. She could see that he simply considered everything most thoroughly before speaking. His gaze returned to Kitty, and she found a blush rising on her cheek. He opened his mouth to answer, and Kitty, for some reason she could not quite understand, was holding her breath. She even leaned in so that she might hear him better. Chapter 31 Given their strained, and even at one time antagonistic relationship, it was something of a surprise that Lady Patience Chester offered to host an engagement soiree for Lady Ava and her new fiancé. Whatever Lady Stanton's misgivings were about the woman that she considered to have stolen Eva's rightful husband out from under her nose, she was perfectly willing to smile and make nice if it saved her the expense of hosting the celebration herself. Lady Patience had even personally called at their home, politely ignoring the state of it and the lack of servants. I should be most happy if you would allow me to do you this favour, she had said pointedly, taking Eva's hand and catching her eye. It was an unexpectedly sincere gesture that surely would have caught Eva's attention, but she was beyond it all now. The easiest path forward, she had decided, was simply to close down and retreat from everyone about herself. She was simply being carried forward with the current, swept along to the end. When called upon, she would answer direct questions, smile when told, do all that was required of her. But no more. She had lost her little sun charm and with it, much of her will to be Eva. The world had grown colder, so it was an apt analogy. So Eva had just stared blankly at Patience, blinking as if in a fog and unable to determine what the correct answer was. It was fortunate, then, that Lady Stanton was on hand to answer everything for her. We shall certainly be there, Lady Stanton assured Lady Chester, who ignored her in favour of staring at Eva. If Eva had been more aware, then she likely would have remembered that Lady Patience was a deceptively intelligent, observant young woman who missed very little. It was days, maybe even a week later, when Eva found herself in Lady Chester's carriage which she had been gracious enough to send around for Eva and her mother. This allowed them to arrive at the party in some kind of style, preserving their refound respectability. Kitty, the dear thing who had been strangely absent from Eva's life, had arrived to help Eva dress, picking out her wardrobe with explicit attention. When Eva stepped out of the carriage, she cut quite a figure for those that were lingering outside of Lady Chester's home and peering out the windows to glimpse the arrivals. She wore a grey-blue travelling cloak trimmed in dark brown fur. In her melancholy, Eva's cheeks had grown paler, making her lips appear redder. She was on the whole subdued, silent, and possessed of a strange, serious grace that gave all of her gestures weight. One would have been forgiven for comparing her to a princess that had just woken from a cursed slumber. Without protest, she took her mother's arm, who paraded into the fashionable townhouse with her head held as high as a queen. Even Ava could see that this was a moment of triumph for her mother, riding in a fine carriage and her daughter about to make a good marriage, despite the ton's best efforts to put them back in their place. On some level, Eva was happy for her. The Chester home was brilliantly decorated in the height of taste and fashion, subtle but luxurious all the same. Lady Chester herself came forward, softly kissing Eva's cheeks and taking her cold hands as a maid slipped the cloak from her shoulders. Those nearest to her gasped as her dress was revealed. Eschewing the bright, happy colours of a soon-to-be bride, she was instead wearing a dusty lavender, the centre bodice ruched and gathered. Over this, she wore robing in a lavender and gold changeable silk, which fastened beneath her bust with matching silk tassels. 
It draped elegantly about her, the skirt tightly gathered and falling like the folds of fabric on a Greek statue. The effect was astounding, especially with her pale beauty contrasting with her dark eyes and hair. Anyone would have been hard-pressed to find fault with her appearance. Lady Chester recovered first, taking Ava by the arm and smiling sweetly at Lady Stanton. There are many who wish to congratulate the happy pair, but please, Lady Stanton, help yourself to some of the negs and champagne, and Cook has really outdone himself with a blanc mange à la vanilla. Ava could see her mother wavering, and Patience gave her another sugary smile. Don't you worry. I shall take good care of our Eva. Her bow is awaiting her. That was all that needed to be said. Lady Stanton excused herself under the guise of greeting old friends, and Eva was left with Lady Chester, who began to speak to her quickly and under her breath. We haven't long, dear one, Lady Chester said urgently, smiling and nodding to her guests as they strolled through the house. We can only keep your mother occupied for so long, and there is much to do. There is, Ava asked feeling as if she were missing several important steps. Oh, yes, Patience said, nodding seriously. But first I must ask you something, she said, turning Eva to face her. Are you prepared to be completely honest, no matter the consequences? I don't... I know you don't understand yet, Patience said, gently taking Eva by the arms. But you will in just a moment. I know that this will break all notions of polite decorum, but you must trust that I have your best interest at heart. I truly do. But if you have any hope left in you, if you have any desire for happiness, you must be honest. Trust me, he can take it. And with that, before she could ask any questions, Ava was gently thrust into a small room and the door closed quickly behind her. Confused and alarmed, Ava turned about ready to try the handle, when a masculine voice stopped her. Wait! She froze and her foolish, traitorous heart hoped for one moment against hope. Ava knew it wasn't Josiah. They sounded nothing alike. All the same, at hearing a man's voice, hope had lanced right through her heart, puncturing her carefully constructed control and distance from reality. She turned slowly back around trembling from too many emotions to name. Silhouetted against the light that slanted in through the windows was Mr. Cluet. It was unmistakably him, his broad frame giving him away. Eva said nothing, not trusting herself to speak. Didn't mean to frighten you, he said kindly, stepping forward cautiously. Thought I was someone else, didn't you? He asked softly, his face sympathetic. That was too much for Eva. She could have tolerated it if he were politely distant, if he were cruel even. But the kindness undid her. Immediately her face fell, her whole body folded as she slumped to the floor, head buried in her hands. She did not have the energy to sob or wail, and instead cried silently, like a noiseless hurricane, which was somehow more terrible. The floor creaked a little, and she cracked open a bleary eye long enough to note that Mr. Cluett was not looking on in either horror or disgust, as she had expected, but had calmly lowered himself to the floor as well, mindless of his fine breeches. His face showed only concern, which made her cry harder for a moment. Really did not mean to distress you, he said, his forehead creased. Eva barked out a strangled, watery laugh. You didn't, she reassured him. She regarded him thoughtfully for a moment. It really is a pity that I cannot love you. Perhaps it would be easier if I could. Maybe, Mr. Cluett agreed, but don't think we fit well together, like boots that are the wrong size. Ava couldn't help but sniffle another laugh. Mr. Cluett, I really must tell you that most women would not be flattered by a comparison to a boot. His only response to that was to wordlessly pass her his handkerchief, which she dabbed at her eyes with. You really are a kind man, she said as she patted at her watering eyes. I'm so sorry that my mother, that you've been swept up in her schemes. Mr. Cluett shook his head. Not just her, my mother too. 
Thought it was time for me to be settled. Needed a wife that was sophisticated and could give me a bit of polish. Not sure she understands how cucumbered you are, though. Eva grunted an agreement to that. Wait, won't we be missed from the party? Surely that will make people talk. Mr. Cluett grinned a little, boyish and kind, and offered her a hand to help her stand. Eva accepted after a slight hesitation, allowing herself to be pulled up easily. Mr. Cluett gestured for her to peek out the door, and she did so, pressing her face to the small gap. Standing quite nearby was Lady Patience Chester, but she was not alone. In a small social clump, there was also her husband, Lord Chester, the Duke and Duchess of Brandon, and a dark-haired woman who was also wearing a dress in a dark lavender, though the make was slightly different. From a distance, however, she would look enough like Ava from the back to be believable. Kitty, she asked when she turned back around. When Mr. Cluett nodded, Eva smiled. Of course it is. This was a familiar trick from their youth, and Eva knew that she could be counted upon. Mr. Cluett's face broke into a wide, genuine smile. Good sort, that one. Eva, despite her own troubles, could not help but notice the way that he spoke of Kitty. Has he? Do they? Eva wondered, but did not say anything about that just yet. What is to be done now, then? To her surprise, Mr. Cluett's face came over all serious, and he spoke in an unusually grave tone for him. Needed to ascertain the particulars of your feelings. Suspected they tended in another direction, but had to know for sure. Should have your own say on whether we marry or not. And what if I had said that I had every intention of following my mother's wishes and would hold you to your promise? Not that I, or anyone else for that matter, would consider that a proper proposal, but... Ava asked, folding her arms. Mr. Cluett gave a shrug, the gesture absurdly tiny on his wide shoulders. Would honour your wishes. Could be worse, he added. Don't find you unpleasant. Others have been founded on much shakier ground. Fair enough, Ava agreed with a grudging smile. I suppose the next question is, what is to be done about all this? Not sure yet. Can't deny the truth of your feelings. That much is for certain. Wouldn't be right to make you miserable. Mr. Cluett paused and lifted a hand, as if he meant to give her a reassuring touch before he thought better of it. Wanted you to know that your friends haven't abandoned you, he said with a nod toward the door, indicating the cluster nearby. That means a great deal to me, Eva said, tears threatening again. I'm just not sure it's enough. How do we free ourselves? What can actually be done? Your mother won't thank you if you cry off. My mother would not hesitate to sue for breach of promise. My mother wouldn't allow me to refuse you. I'd have to leave London, and my reputation would be done forever. Ava turned away, back toward the door, angrily swiping tears again. I really am very sorry about this. I... I never wanted to make you miserable too. Wouldn't think it. Mr. Cluett said firmly. In a quieter, almost shy voice, he added, You're a good sort too, just haven't realised it yet. Chapter 32 Lady Stanton was very, very intent on enjoying the fruits of her labour. As far as she was concerned, she alone was responsible for her daughter's engagement and the resulting uptick in their standing. With that in mind, it was only natural to her to accept the congratulatory gifts and notes that arrived almost daily as her due. It did not matter if they were addressed to Eva. Lady Stanton considered herself indebted to, and she would collect accordingly. It was difficult for her to imagine that it was only a matter of weeks ago that she had been at the very lowest point of her life. She had been forced to pawn, in secret, the last of her jewels, including Eva's beloved son pendant. She knew that Eva was missing it, had seen her reach up to touch it as was her custom, but she'd yet to say anything about it. Truthfully, she'd yet to say anything about, well, anything really. Eva had the gall to leave the engagement party somehow more melancholy than when she had arrived. Her dark eyes seemed permanently misty and distant, and she refused to look at her mother. Honestly, Eva, 
One would think that you were awaiting a burial shroud instead of a bridal veil with the way that you're carrying on, Lady Stanton had admonished her. This is a moment of triumph for us, and you are ruining it with your morose behaviour. It's positively ghoulish. Eva had said nothing. She didn't even rise to the occasion of arguing with her mother, which was most unusual. There was no light, no spark within her, and that only served to irritate and frustrate Lady Stanton further. Eva, look at me, Lady Stanton commanded. Eva obeyed as she always did these days, and Lady Stanton found herself half wishing that she hadn't. It was as if a grey cloud floated in Eva's eyes, which had a far away, almost dreamy aspect. Neither spoke as the borrowed carriage rattled down the street for several minutes. You might be a little grateful, is all, Lady Stanton had said finally. Eva merely turned to gaze out the window again. That was days ago, nearly a week, and there had been no change. Lady Stanton could scarcely countenance it. What could the girl possibly be objecting to? That she had been saved from a life of misery and poverty. That she had found a handsome and kind gentleman. It was the height of absurdity, as far as she was concerned. The truly strange thing was that Lady Stanton could not shake the feeling that she was being blamed for something, that she had committed some terrible offence. It was easy enough to chalk the staring, disapproving eyes of the ton up to jealousy or irritation that Lady Stanton had managed to claw her way back up to their ranks. It wasn't as if it was the first time she had done this. Her family was old and respected, with titles and honours dating back to the Normans, but she had gone and married new money, and her husband had Spanish blood, two strikes against him. He'd earned a title in his own right, but that was not quite the same. But it wasn't only the ton who were glaring at her with reproach. It was even her acquaintances, like Miss Kitty Johnson, who had only ever been sweetness to her. It was even in the shockingly impertinent eyes of her servants. Though the girl was mute, Lady Stanton could see it even in the maid, Sally's eyes. It was farcical to think that a servant could not only look so boldly at their mistress, but to look with such judgment, such condemnation. It was like the whole world was going mad. Well, they're easily enough sorted, Lady Stanton thought confidently. I shan't have to resort to hiring the dregs any more, but real qualified staff. The thought of having a proper lady's maid again was nearly enough to bring tears to her eyes. Her next goal was to convince Mr. Cluett that they should make the Stanton home their new marital home, and then he would be forced to bring it up to snuff. But she was getting ahead of herself. It was imperative that she focus on the here and now, which required all of her attention and cunning. There was an unfortunate chill of fear that crept into her subconscious every now and again, some unnamed worry that Eva would do something to ruin all of her careful work. What needed the greater part of her attention at this very moment, more than even a moping daughter and rebellious staff, was that she had received an invitation from the Duchess of Carnegie. She was not a dowager, exactly but most people referred to her as such. Though she had been long absent from society, she still had such sway with the ton that upon her return she had been treated as a kind of messiah of taste and standards. Though Lady Stanton had been receiving all sorts of invitations of late, this was wholly unprecedented. She accepted without delay, of course. The Duchess had even sent a carriage for her, which Lady Stanton was tempted to be insulted by, but as it was an exceptionally luxurious barouche, she was mollified. It carried the Carnegie crest on the door, which made more than a few people stop and stare, wondering who this person was that could be important enough to be summoned by the Duchess and given a seat in her private coach. Lady Stanton couldn't help but goggle a little when she arrived at the Carnegie London home. To call it a townhouse was akin to calling Carlton House a cottage. From the very moment that she arrived, Lady Stanton was keenly aware of the opulent surroundings that she found herself in, from the marbled-floored entrance hall to the gilt moulding along the doors and ceilings. A fleet of footmen and maids waited to attend to her every need and comfort, all of them handsome and well-heeled. She was shown into a sitting room that was large enough to play badminton in, the Duchess sitting on a straight-backed chair as if it were a throne and she were a queen. The Dowager Duchess still wore black, as was her custom, looking like a crow among dandelions in the cheerful sitting room. Lady Stanton was not one to be cowed by anyone. 
but even she found that her mouth had gone a little dry as she made her bow in deference of the dowager's rank. Dear Lady Stanton, the Duchess said, rising and holding out her hands as if they were old friends, let us not stand on ceremony. I have invited you here so that we might be better friends. Friends, Lady Stanton repeated, sitting carefully on the sofa that the dowager indicated. Certainly so, the dowager said, signalling to a hovering footman. We're both veterans of society. We've been moving in the same circles for, well, it certainly shan't make either of us feel better to recount how long we've been out in society, will it? The Duchess laughed to herself, acting for all the world as if they were truly jolly companions. Lady Stanton said nothing, wondering idly if this was some sort of ambush. Lady Stanton could vaguely remember coming out around the same time as the Dowager did, but it wasn't as if they had ever been true intimates. A trio of footmen and a maid returned, carrying the necessaries for tea, including a selection of moulded puddings that Lady Stanton could smell from her seat. Her mouth watered, and she found herself accepting a slice of each. They spent a friendly half an hour sipping and eating, comparing stories of their youth and genteel gossip. It put Lady Stanton quite at ease, settling back a little in her seat and sighing wistfully about days gone by. It also helped that Lady Stanton very much wanted to be in her good graces and was inclined to agree with everyone the Duchess said. It seems like a whole different world compared to when we were making our debut, does it not? The Dowager asked, looking a little distant. Oh, to be sure, Lady Stanton agreed. The way the young people dress and speak, it's wholly incomprehensible to me. And the way they dance. I thought to educate my own daughter to it, but I cannot countenance it. The dowager nodded sympathetically. It is a trial to find the correct balance, isn't it? On the one hand, you do not wish for daughters to be too old-fashioned, or they have no hope of landing husbands. On the other hand, it is so easy to seem as if all standards are slipping. Too true, too true, Lady Stanton agreed, eyeing a vanilla pudding with raspberry meringues. I have been struggling with this very thing with my Eva. Well, this is why I wish to speak to you, the dowager said, delicately dabbing at her mouth with a fine napkin. Gertrude, may I call you Gertrude? It has come to my attention that your daughter is recently engaged to be married. That is so, Lady Stanton replied, lifting her chin proudly. It is a good match, one that shall be for the benefit of both of them, I'm sure. Are you? the dowager asked, arching one eyebrow aristocratically. If you are sure, then that is all that need be said. What are you implying? Lady Stanton demanded though somewhat underscored by the fact that she was preparing to bite into a raspberry meringue. The Duchess raised her hands. Now don't come over all spiky now, my dear. We are friends, yes? And please remember that I have two daughters myself, so I know better than most what it is you are going through. But there was no question of them making brilliant marriages, Lady Stanton argued bitterly. There was never any doubt that they would marry well. Perhaps that was true for Patience, but for Annabella. Well, her story could have turned out very differently, no. As you are no doubt well aware, the Duchess said pointedly, pinning Lady Stanton to her seat with a significant look. Lady Stanton could feel her cheeks warming, a blush threatening. It was not exactly a secret that she had been in the camp of those who felt that the new Duchess of Brandon was, well not exactly one of the ton, no matter who her parents were. It wasn't inconceivable that the dowager had heard this gossip, and that Lady Stanton was a part of it, in fact, it was downright likely. What I mean is this, the dowager said, leaning forward a little. There isn't a mother alive worthy of the name who would not want the best for her daughter. I am sympathetic to your situation. It is a hard thing to be widowed young left without a son to carry on for you. This pain can manifest in different ways, she continued, pouring herself more tea. For me, it was a fear of letting my second daughter, the only one I thought left to me, out into the world. I thought I kept her safe. In reality, I was smothering her with a pillow made of love. 
If anything, Eva has had too much freedom, Lady Stanton grumbled. Perhaps, the Duchess nodded. From what I have heard, she is a precocious young thing. Then you understand why she must be taken harshly in hand, Lady Stanton said, also leaning forward. She is far too headstrong and likely to do something foolish. Foolish for whom, though? the Duchess asked quietly but firmly. For herself. She'd run off to marry a Parisian poet in a heartbeat if she thought it might spite me. Mm, the Duchess said, nodding sagely and leaning back. I see. You are afraid that she will leave you behind then? I... what? No, that's not... I'm afraid she'll end up some poor man's tart, Lady Stanton spluttered. Would you rather her be a rich man's tart? the Duchess asked archly. That's hardly the same thing. Lady Stanton forced herself to take a deep breath, well aware that she was in great danger of becoming overwrought. I have secured her a good marriage. This is the best thing for everyone. Is it? the Dowager asked, sipping her tea calmly. Has Ava told you that she is happy to be married in this way? Of course not. She wouldn't care to admit that I had done the correct thing, Lady Stanton scoffed. Has her manner changed at all? Perhaps she has become quiet, withdrawn even. I hear that she is looking pale, which though fashionable can be a sign of something worse, the dowager said, once again staring Lady Stanton down with penetrating blue eyes. It was clearly useless to lie. The Duchess clearly had her spies everywhere, feeding her information. Every bride is nervous before her wedding day, Lady Stanton replied, not exactly answering the question. She waved away any residual concern. Perhaps so, the dowager agreed. I simply ask you to consider what it is that you really want for your daughter. Is it worth a handsome carriage to see her wither away and become someone you do not recognise? Lady Stanton did not answer. It was a preposterous question one that she should not even have to answer. What is this world really coming to, she asked herself on the journey back to her own, smaller, darker townhouse. Now the Duchess has become a romantic, sentimental fool. It was easy to dismiss her words as the sentimental drivel of a widow with nothing to lose, with a daughter securely married. Of course it was easy for her to give high-handed advice. She was not in danger of living beneath a bridge. These were the things that Lady Stanton said to herself, again and again, throughout the day. It was only when she laid down at night that she could not push the interfering old woman's words away any longer. As she lay in bed, staring at the ceiling, her feet gone cold and her head wrapped tightly to keep her chin from sagging any more, she felt the strangest twinge, as if she might have done something she would come to regret. Chapter 33 Josiah was distracted and it was beginning to affect his work. He stared listlessly out the window of the hired carriage, his thoughts impossible to organise. He ought to be happy. He ought to be thrilled, really. Ever since the Duke's ball, he'd had more requests for lessons than he knew what to do with. He would need to hire another teacher. And soon. He'd considered asking Beatrice, but he'd made that mistake once before. It had not ended well. If things continued in this manner, he would be able to retire comfortably whenever he wished. In reality, he could hire and train competent teachers, and then he could journey the continent again, rediscovering his love for dance. And why do you need to rediscover it exactly? A shrewd part of his mind demanded. It was a fair question, but one that Josiah was loath to answer. Dancing lately had felt like the means to an end, at best. It was how he kept himself fed and paid his rent and kept his troop employed. There was no art, no higher purpose to it any more. He rose, breakfasted, dressed, taught the rich ladies and gentlemen their steps and went home ad nauseum. He may as well have been back with his boyhood tutor, copying out Latin verses for hours on end. He couldn't remember the last time that his heart had leapt for joy when he took to the dance floor. Liar, his mind whispered, which made Josiah scowl at his reflection in the carriage window. It was a lie. He knew precisely when he had last been happy while dancing, when he'd last felt inspired. 
He could see it every time he closed his eyes, every night when he tried to sleep. Eva was always there with him, just out of sight, but never out of mind. Sometimes Josiah fancied that if he turned fast enough, he might see her better. If he held his arms out, she might twirl into them. There was nothing to be done about it, was the worst part of it all. He had heard that Lady Eva was well and truly engaged from the more gossip inclined of his clients. There was some confusion about the match, which always made Josiah snort derisively. It was also not particularly understood why it had not been formally announced yet, no notice given in the newspapers. Josiah suspected the delay was to give Lady Stanton more time to wrangle a more favourable marriage settlement. None of it was surprising except perhaps that Lady Ava went along with the whole unscrupulous business. It seemed so out of her character, but then perhaps Josiah hadn't really known her. The carriage bumped along, it being necessary for them to pass through a not particularly salubrious part of town to reach their destination at the fringes of London. The streets out here were not well maintained, and the carriage jolted each time the wheels found a rut. Josiah placed one hand on the roof of the carriage, the other on the bench next to him in order to attempt to stabilise himself. It occurred to him that he was completely alone. No students, no junior dancers looking at him expectantly. No Beatrice eyeing him as if he were a prime joint of meat to be snatched up. Despite the bumpy terrain and the noise from outside, the carriage was insular and quiet, close even. Josiah couldn't help but be reminded of the confessionals he had been marched to as a child in Paris. He couldn't remember much of them, only that it too had been dark and quiet within. He could say anything that he wished to in this carriage, in this moment, and no one would ever be any wiser. Taking a deep breath, he braced himself as if he were about to plunge into a pool of icy water. It should have been me, he said quietly but with conviction. I should have. I should be the one marrying Eva. Instantly, it was like a weight had lifted from his chest, an invisible stone that he did not even know that he had been wearing. He exhaled with the relief of it, but a burning regret was left in its place. It was foolishness anyway. He had no way of knowing if that was even what Eva would want. For all that he knew, she was perfectly content with her bridegroom. The carriage turned down a street, and the driver called down through the speaking vent. Might want to close the curtain, sir. Passing by a rookery now. Josiah roused himself a little to his surroundings. On the right side of the carriage was indeed a rookery, the polite term for a slum, jammed into the little streets and alleys behind the fashionable houses. Out of habit, Josiah reached up to draw the little curtain across the carriage window but stopped himself. He felt that he'd had quite enough of ignoring the reality of the world around him. He forced himself to look, to acknowledge that this was the truth of life for many people. Women, tired and lined with dirt and worry alike, shuffled to and fro, balancing baskets on their heads and hips. Few wore shoes, their feet caked with dirt. Children scurried here and there and were roundly chastised for getting in the way. The carriage approached the river and here the women were congregating, washing the worst of the filth from baskets of stained clothing, sweating on their knees even in the cold air. One woman walking down the lane, a basket on her head, caught Josiah's eye. She had thick, dark hair, piled up carelessly on her head. Her gait was uneven, very likely an injury that had healed improperly. It wasn't Ava, he knew that. But there was something in her colouring, in the straightness of her neck that reminded him of her. It could be her, his mind whispered. What would keep her from this fate if she chose you? All it takes is for you to have one too many injuries, one bad step, and then where is the security? Let her marry her rich man and be safe. Josiah shook his head but also found himself craning his neck around to watch the woman as the carriage clattered past. She had clearly once been beautiful too, but there was only suffering on her face marred on one side by a long scar that twisted her mouth. Josiah sat heavily back on the carriage bench. The carriage turned again, but was brought to an abrupt halt, shivering a little on its springs. Josiah opened the speaking vent again. 
What's happened? Why have we stopped? He demanded. Sorry, sir. Coal carts overturned in the road, came the weary reply. Josiah sighed, sliding the vent closed again. He slumped in the bench, resigned to being late. Listlessly, he let his gaze wander outside of the carriage again. They had stopped before a row of shops, their fronts old and worn but clean. One was a pawnbroker's, which showed a collection of watches and jewellery in the window that had been abandoned by their former owners. His eyes passed over the trinkets, not really paying them any mind, when suddenly he was snapping back to attention. Squinting, Josiah wondered if he might be seeing things, a kind of urban mirage. But no, he was certain. Sir, the driver asked, alarmed, as Josiah flung the carriage door open and slid out without waiting for the steps to be lowered for him. Sir, shall I pull up? The road will be clear in just a few moments, and we can't hold traffic. I'll only be a moment, Josiah replied absently, all of his attention riveted on the shop window. There, winking and gleaming in the intermittent noonday light, was a small golden pendant in the shape of a sun. Josiah stared at it, trying to force himself to be realistic. The chances were slim to non-existent. It would be too great of a coincidence. Surely there was more than one pendant like this in all of London. But then he'd never seen another like it. It wasn't a particularly fashionable accessory, there couldn't be more than one. It was hers. He felt it in his bones, as surely as he knew how to dance. It could be a little memento, something he kept only for himself, to remind him of the love that he almost had. Romantic fool, his brain murmured. He felt frozen, staring at a piece of jewellery in a pawn shop window. The gleam of the gold had him fixed in some kind of spell that refused to allow him to move. Even when the rain began, darting at his face in cold pellets driven by the wind, he simply stared. If he looked hard enough, in the reflection of that tiny golden sun, he could see the life he might have had, the love he could have shared. Chapter 34 Eva wasn't entirely sure how she had allowed herself to be dragged to the Haymarket Theatre again. It seemed particularly cruel, morbid even, to be forced to revisit the place that she had first fallen in love with dancing, been awoken to its possibilities, the first place that she had seen Josiah. She had been simply floating along through the last few weeks. She went where she was told, dressed when it was time to, smiled and spoke when prompted. The rest of the time, when left to her own devices, she had taken to simply staring out the nearest window, sometimes for hours on end. When Kitty had arrived and found her in this state, Ava had been too tired to pretend to be happy. Dreamlike, she realised that it wasn't just Kitty that had descended on her in her room, but Lady Patience as well, and even the Duchess of Brandon who carried a large box. Eva didn't understand what they were about as they smiled and spoke gently to her. Come along, Eva. Kitty said, gently pulling Eva from her chair. You've been locked in here with your own gloom for too long. Let us cheer you. I'm not sure I wish to be cheered, Ava replied dully. Tish tosh, Kitty said. We are all your friends and have come to help you. Look, the Duchess has even brought a gift for you. I spoke to your modiste, the Duchess said in gentle tones, pressing the box to Ava. It should fit. I still have a good eye for measurements. So Ava had found herself dressed in a gown of surpassing beauty, ivory duchesse satin with deepest blue robing. Her arms slid into long white gloves and a cloak lined with satin and trimmed with fur was draped over her shoulders. She had gold and pearl ear bobs screwed into her ears and gold hairpins with heads shaped like starbursts pressed into her hair. With Kitty holding her arm, Ava allowed herself to be pulled down the stairs. Everyone was in a jolly festive mood around Ava, and it was almost enough to begin pulling her from the fog that had shrouded her heart. Things were momentarily halted, however, with the appearance of Lady Stanton, likewise dressed for the theatre and looking a little perturbed. Lady Stanton, the Duchess of Brandon said coolly, stepping forward. 
She was the oldest and highest ranking of them, and assumed the role of elder sister quite naturally. I was not aware that we would have the pleasure of your company this evening. Your Grace, I don't find it appropriate to allow my daughter to go out unchaperoned at this particular juncture, Lady Stanton replied crisply. She has chaperones, Kitty piped up. Three of them, to be exact. Well, five, if you count Lord Chester and the Duke of Brandon as well. Lady Stanton slid a flinty glance to Kitty, which silenced her, but did not loosen her grip on Eva's arm. She couldn't quite articulate why, but Eva had the strangest feeling that she was being abducted. You've brought two carriages then, I take it? Lady Stanton asked. The Duchess nodded. Then there shan't be a problem. We may all travel as one party to the theatre. Everyone was packed into carriages, though in somewhat lessened spirits. Lady Stanton insisted on riding with Eva, sitting right next to her in the carriage. Kitty would not let Eva go, however, and pressed into the same bench, heedless of their gowns. Don't worry, Kitty whispered to Eva when Lady Stanton was distracted by searching for her fan in her reticule. Your friends are here. Tonight will be something you never forget. Eva turned to inquire what exactly that was supposed to mean, but was silenced by Kitty squeezing her fingers. She felt like all the pieces to a puzzle were before her, but she wasn't able to fit them together. It was a curious feeling, as if she already had the answer to what was going on, but she couldn't remember it. The ride to the theatre passed in a blur, with Eva not able to really recall how they had found their way into Lady Patience Chester's box seats. It was a bit of a squeeze with all of them packed in. Lady Stanton, much to her annoyance and continued huffing, found herself relegated to the very back, quite near the door. If it swung open hard enough, it was entirely likely that she would be whacked with it. Kitty and Patience arranged themselves around Eva, like some kind of frilly, powdered honour guard. The Duchess of Brandon sat behind her, a calm and steady presence, though Eva's heart ached to be back at the theatre where it had all begun. She found that her friends acted as a bulwark against the worst of it. She hadn't realised how lonesome and isolated she had been feeling of late, and slowly began to rouse herself. The lights were dimmed, and the rowdy crowd began to settle by degrees. The performances began, little vignettes and warbly sopranos. There was a girl with dogs who could stand on their hind legs and jump through hoops that earned the most enthusiastic response thus far. Even Eva caught herself smiling. Then the strangest thing happened. The dark red curtain was drawn closed and remained that way for some time. The crowd quickly began to become restless and agitated, with some calling for the orange girls to be brought back out so that they might at least have some refreshment in the pit seats. A few hisses and whistles began to ring out, and Ava looked about, wondering what exactly was happening. There was a kind of flailing behind the red curtain, and poor Knots, still batting the curtain out of the way, was thrust out into centre stage. Even from their seats in the box, it was clear that the poor man was sweating buckets. He took a deep breath, which put the buttons on his waistcoat under so much strain that it wasn't entirely sure how they held on. My lords, ladies and gentlemen, he said, his voice cracking on the word ladies, which earned him a round of laughter. If we might beg your indulgence, he continued gamely, there will be a slight alteration to the programme tonight. There was a general murmur of dissatisfaction at that revelation. Knots, face reddening, whipped out an oversized handkerchief and began blotting at his forehead. This action upset the absurdly small wig on his head so that it was now sitting at an angle. It is our great pleasure to, to, to present in an inaugural performance Apollo and the Rites of Spring, not stammered. Seemingly at a loss, he made a quick bow, which sent his wig flying into the musician's pit. Knots, his face nearly as red as the curtain, slapped one hand to his gleamingly bald head and dashed off the stage to a round of hoots and laughter. The musicians, determined to restore some sort of dignity to the proceedings, began to play, softly at first. 
It was a haunting melody, full of loss and grief, the notes floating through the auditorium and striking the audience in the heart. An uneasy, reverent hush fell over all the spectators, Eva included. The curtain was parted, revealing the stage bathed in shadows and cool light. A forest of dead trees, black and twisted, rose up from a mist on the stage. It was a desolate, blasted landscape, devoid of life and light. Though the theatre was kept at a civilised temperature, it was as if the stage radiated a chill, the winter outside brought within. A figure, obscure and hidden, began to move among the trees. It was so subtle that at first it was impossible to determine if it was, in fact, a person or simply a trick of the light. It was as if one of the trees had come to life and was somberly, deliberately, surveying the black trees. All the while the musicians continued to play, the music becoming more insistent. The figure came closer and closer, tall and imposing, but wearing a dark shroud, as if prepared for burial. As one, the audience leaned back unconsciously as the figure stepped to the forefront of the stage, appearing to survey them. Ava, however, leaned forward, placing one gloved hand on the railing of the box. Her heart began to beat more rapidly, as if being brought back to life. She couldn't explain it, but she knew the moment the figure on the stage looked at her, saw her. Her breath caught. The music stopped. In a flash of phosphorus, the shroud was thrown back and standing before all, like a literal god, was a man dressed in gold silk, his face hidden by a gleaming mask in the shape of a sun. He stood proudly but perfectly still, his head high and shoulders thrown back, one leg elegantly poised. The effect was almost blinding, startling in execution and aesthetic. The audience cried out, some gasping, others exclaiming. Ava did neither. She felt as if all of the air had been pressed out of her. She stared down at the stage, transfixed. She couldn't breathe. She couldn't move. Though his face was hidden, there was no mistaking him. It was Josiah, his long hair loosed and shining silver gold in the stage lights. Eva felt cold and warm all at once. She grasped the railing tightly, afraid that she might faint if she let go. Silently, Josiah as Apollo began to stride across the stage, stopping before a tree. Lightly, he tapped one of the branches. To the audience's delight, it began to bloom in colours that defied expectation. A harp began to pick out a melody, joined by a wooden flute, growing and other instruments joining in as Apollo wove his way through the trees, leaping and turning, arms stretching. As the trees bloomed, the cold light was banished, warm golden light shining from behind the trees. The effect was sublime, the natural world brought within. It was beautiful and modern and old all at once, hard to articulate, but astonishing to see. For Eva, the world had narrowed to this one stage, to only Josiah. As he danced, first fighting against the winter bleakness, then reveling in the warmth of spring, it was like he was speaking a language to her that only she could understand. It was impossible to say how long the performance lasted, as everyone seemed to be under a collective spell. When at last the dance ended, Josiah Apollo took his place at the very edge of the stage where he had begun and surveyed the audience again. The music abruptly cut, and the audience sat in stunned silence for a few moments. Slowly, like a trickle of water from melting snow, applause began to spread through the theatre until nearly everyone had risen and was clapping, some stamping their feet in approval. Except for Eva. She remained seated, staring directly at Josiah, and she knew that he was staring right back at her. She was breathing hard, unshed tears in her eyes. Epilogue After several moments, Josiah lifted his arms, then lowered his hands, urging the audience to be still again. Intrigued, eager for more, the crowd obliged him. Eva watched, transfixed, as he turned so that he was facing her, only her. Ava, he said, his voice reaching out into the theatre and coiling around Eva's heart. His eyes still locked onto hers, he reached up, lifting the golden sun mask. I dance for you, 
I wish to only dance for you. Eva felt her heart squeeze, a kind of exquisite pain blooming in her chest. She let out a soft cry that echoed in the expectant silence of the theatre. The audience, as one, turned to look at her, whispers rising like a tide. You are the sun, and I cannot endure this winter any longer, Josiah continued. I cannot offer much, but my undying love. Ava had kept herself tightly held together for days, weeks now. If she didn't allow herself to feel anything, then she could not feel pain. Now, Josiah had cracked the carefully constructed wall of ice that she had built around herself. She had no voice to answer, but found that she reached one arm out to him, hand and fingers extended. Josiah's smile could be seen from even the very back of the theatre, radiant as the sun he was dressed as. The audience, unsure if this was part of the performance or not, politely applauded this exchange. Eva felt like happiness were within her reach for the first time in weeks, smiling through her tears. If she could just get backstage, they could be together, they could. You are completely out of line, sir, a voice rang out from behind her, bringing reality crashing back down around her. Lady Stanton had risen looming over Eva and jabbed one finger down at Josiah. To make such declarations in public, to a woman soon to be married, in public, she continued, outraged. She can make her own choices, Josiah said, unflinching. You owe her that much. What? You dare to speak that way to me, you insolent? Lady Stanton raged but was cut off. She can make her own choices, Lord Chester said, repeating Josiah's words and glaring at Lady Stanton. Eva whipped around to stare at him. You owe her that much. His meaning was clear, and the rest of those present would likely know that he referred to Lady Stanton's scandalous scheme to attempt to trap himself in marriage. Moreover, he had rank and standing that she did not, and he did in fact dare to speak that way to her. We'll see how fast your ardour cools when you are sued for breach of promise, Lady Stanton said, tossing her head and attempting to save some of her righteous indignation. The fact is that she is still engaged. I imagine her prospective husband will have a thing or two to say about all of this. Not really, a new voice answered from across the auditorium in one of the box seats at the same level. The audience duly swivelled in their seats to stare at this new player, gowns rustling. Eva squinted, sure that her eyes must be playing tricks on her. Standing, hat nervously in hand, was Mr Seth Cluett. To her great astonishment, he was staring determinedly at Lady Stanton, uncowed. No intention of marrying Lady Eva, he continued, then immediately began to backtrack a little. That is, nothing against her, fine girl, anyone would be lucky to have her, but poorly suited. Besides, he continued, nodding in the direction of the stage, where Josiah still stood nearly forgotten. She loves him. Josiah gallantly bowed to Mr. Cluett. I humbly thank you for your understanding. It was suddenly clear to Eva just how many friends she had and how many were involved in this conspiracy. Think nothing of it. Fond of a happy ending myself. Mr. Cluett paused, his face breaking into a boyish smile. Do you think you could show me how the trees work? Later, I mean. Josiah's smile widened. Be glad to, my good man. But, but, Mr. Cluett, you are engaged to Eva, Lady Stanton cried, her voice growing more shrill. I shan't have you crying off because you've gone soft. Never officially asked, you assumed, and you wanted to trick me, Mr. Cluett retorted, causing no small amount of gasping and hands pressed to mouths in the audience. They had taken on the part of spectators at a tennis match heads swivelling back and forth between the various players in this strange play. Lady Stanton made a surprisingly unladylike scoffing snort of derision. And who would believe you? No one else was there. Who do you have to vouch for your claim? I will. Though Eva had spoken quietly, her words carried all of the weight of an anchor. They fell into the silence like cannonballs, and the audience waited expectantly, thoroughly invested in the drama of it all now. You, 
You would dare after all that I have done for you? Lady Stanton said, so outraged that her voice was barely more than a harsh whisper. You are clearly hysterical. No one would believe you. My solicitor might, said another voice from Mr. Cluett's box. Lady Cluett, hovering behind her son, stepped forward and fixed Lady Stanton with a withering look. I'm sure that he would have more than a few things to say, should you press the matter. I warn you now, he is even more ruthless and scheming than you are, so consider your actions carefully. Ava watched, equal parts amused and astonished, as her mother simply stared and gaped for several moments. Her mouth opened and closed, doing a remarkable impression of a trout. At last, she threw up her hands and stalked from the box, slamming the door so loudly that it sounded like a gunshot. The audience erupted into cheers as if they had just witnessed St. George slaying a dragon. There seemed to be a great deal of confusion as to whether this was part of the performance or not, but it was thoroughly enjoyed regardless. I would suggest, young man, Lady Cluett called down to Josiah, that you go and claim your prize before she comes up with another scheme to marry her off. This was all the encouragement that Josiah needed. Eva gasped as he leapt from the stage recklessly, the crowd cheering him on. In two quick bounds he was scaling the curtains draped along the boxes, spry and nimble. Romeo climbing up to Juliet's balcony could not have been more moving a scene. He reached the railing and Eva stood before him, her eyes drinking him in hungrily. Hello, she whispered, unsure of why that was what she said in that moment. It didn't matter. Josiah smiled and whispered back, Hello there. Cautiously, he reached into a hidden pocket of his costume. I have something for you, he said, holding out his hand. I can't bear to see you without it, my own day star. He opened his hand, revealing Eva's beloved sun pendant. Eva was helpless to resist his smile, and with tears of every emotion that she had been holding back, responded with a grin of her own. Heedless of the fact that they were in a theatre full of people, and she was reared to be a proper young lady, Eva threw off the last yoke of expectations and threw her arms about Josiah's neck with such force that it nearly unbalanced him. Obligingly, he wrapped both of his arms tightly about her, his hands finding the small of her back and her waist, as if they had been made for it. Before a goodly amount of the Tun and London, Josiah pressed a kiss to Eva's lips that was so rife with warmth and passion that some in the audience felt inclined to cover their companion's eyes. In the hours afterward, the general consensus among the audience seemed to be that it was a fantastic bit of entertainment. If it were genuine or staged didn't seem to matter. It had all the elements that they craved in a piece of theatre. A dashing hero, a beautiful heroine in need of rescue, a villain worthy of the name, and just enough tartness to be exhilarating. Overall, a grand night at the theatre. Knots asked the happy pair, once they had found their way backstage, if they thought the whole lot of them could be persuaded to appear nightly at the theatre. He assured them that they would play to a packed house every night, and would be compensated accordingly. Eva wasn't entirely sure he was in jest, but didn't find that she minded. She simply laid her head on Josiah's shoulder, feeling free and unburdened for the first time in her life. They fit together so nicely, the moon and sun, two celestial bodies in harmony. Scan the QR code or click on the link in the description to read the next book in the series. Share this video with your friend or watch on of the following videos. Subscribe to our channel, like this video, and hit the notification bell to not miss any new audiobooks. Thank you for watching.